The Master of Game By Edward, 2nd Duke of York Fox hunting, above ground, with ratches or running hounds Introduction The Master of Game is the oldest as well as the most important work on the chase in the English language that has come down to us from the Middle Ages. Written between the years 1406 and 1413 by Edward III. S. Grandson Edward, 2nd Duke of York, our author will be known to every reader of Shakespeare's Richard II. For he is no other than the arch-traitor Duke of Amaral, previously Earl of Rutland, who, according to some historians, after having been an accomplice in the murder of his uncle Gloucester, carried in his own hand on a pole the head of his brother-in-law. The student of history, on the other hand, cannot forget that this turbulent Plantagenet was the gallant leader of England's vanguard at Agincourt, where he was one of the great nobles who purchased with their lives what was probably the most glorious victory ever vouchsafed to English arms. He tells us in his prologue, in which he dedicates his Lytel Simple Book to Henry, eldest son of his cousin Henry IV, KYNG of Gengeland and of France, that he is the master of game at the latter's court. Let it at once be said that the greater part of the book before us is not the original work of Edward of York, but a careful and almost literal translation from what is indisputably the most famous hunting book of all times, i.e. Count Gaston de Foy's Lever de Chasse, or, as author and book are often called, Gaston Phoebus, so named because the author, who was a kinsman of the Plantagenets, and who reigned over two principalities in southern France and northern Spain was renowned for his manly beauty and golden hair. It is he of whom Froissart has to tell us so much that is quaint and interesting in his inimitable chronicle. Le Chasse, as Gaston de Foy tells us in his preface, was commenced on May 1, 1387, and as he came to his end on a bear hunt not much more than four years later, it is very likely that his youthful Plantagenet kinsman, our author, often met him during his prolonged residence in Aquitaine, of which, later on, he became the governor. Fortunately for us, the enforced leisure which the Duke of York enjoyed while imprisoned in Pevensey Castle for his traitorous connection with the plots of his sister to assassinate the king and to carry off their two young kinsmen, the Mortimers, the elder of whom was the heir presumptive to the throne, was of sufficient length to permit him not only to translate La Chasse but to add five original chapters dealing with English hunting. These chapters, as well as the numerous interpolations made by the translator, are all of the first importance to the student of Venere. For they emphasize the changes, as yet but very trifling ones, that had been introduced into Britain in the 302 score years that had intervened since the conquest when the French language and French hunting customs became established on English soil. To enable the reader to see at a glance which parts of the Master of Game are original, these are printed in italics. The text, of which a modern rendering is here given, is taken from the best of the existing 19 MSS. Of the Master of Game, viz. The Cottonian MS Vespasian B. 12, in the British Museum, dating from about 1420. The quaint English of Chaucer's day, with its archaic contractions, puzzling orthography, and long, obsolete technical terms in this MS, are not always as easy to read as those who only wish to get a general insight into the contents of the Master of Game might wish. It was a difficult question to decide to what extent this text should be modernized. If translated completely into 20th century English, a great part of the charm and interest of the original would be lost. For this reason many of the old terms of Venere and the construction of sentences have been retained where possible, so that the general reader will be able to appreciate the feeling of the old work without being unduly puzzled. In a few cases where, through the omission of words, the sense was left undetermined, it has been made clear after carefully consulting other English misas and the French parent work. It seemed very desirable to elucidate the textual description of hunting by the reproduction of good contemporary illuminations, but unfortunately English art had not at that period reached the high state of perfection which French art had attained. As a matter of fact, only two of the nineteen English misas contain these pictorial aids, and they are of very inferior artistic merit. The French misas of La Chasse, on the other hand, are in several cases exquisitely illuminated, and MSF, FR. 616, which is the copy from which our reproductions, 
much reduced in size, alas, are made, is not only the best of them, but is one of the most precious treasures of the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. These superb miniatures are unquestionably some of the finest handiwork of French miniaturists at a period when they occupied the first rank in the world of art. The editors have added a short appendix, elucidating ancient hunting customs in terms of the chase. Ancient terms of venerie often baffle every attempt of the student who is not intimately acquainted with the French and German literature of hunting. On one occasion I appealed in vain to Professor Max Muller and to the learned editor of the Oxford Dictionary. I regret to say that I know nothing about these words, wrote Dr. Murray. Terms of the chase are among the most difficult of words, and their investigation demands a great deal of philological and antiquarian research. There is little doubt that but for this difficulty the master of game would long ago have emerged from its seclusion of almost 500 years. It is hoped that our notes will assist the reader to enjoy this hitherto neglected classic of English sport. Singularly enough, as one is almost ashamed to have to acknowledge, foreign students, particularly Germans, have paid far more attention to the master of game than English students have. And there are few manuscripts of any importance about which English writers have made so many mistakes. This is all the more curious considering the precise information to the contrary so easily accessible on the shelves of the British Museum. All English writers with a single exception, Thomas Wright, who have dealt with our book have attributed it persistently to a wrong man and a wrong period. This has been going on for more than a century. For it was the learned, but by no means always accurate, Joseph Strutt who first thrust upon the world, in his often quoted, Sports and Pastimes of the English People, certain misleading blunders concerning our work and its author. Blaine, coming next, adding thereto, was followed little more than a decade later by, Cecil, author of an equally much quoted book, Records of the Chase. In it, when speaking of the, Master of Game, he says that he has, no doubt that it is the production of Edmund de Langley, thus ascribing it to the father instead of to the son. Following, Cecil's, untrustworthy lead, Jesse, Lord Wilton, Vero Shaw, Dalziel, Wynne, the author of the chapter on Old Hunting in the Badminton Library volume on Hunting, and many other writers copied blindly these mistakes. Five years ago the present editors published in a large folio volume the first edition of the Master of Game in a limited and expensive form. It contains side by side with the ancient text a modernized version, extended biographical accounts of Edward of York and of Gaston de Foy, both personalities of singular historical and human interest. A detailed bibliography of the existing medieval hunting literature up to the end of the 16th century, a glossary, and a very much longer appendix than it was possible to insert in the present volume, which, in order to make it conform to the series of which it forms part, had to be cut down to about one-sixth of the first edition. A similar fate had to befall the illustrations, which had to be reduced materially both in number and size. We would therefore invite the reader whose interest in the subject may possibly be aroused by the present pages, to glance at the perhaps formidable-looking pages of the first edition. With its facsimile photogravure reproductions of the best French and English illuminations to be found in 15th century hunting literature. In conclusion, I desire to repeat also in this place the expression of my thanks to the authorities of the British Museum, to Dr. G. F. Warner and Mr. I. H. J.'s in particular, to the heads of the Bodleian Library, the Bibliothèque Nationale, the Mazarine and the Arsenal Libraries in Paris, the Duc d'Aumale's Library at Chantilly the Bibliothèque Royale at Brussels, the Königliche Bibliotheken in Munich and Dresden, the Kaiserlich UND Königliche Haus, Hof and Stats Archive, and the K. and K. Hof Bibliothèque in Vienna, to Dr. F. J. Furnival, Mr. J. E. Harding, Mr. T. Fitzroy Fenwick of Cheltenham, and to express my indebtedness to the late Sir Henry Dryden, B.T., of Canons Ashby, for his kind assistance in my research work. To one person more than to any other my grateful acknowledgement is due, namely to Mr. Theodore Roosevelt, President of the United States, who, notwithstanding the press of official duties, has found time to write the interesting foreword. A conscientious historian of his own great country, as well as one of its keenest sportsmen, President Roosevelt's qualifications for this kindly office may be described as those of a modern master of game. 
no more competent writer could have been selected to introduce to his countrymen a work that illustrates the spirit which animated our common forebears five centuries ago, their characteristic devotion to the chase. No less than their intimate acquaintance with the habits and nature of the wild game they pursued, all attributes worthy of some study by the reading sportsmen of the twentieth century, who, as I show, have hitherto neglected the study of English venery. It was at first intended to print this forward only in the American edition, but it soon became evident that this would give to it an advantage which readers in this country would have some reason to complain of. So it was inserted also in the English edition, and from it taken over into the present one. London, March 3, 1909. Forward. To the first edition. During the century that has just closed Englishmen have stood foremost in all branches of sport, at least so far as the chase has been carried on by those who have not followed it as a profession. Here and there in the world whole populations have remained hunters, to whom the chase was part of their regular work, delightful and adventurous, but still work. Such were the American backwoods men and their successors of the Great Plains and the Rocky Mountains, such were the South African Boers. And the mountaineers of Tyrol, if not coming exactly within this class, yet treated the chase both as a sport and a profession. But disregarding these wild and virile populations, and considering only the hunter who hunts for the sake of the hunting, it must be said of the Englishman that he stood preeminent throughout the nineteenth century as a sportsman for sport's sake. Not only was fox hunting a national pastime, but in every quarter of the globe Englishmen predominated among the adventurous spirits who combined the chase of big game with bold exploration of the unknown. The icy polar seas, the steaming equatorial forests, the waterless tropical deserts, the vast plains of wind-rippled grass, the wooded northern wilderness, the stupendous mountain masses of the Andes and the Himalayas, in short, all regions. However frowning and desolate, were penetrated by the restless English in their eager quest for big game. Not content with the sport afforded by the rifle, whether a horse or a foot. The English in India developed the use of the spear and in Ceylon the use of the knife as the legitimate weapons with which to assail the dangerous quarry of the jungle and the plain. There were hunters of other nationalities, of course, Americans, Germans, Frenchmen. But the English were the most numerous of those whose exploits were best worth recounting, and there was among them a larger proportion of men gifted with the power of narration. Naturally under such circumstances a library of nineteenth-century hunting must be mainly one of English authors. All this was widely different in the preceding centuries. From the Middle Ages to the period of the French Revolution hunting was carried on with keener zest in continental Europe than in England. And the literature of the chase was far richer in the French, and even in the German, tongues than in the English. The Romans, unlike the Greeks, and still more unlike those mighty hunters of old, the Assyrians, cared little for the chase. But the white-skinned, fair-haired, blue-eyed barbarians, who, out of the wreck of the Roman Empire, carved the states from which sprang modern Europe, were passionately devoted to hunting. Game of many kinds then swarmed in the cold, wet forests which covered so large a portion of Europe. The kings and nobles, and the freemen generally, of the regions which now make France and Germany, followed not only the wolf, boar, and stag, the last named the favorite quarry of the hunter of the Middle Ages, but the bear. The bison, which still lingers in the Caucasus and in one Lithuanian preserve of the Tsar, and the aurochs, the huge wild ox, the urus of Caesar, which has now vanished from the world. In the Niblungen Lied, when Siegfried's feats of hunting are described, it is specified that he slew both the bear and the elk, the bison and the aurochs. One of the early Burgundian kings was killed while hunting the bison. And Charlemagne was not only passionately devoted to the chase of these huge wild cattle, but it is said prized the prowess shown therein by one of his stalwart daughters. By the 14th century, when the Count of Foy wrote, the aurochs was practically or entirely extinct, and the bison had retreated eastwards where for more than three centuries it held its own in the gloomy morasses of the plain southeast of the Baltic. In Western Europe the game was then the same in kind that it is now, although all the larger species were very much more plentiful, the roebuck being perhaps the only one of the wild animals that has since increased in numbers. With a few exceptions, such as the Emperor Maximilian, 
the kings and great lords of the Middle Ages were not particularly fond of chamois and ibex hunting. It was reserved for Victor Emmanuel to be the first sovereign with whom shooting the now almost vanished ibex was a favorite pastime. Eager though the early Norman and Plantagenet kings and nobles of England were in the chase, especially of the red deer, in France and Germany the passion for the sport was still greater. In the end, on the continent the chase became for the upper classes less a pleasure than an obsession, and it was carried to a fantastic degree. Many of them followed it with brutal indifference to the rights of the peasantry and to the utter neglect of all the serious affairs of life. During the disastrous period of the Thirty Years' War, the elector of Saxony spent most of his time in slaughtering unheard of numbers of red deer. If he had devoted his days and his treasure to the urgent contemporary problems of statecraft and warcraft he would have ranked more nearly with Gustavus Adolphus and Wallenstein, and would have stood better at the bar of history. Louis XVI was also devoted to the chase in its tamer forms, and was shooting at driven game when the Paris mob swarmed out to take possession of his person. The great lords, with whom love of hunting had become a disease, not merely made of game preserving a grievous burden for the people, but also followed the chase in ways which made scant demands upon the hardier qualities either of mind or of body. Such debased sport was contemptible then, and it is contemptible now. Luxurious and effeminate artificiality, and the absence of all demands for the hardy virtues, rob any pastime of all title to regard. Shooting at driven game on occasions when the day's sport includes elaborate feasts in tents on a store of good things brought in wagons or on the backs of sumter mules. While the sport itself makes no demand upon the prowess of the so-called sportsman, is but a dismal parody upon the stern hunting life in which the man trusts to his own keen eye, stout thews. And heart of steel for success and safety in the wild warfare waged against wild nature. Neither of the two authors now under consideration comes in this undesirable class. Both were mighty men with their hands, terrible in battle, of imposing presence and turbulent spirit. Both were the patrons of art and letters, and both were cultivated in the learning of the day. For each of them the chase stood as a hardy and vigorous pastime of the kind which makes a people great. The one was Count Gaston de Foy, author of the most famous of medieval hunting books, a mighty lord and mighty hunter, as well as statesman and warrior. The other was Edward, second Duke of York, who at Agincourt, died victorious. He translated into English a large portion of Gaston de Foy's La Chasse, adding to it five original chapters. He called his book, The Master of Game. Gaston's book is better known as Gaston Phoebus, the nickname of the author which Froissart has handed down. He treats not only of the animals of France, but of the ibex, the chamois, and the reindeer, which he hunted in foreign lands. The Master of Game is the oldest book on hunting in the English language. The original chapters are particularly interesting because of the light they throw upon English hunting customs in the time of the Plantagenets. The book has never hitherto been published. Nineteen ancient manuscript copies are known, of the three best extant two are on the shelves of the Bloomsbury Treasure House, the other in the Bodleian Library. Like others of the famous old authors on Veneri, both the Count of Foy and the Duke of York show an astonishing familiarity with the habits, nature, and chase of their quarry. Both men, like others of their kind among their contemporaries, made of the chase not only an absorbing sport but almost the sole occupation of their leisure hours. They passed their days in the forest and were masters of woodcraft. Game abounded, and not only the chase but the killing of the quarry was a matter of intense excitement and an exacting test of personal prowess, for the boar, or the bear, or heart at bay was slain at close quarters with the spear or long knife. The master of game is not only of interest to the sportsman, but also to the naturalist, because of its quaint accounts of the nature of the various animals. To the philologist because of the old English hunting terms and the excellent translations of the chapters taken from the French. And to the lover of art because of the beautiful illustrations, with all their detail of costume, of hunting accoutrements. And of ceremonies of La Grande Venerie, which are here reproduced in facsimile from one of the best extant French manuscripts of the early 15th century. The translator has left out the chapters on trapping and snaring of wild beasts which were contained in the original, 
the hunting with running hounds being the typical and most esteemed form of the sport. Gaston Phoebus's Le Chasse was written just over a century before the discovery of America, the master of game, some fifteen or twenty years later. The former has been reprinted many times. Mr. Bailey Groman in reproducing, for the first time, the latter in such beautiful form has rendered a real service to all lovers of sport, of nature, and of books, and no one can get the highest enjoyment out of sport unless he can live over again in the library the keen pleasure he experienced in the wilderness. In modern life big game hunting has assumed many widely varied forms. There are still remote regions of the earth in which the traveler must depend upon his prowess as a hunter for his subsistence. And here and there the foremost settlers of new country still war against the game as it has been warred against by their like since time primeval. But over most of the earth such conditions have passed away forever. Even in Africa game preserving on a gigantic scale has begun. Such game preserving may be of two kinds. In one the individual landed proprietor, or a group of such individuals, erect and maintain a private game preserve, the game being their property just as much as domestic animals. Such preserves often fill a useful purpose, and if managed intelligently and with a sense of public spirit and due regard for the interests and feelings of others, may do much good, even in the most democratic community. But wherever the population is sufficiently advanced in intelligence and character, a far preferable and more democratic way of preserving the game is by a system of public preserves, of protected nurseries and breeding grounds. While the laws define the conditions under which all alike may shoot the game and the restrictions under which all alike must enjoy the privilege. It is in this way that the wild creatures of the forest and the mountain can best and most permanently be preserved. Even in the United States the enactment and observance of such laws has brought about a marked increase in the game of certain localities, as, for instance, New England, during the past thirty years. While in the Yellowstone Park the elk, deer, antelope, and mountain sheep, and, strangest of all, the bear, are not merely preserved in all their wild freedom, but, by living unmolested, have grown to show a confidence in man and a tameness in his presence such as elsewhere can be found only in regions where he has been hitherto unknown. The chase is the best of all national pastimes, and this none the less because, like every other pastime, it is a mere source of weakness if carried on in an unhealthy manner, or to an excessive degree, or under over-artificial conditions. Every vigorous game, from football to polo, if allowed to become more than a game, and if serious work is sacrificed to its enjoyment, is of course noxious. From the days when Trajan in his letters to Pliny spoke with such hearty contempt of the Greek over-devotion to athletics, every keen thinker has realized that vigorous sports are only good in their proper place. But in their proper place they are very good indeed. The conditions of modern life are highly artificial, and too often tend to a softening of fiber, physical and moral. It is a good thing for a man to be forced to show self-reliance, resourcefulness in emergency, willingness to endure fatigue and hunger, and at need to face risk. Hunting is praiseworthy very much in proportion as it tends to develop these qualities. Mr. Bailey Groman to whom most English-speaking lovers of sport owe their chief knowledge of the feats in bygone time of the great hunters of continental Europe, has himself followed in its most manly forms this, the manliest of sports. He has hunted the bear, the wapiti, and the mountain ram in the wildest regions of the Rockies, and, also by fair stalking, the chamois in the red deer in the Alps. Whoever habitually follows mountain game in such fashion must necessarily develop qualities which it is a good thing for any nation to see brought out in its sons. Such sport is as far removed as possible from that in which the main object is to make huge bags at small cost of effort, and with the maximum of ease, no good quality save marksmanship being required. Laying stress upon the mere quantity of game killed, and the publication of the record of slaughter, are sure signs of unhealthy decadence in sportsmanship. As far as possible the true hunter, the true lover of big game and of life in the wilderness, must be ever ready to show his own power to shift for himself. The greater his dependence upon others for his sport the less he deserves to take high rank in the brotherhood of rifle, horse, and hound. There was a very attractive side to the hunting of the great medieval lords, 
carried on with an elaborate equipment and stately ceremonial, especially as there was an element of danger in coming to close quarters with the quarry at bay. But after all, no form of hunting has ever surpassed in attractiveness the life of the wilderness wanderer of our own time, the man who with simple equipment, and trusting to his own qualities of head, heart, and hand, has penetrated to the uttermost regions of the earth, and single-handed slain alike the wariest and the grimmest of the creatures of the waste. Theodore Roosevelt The White House February 15, 1904 Gaston Phoebus surrounded by huntsmen and hounds. From MSF FR 616, Bib Nat. Paris. The Master of Game. Chapter 1. The Prologue. To the honor and reverence of you my right worshipful and dread Lord Henry by the grace of God eldest son and heir unto the high excellent and Christian Prince Henry IV. By the aforesaid grace King of England and of France, Prince of Wales, Duke of Guienne of Lancaster and of Cornwall, and Earl of Chester. I your own in every humble wise have me ventured to make this little simple book which I recommend and submit to your noble and wise correction, which book if it pleaseth your aforesaid lordship shall be named and called Master of Game. And for this cause, for the matter that this book treateth of what in every season of the year is most durable, and to my thinking to every gentle heart most disportful of all games, that is to say hunting. For though it be that hawking with gentle hounds and hawks for the heron and the river be noble and commendable, it lasteth seldom at the most more than half a year. For though men find from May unto Lammas, August 1st, game enough to hawk at, no one will find hawks to hawk with. But as of hunting there is no season of all the year, that game may not be found in every good country, also hounds ready to chase it. And since this book shall be all of hunting, which is so noble a game, and lasting through all the year of divers beasts that grow according to the season for the gladdening of man, I think I may well call it master of game. As the hawks would be mewing and unfit to fly. And though it be so my dear lord, that many could better have meddled with this matter and also more ably than I, yet there be two things that have principally emboldened and caused me to take this work in hand. The first is trust of your noble correction, to which as before is said, I submit this little and simple book. The second is that though I be unworthy, I am master of this game with that noble prince your father our all dear sovereign and liege lord aforesaid. And as I would not that his hunters nor yours that now be or that should come hereafter did not know the perfection of this art, I shall leave for these this simple memorial. For as Chaucer saith in his prologue of, The Twenty-Five Good Women, by writing have men mind of things past, for writing is the key of all good remembrance. The Shirley M.S. in the British Museum has, 15. And first I will begin by describing the nature of the hare, secondly of the nature of the heart, thirdly of the buck and of his nature, fourthly of the roe and of his nature, fifthly of the wild boar and of his nature, sixthly of the wolf and of his nature, seventhly of the fox and of his nature, eighthly of the badger and of his nature, ninthly of the cat and of his nature, tenthly of the marten and his nature, eleventhly of the otter and of his nature. Now have I rehearsed how I will in this little book describe the nature of these aforesaid beasts of venery and of chase, and therefore will I name the hounds the which I will describe hereafter, both of their nature and conditions. And first I will begin with ratches, running hounds, and their nature, and then greyhounds and their nature, and then alaunts and their nature, and then spaniels and their nature, and then mastiffs that men call curs and their nature. And then of small curs that come to be terriers and their nature, and then I shall devise and tell the sicknesses of hounds and their diseases. And furthermore I will describe what qualities and manners a good hunter should have, and of what parts he should be, and after that I will describe the manner and shape of the kennel, and how it should be environed and arrayed. Also I will describe of what fashion a hunter's horn should be driven, and how the couplings should be made for the ratches and of what length. Furthermore I will prove by sundry reasons in this little prologue, that the life of no man that useth gentle game and disport be less displeasable unto God than the life of a perfect and skilful hunter, or from which more good cometh. The first reason is that hunting causeth a man to eschew the seven deadly sins. Secondly men are better when riding, more just and more understanding, and more alert and more at ease and more undertaking, and better knowing of all countries and all passages. 
In short and long all good customs and manners cometh thereof, and the health of man and of his soul. For he that fleeth the seven deadly sins as we believe, he shall be saved, therefore a good hunter shall be saved, and in this world have joy enough and of gladness and of solace, so that he keep himself from two things. One is that he leave not the knowledge nor the service of God, from whom all good cometh, for his hunting. The second that he lose not the service of his master for his hunting, nor his own duties which might profit him most. Now shall I prove how a hunter may not fall into any of the seven deadly sins. When a man is idle and reckless without work, and be not occupied in doing some thing, he abides in his bed or in his chamber, a thing which draweth men to imaginations of fleshly lust and pleasure. For such men have no wish but always to abide in one place, and think in pride, or in avarice, or in wrath, or in sloth, or in gluttony, or in lechery, or in envy. For the imagination of men rather turns to evil than to good, for the three enemies which mankind hath, are the devil, the world, and the flesh, and this is proved enough. Nevertheless there be many other reasons which are too long to tell, and also every man that hath good reason knoweth well that idleness is the foundation of all evil imaginations. Now shall I prove how imagination is lord and master of all works, good or evil, that man's body or his limbs do. You know well, good or evil works small or great never were done but that beforehand they were imagined or thought of. Now shall you prove how imagination is the mistress of all deeds, for imagination biddeth a man do good or evil works, whichever it be, as before is said. And if a man notwithstanding that he were wise should imagine always that he were a fool, or that he hath other sickness, it would be so, for since he would think steadfastly that he were a fool. He would do foolish deeds as his imagination would command, and he would believe it steadfastly. Wherefore methinks I have proved enough of imagination, notwithstanding that there be many other reasons the which I leave to avoid long writing. Every man that hath good sense knoweth well that this is the truth. Now I will prove how a good hunter may not be idle, and in dreaming may not have any evil imaginations nor afterwards any evil works. For the day before he goes out to his office, the night before he shall lay him down in his bed, and shall not think but for to sleep, and do his office well and busily, as a good hunter should. And he shall have nothing to do, but think about all that which he has been ordered to do. And he is not idle, for he has enough to do to think about rising early and to do his office without thinking of sins or of evil deeds. And early in the dawning of the day he must be up for to go unto his quest, that in English is called searching, well and busily, for as I shall say more explicitly hereafter, when I shall speak of how men shall quest and search to harbour the heart. And in so doing he shall not be idle, for he is always busy. And when he shall come again to the assembly or meet, then he hath most to do, for he must order his finders and relays for to move the heart, and uncouple his hounds. With that he cannot be idle, for he need think of nothing but to do his office, and when he hath uncoupled, yet is he less idle, and he should think less of any sins. For he hath enough to do to ride or to foot it well with his hounds and to be always near them and to hew or rout well, and blow well, and to look whereafter he hunteth, and which hounds are van chasers and parfiters. And redress and bring his hounds on the right line again when they are at fault or hunting rascal. And when the heart is dead or what other chase he was hunting, then is he less idle, for he hath enough to do to think how to undo the heart in his manner and to raise that which appertaineth to him, and well to do his curie. And he should look how many of his hounds are missing of those that he brought to the wood in the morning, and he should search for them, and couple them up. And when he has come home, should he less think to do evil, for he hath enough to do to think of his supper, and to ease himself and his horse, and to sleep, and to take his rest, for he is weary. And to dry himself of the dew or peradventure of the rain. And therefore I say that all the time of the hunter is without idleness and without evil thoughts, and without evil works of sin, for as I have said idleness is the foundation of all vices and sins. And the hunter may not be idle if he would fill his office aright, and also he can have no other thoughts, for he has enough to do to think and imagine of his office, the which is no little charge, for whoso will do it well and busily. Especially if they love hounds and their office. Gaston de Foy has a different sequence, 
putting the heart first and the hare sixth, and having four animals more, namely, the reindeer, the chamois, including ibex, the bear and the rabbit, while the master of game has one animal, the marten. Of which Gaston de Foy does not speak. Gaston de Foy follows a different sequence, commencing with Alonce, the then greyhounds, ratches, spaniels, and says, Fifthly I will speak of all kinds of mongrel dogs, such as come from mastiffs and alaunts, from greyhounds and running hounds. And other such. The hounds that came in the first relay, van, and those in the subsequent relays. See Appendix, Relays. Diverted or off the line. Chasing small or lean deer. See Appendix, Heart. To take those parts of the deer which fell to him by custom. Curie, the ceremony of giving the hounds their reward on the skin of the animal they have chased. See Appendix, Curie. Wherefore I say that such an hunter is not idle, he can have no evil thoughts, nor can he do evil works, wherefore he must go into paradise. For by many other reasons which are too long to write can I prove these things, but it sufficeth that every man that hath good sense knoweth well that I speak the real truth. Gaston de Foy in the French parent work puts it even more forcefully. He says, Tout droid en parody. See Lavallee's edition 1854. Now shall I prove how hunters live in this world more joyfully than any other men. For when the hunter riseth in the morning, and he sees a sweet and fair morn and clear weather and bright, and he heareth the song of the small birds, the which sing so sweetly with great melody and full of love. Each in its own language in the best wise that it can according that it learneth of its own kind. And when the sun is arisen, he shall see fresh dew upon the small twigs and grasses, and the sun by his virtue shall make them shine. And that is great joy and liking to the hunter's heart. After when he shall go to his quest or searching, he shall see or meet anon with the heart without great seeking, and shall harbor him well and readily within a little compass. It is great joy and liking to the hunter. And after when he shall come to the assembly or gathering, and he shall report before the Lord and his company that which he hath seen with his eyes, or by scantilin, measure, of the trace, slot, which he ought always of right to take. Or by the fumes, excrements, that he shall put in his horn or in his lap. And every man shall say, Lo, here is a great heart and a deer of high meeting or pasturing, go we and move him, the which things I shall declare hereafter, then can one say that the hunter has great joy. When he beginneth to hunt and he hath hunted but a little and he shall hear or see the heart start before him and shall well know that it is the right one, and his hounds that shall this day be finders, shall come to the lair, bed. Or to the foos, track, and shall there be uncoupled without any be left coupled, and they shall all run well and hunt, then hath the hunter great joy and great pleasure. Afterwards he leapeth on horseback, if he be of that estate, and else on foot with great haste to follow his hounds. And in case peradventure the hounds shall have gone far from where he uncoupled, he seeketh some advantage to get in front of his hounds. And then shall he see the hart pass before him, and shall hollow a and rout mightily, and he shall see which hound come in the van chase, and in the middle, and which are parfiteurs, according to the order in which they shall come. And when all the hounds have passed before him then shall he ride after them and shall rout and blow as loud as he may with great joy and great pleasure, and I assure you he thinketh of no other sin or of no other evil. And when the heart be overcome and shall be at bay he shall have pleasure. And after, when the heart is spayed and dead, he undoeth him and mocketh his curie and inquireth or rewardeth his hounds, and so he shall have great pleasure, and when he cometh home he cometh joyfully. For his Lord hath given him to drink of his good wine at the curie, and when he has come home he shall doff his clothes and his shoes and his hose, and he shall wash his thighs and his legs, and peradventure all his body. And in the meanwhile he shall order well his supper, with worts, roots, and of the neck of the heart and of other good meats, and good wine or ale. And when he hath well eaten and drunk he shall be glad and well, and well at his ease. And then shall he take the air in the evening of the night, for the great heat that he hath had. And then he shall go and drink and lie in his bed in fair fresh clothes, and shall sleep well and steadfastly all the night without any evil thoughts of any sins, wherefore I say that hunters go into paradise when they die.
and live in this world more joyfully than any other men. Yet I will prove to you how hunters live longer than any other men, for as Hippocrates the doctor telleth, full repletion of meat slayeth more men than any sword or knife. They eat and drink less than any other men of this world, for in the morning at the assembly they eat a little, and if they eat well at supper, they will by the morning have corrected their nature, for then they have eaten but little. And their nature will not be prevented from doing her digestion, whereby no wicked humours or superfluities may be engendered. And always, when a man is sick, men diet him and give him to drink water made of sugar and tisane and of such things for two or three days to put down evil humours and his superfluities, and also make him void, purge. But for a hunter one need not do so, for he may have no repletion on account of the little meat, and by the travail that he hath. And, supposing that which cannot be, and that he were full of wicked humours, yet men know well that the best way to terminate sickness that can be is to sweat. And when the hunters do their office on horseback or on foot they sweat often, then if they have any evil in them, it must, come, away in the sweating, so that he keep from cold after the heat. Therefore it seemeth to me I have proved enough. Leeches ordain for a sick man little meat and sweating for the terminating and healing of all things. And since hunters eat little and sweat always, they should live long and in health. Men desire in this world to live long in health and in joy, and after death the health of the soul. And hunters have all these things. Therefore be ye all hunters and ye shall do as wise men. Wherefore I counsel to all manner of folk of what estate or condition that they be, that they love hounds and hunting and the pleasure of hunting beasts of one kind or another, or hawking. For to be idle and to have no pleasure in either hounds or hawks is no good token. For as saith in his book Phoebus the Earl of Foy that noble hunter, he saw never a good man that had not pleasure in some of these things, were he ever so great and rich. For if he had need to go to war he would not know what war is, for he would not be accustomed to travail, and so another man would have to do that which he should. For men say in old saws, The Lord is worth what his lands are worth. And also he saith in the aforesaid book, that he never saw a man that loved the work and pleasure of hounds and hawks, that had not many good qualities in him. For that comes to him of great nobleness and gentleness of heart of whatever estate the man may be, whether he be a great lord, or a little one, or a poor man or a rich one. Trace the deer to its lair. See Appendix, Excrements. See Appendix, Relays. Dispatched with a sword or knife. See Appendix, Spay. Gaston de Foy says, Tant vot senior tant vot essay gent etsa terra, page 9. Chapter 2. Of the hare and of her nature. The hare is a common beast enough, and therefore I need not tell of her making, for there be few men that have not seen some of them. They live on corn, and on weeds growing on waste land, on leaves, on herbs, on the bark of trees, on grapes and on many other fruits. The hare is a good little beast, and much good sport and liking is the hunting of her, more than that of any other beast that any man knoweth, if he were not so little. And that for five reasons, the one is, for her hunting lasteth all the year as with running hounds without any sparing, and this is not with all the other beasts. And also men may hunt at her both in the morning and in the evening. In the eventide, when they be relieved, and in the morning, when they sit in form. And of all. The hare and her leverets. From MSF FR 616, Bib Nat. Paris. Other beasts it is not so, for if it rain in the morning your journey is lost, and of the hare it is not so. That other, reason, is to seek the hare. It is a welfare thing, especially who so hunteth her rightfully, for hounds must need find her by mastery in quest point by point, and undo all that she hath done all the night of her walking, and of her pasture unto the time that they start her. And it is a fair thing when the hounds are good and can well find her. And the hare shall go sometimes from her sitting to her pasture half a mile or more, specially in open country. And when she is started it is a fair thing. And then it is a fair thing to slay her with strength of hounds, for she runneth long and ginously, cunningly. A hare shall last well for miles or more or less, if she be an old male hare. 
And therefore the hunting of the hare is good, for it lasteth all the year, as I have said. And the seeking is a well-fair thing, and the chasing of the hare is a well-fair thing, and the slaying of him with strength, of hounds, is a fair thing, for it requireth great mastery on account of her cunning. When a hare ariseth out of her form to go to her pasture or return again to her seat, she commonly goes by one way, and as she goes she will not suffer any twig or grass to touch her, for she will sooner break it with her teeth and make her way. Sometimes she sitteth a mile or more from her pasturing, and sometimes near her pasture. But when she sitteth near it, yet she may have been the amount of half a mile or more from there where she hath pastured, and then she roseth again from her pasture. And whether she go to sit near or far from her pasture she goes so ginously, cunningly, and wilily that there is no man in this world that would say that any hound could unravel that which she has done, or that could find her. For she will go about shot or more by one way, and ruse again by another, and then she shall take her way by another side, and the same she shall do ten, twelve, or twenty times, from thence she will come into some hedge or strength, thicket. And shall make semblance to abide there, and then will make cross roads ten or twelve times, and will make her ruses, and thence she will take some false path, and shall go thence a great way. And such semblance she will make many times before she goeth to her seat. The hare was frequently spoken of in two genders in the same sentence, for it was an old belief that the hare was at one time male, and at another female. See Appendix, Hare. Means here, when the hare has arisen from her form to go to her feeding. Father Relever. G. de F. explains, page 42, un livre esse relieve pour aller à sunbinders. Relief, which denoted the act of arising and going to feed, became afterwards the term for the feeding itself. A hare hath greater scent and is more eagerly hunted when she relieves on green corn, comp, sportsman, page 86. It possibly was used later to denote the excrements of a hare, thus Blome, 1686, page 92, says, A huntsman may judge by the relief and feed of the hare what she is. The hare cannot be judged, either by the foot or by her fumes, excrements, for she always croteth in one manner, except when she goeth in her love that hunters call riding time, for then she croteth her fumes more burnt, drier, and smaller. Especially the male. The hare liveth no long time, for with great pain may she pass the second year, though she be not hunted or slain. She hath bad sight and great fear to run on account of the great dryness of her sinews. She windeth far men when they seek her. When hounds greed of her, seek, and quest her she fleeth away for the fear that she hath of the hounds. Sometimes men find her sitting in her form, and sometimes she is bitten, taken, by hounds in her form before she starts. They that abide in the form till they be found are commonly stout hares, and well running. The hare that runneth with right standing ears is but little afraid, and is strong, and yet when she holdeth one ear upright and the other laid low on her rige, back, she feareth but little the hounds. An hare that crumps her tail upon her rump when she starteth out of her form as a coney, does, it is a token that she is strong and well running. The hare runneth in many diverse manners, for some run all they are able a whole two miles or three, and after run and ruse again and then stop still when they can no more, and let themselves be bitten, by the hounds. Although she may not have been seen all the day. And sometimes she letteth herself be bitten the first time that she starteth, for she has no more might, strength. And some run a little while and then abide and squat, and that they do oft. And then they take their flight as long as they can run ere they are dead. And some be that abide till they are bitten in their form, especially when they be young that have not passed half a year. Men know by the outer side of the hare's leg if she has not passed a year. And so men should know of a hound, of a fox, and of a wolf, by a little bone that they have in a bone which is next the sinews, where there is a little pit, cavity. Casting her excrements. A mistake of the old scribes which occurs also in other misses, it should, of course, read, seventh, year. G. de F. has the correct version. G. de F. says, she hears well but has bad sight, page 43. Fear to run, is a mistake occasioned by the similarity of the two old French words, puer, power, 
and power, or fear. In those of the original French MS of G. de F. examined by us it is certainly power, and not fear. Lavallee in his introduction says the same thing. See Appendix, Hair. See Appendix, Hair. Sometimes when they are hunted with hounds they run into a hole as a coney, or into hollow trees, or else they pass a great river. Hounds do not follow some hares as well as others, for four reasons. Those hares who be begotten of the kind of a coney, as some be in warrens, the hounds lust not, nor scent at them not so well. The other, is, that the foos, footing, of some hares carry hotter scent than some, and therefore the hound scenteth of one more than of the other, as of roses, some smell better than others, and yet they be all roses. The other reason is that they steal away ere they be found, and the hounds follow always forthright. The others run going about and then abide, wherefore the hounds be often on at fault. The other reason is according to the country they run in, for if they run in covert, hounds will scent them better than if they run in plain, open, country, or in the ways, paths, for in the covert their bodies touch against the twigs and leaves. Because it is a strong, thick, country. And when they run in plain country or in the fields they touch nothing, but with the foot, and therefore the hound cannot so well scent the foos of them. And also I say that some country is more sweet and more loving, to scent, than another. The hare abideth commonly in one country, and if she hath the fellowship of another or of her kindles or leverets, they be five or six, for no strange hare will they suffer to dwell in their marches, district. Though they be of their nature, kind, and therefore men say in old saws, who so hunteth the most hares shall find the most. For Phoebus the Earl of Foy, that good hunter, saith that when there be few hares in a country they should be hunted and slain, so that the hares of other countries about should come into that march. G. de F. Has, Vance Riotans Turnians et de Maurent, i.e. run rioting, turning and stopping, page 44. Both the Vespasian and the Shirley MS in the British Museum have the same, but G. de F. P. 45, has, except those of their nature, furs k sell de leur nature. Of hares, some go faster and be stronger than others, as it is of men and other beasts. Also the pasture and the country where they abide helpeth much thereto. For when the hare abideth and fermeth in a plain country where there are no bushes, such hares are commonly strongest and well running. Also when they pasture on two herbs, that one is called sopal, wild thyme, and that other be pulegium, penny royal, they are strong and fast running. The hares have no season of their love for, as I said, it is called riding time, for in every month of the year that it shall not be that some be not with kindles, young. Nevertheless, Commonly their love is most in the month of January, and in that month they run most fast of any time of the year, both male and female. And from May unto September they be most slow, for then they be full of herbs and of fruits, or they be great and full of kindles, and commonly in that time they have their kindles. Hares remain in sundry, parts of the, country, according to the season of the year, sometimes they sit in the fern, sometimes in the heath, sometimes in the corn, and in growing weeds, and sometimes in the woods. In April and in May when the corn is so long that they can hide themselves therein, gladly will they sit therein. And when men begin to reap the corn they will sit in the vines and in other strong, thick, heaths, in bushes and in hedges, and commonly in cover under the wind and in cover from the rain. And if there be any sun shining they will gladly sit against the beams of the sun. For a hare of its own kind knoweth the night before what weather it will be on the next morrow, and therefore she keepeth herself the best way she may from the evil weather. The hare beareth her kindles two months, and when they are kindled she licketh her kindles as a bitch doeth her whelps. Then she runneth a great way thence, and goeth to seek the male, for if she should abide with her kindles she would gladly eat them. And if she findeth not the male, she cometh again to her kindles a great while after and giveth them to suck, and nourisheth them for the maintenance of twenty days or thereabouts. A hare beareth commonly two kindles, but I have seen some which have kindled at once sometimes six, sometime five or four or two, and but she find the male within three days from the time she hath kindled, she will eat her kindles. 
and when they be in their love they go together as hounds, save they hold and not together as hounds. They kindle often in small bushes or in little hedges, or they hide in heath or in briars or in corn or in vines. If you find a hare which has kindled the same day, and the hounds hunt after her, and if you come thither the next morrow ye shall find how she has removed her kindles, and has borne them elsewhere with her teeth, as a bitch doth her whelps. Men slay hares with greyhounds, and with running hounds by strength, as in England, but elsewhere they slay them also with small pockets, and with purse nets, and with small nets, with hair pipes, and with long nets. And with small cords that men cast where they make their breaking of the small twigs when they go to their pastures, as I have before said. But, truly, I trow no good hunter would slay them so for any good. When they be in their heat of love and pass any place where conies be, the most part of them will follow after her as the hounds follow after a bitch or a brache. This is incorrect, the hare carries her young thirty days, Brem, Volume 2. Page 626, Harding, Encyclopedia of Sport, Volume 1, Page 504. Should read, 3, G, De, F, Page 47. See Appendix, Snares. How to Quest for the Heart in Woods. From MSF, FR. 616, Bib Nat, Paris. Chapter 3. Of the Heart and His Nature. The heart is a common beast enough and therefore me needeth not to tell of his making, for there be few folk that have not seen some. The hearts be the lightest, swiftest, beasts and strongest, and of marvellous great cunning. They are in their love, which men call rut, about the time of the holy root in September and remain in their hot love a whole month and ere they be fully out thereof they abide, in rut, nigh two months. And then they are bold, and run upon men as a wild boar would do if he were hunted. And they be wonderfully perilous beasts, for with great pain shall a man recover that is hurt by a heart, and therefore men say in old saws, after the boar the leech and after the heart the beer. For he smitteth as the stroke of the spring ole, for he has great strength in the head and the body. They slay, fight and hurt each other, when they be in rut, that is to say in their love, and they sing in their language that in England hunters call bellowing as man that loveth paramour. They slay hounds and horses and men at that time and turn to the abbey, be at bay, as a boar does especially when they be weary. And yet have men seen at the parting of their ligging, as they start from the lair, that he hath hurt him that followeth after, and also the greyhounds and furthermore a courser. And yet when they are in rut, which is to say their love, in a forest where there be few hinds and many hearts or male deer, they slay, hurt and fight with each other, for each would be master of the hinds. And commonly the greatest heart and the most strong holdeth the rut and is master thereof. And when he is well pured and hath been long at rut all the other hearts that he hath chased and flemmed away, put to flight, from the rut then run upon him and slay him, and that is sooth. And in parks this may be proved, for there is never a season but the greatest heart will be slain by the others not while he is at the rut, but when he has withdrawn and is poor of love. In the woods they do not so often slay each other as they do in the plain country. And also there are diverse ruts in the forest, but in the parks there are none but that are within the park. After that they be withdrawn from the hinds they go in herds and in sops, troops, with the rascal, young lean deer, and abide in, waste, lands and in heaths more than they do in woods, for to enjoy the heat of the sun. They be poor and lean for the travail they have had with the hinds, and for the winter, and the little meat that they find. After that they leave the rascal and gather together with two or three or four hearts in sops till the month of March when they mew, shed, their horns, and commonly some sooner than others, if they be old deer, and some later if they be young deer. Or that they have had a hard winter, or that they have been hunted, or that they have been sick, for then they mew their heads and later come to good points. And when they have mewed their heads they take to the strong, thick, bushes as privily as they may, till their heads be grown again, and they come into Greece. After that they seek good country for meeting, feeding, of corn, of apples, of vines, of tender growing trees, of peas, of beans, and other fruits and grasses whereby they live. And sometimes a great heart hath another fellow that is called his squire, for he is with him and doth as he will. 
and so they will abide all that season if they be not hindered until the last end of August. And then they begin to look, and to think and to bowl and to bellow and to stir from the haunt in which they have, been, all the season, for to go seek the hinds. They recover their horns and are summed of their tines as many as they shall have all the year between March when they mewed them to the middle of June. And then be they recovered of their new hair that men call polished and their horns be recovered with a soft hair that hunters call velvet at the beginning, and under that skin and that hair the horn waxes hard and sharp. And about Mary Magdalene Day, July 22nd, they fray their horns against the trees, and have, rubbed, away that skin from their horns and then wax they hard and strong. And then they go to burnish and make them sharp in the collier's places, charcoal pits, that men make sometimes in the great groves. And if they can find none they go against the corners of rocks or to crab tree or to hawthorn or other trees. They be half in Greece or thereabouts by the middle of June when their head is summed, and they be highest in Greece during all August. Commonly they be calved in May, and the hind beareth her calf nine months or thereabout as a sow, and sometimes she has three calves at a calving time. And I say not that they do not calve sometime sooner and sometime later, much according to causes and reasons. The calves are calved with hair red and white, which lasteth them that color into the end of August, and then they turn red of hair, as the heart and the hind. And at that time they run so fast that a hare should have enough to do to overtake him within the shot of an heronblast, crossbow. Many men judge the deer of many colors of hair and especially of three colors. Some be called brown, some dun, and some yellow-haired. And also their heads be of diverse manners, the one is called a head well-grown, and the other is called well-affetted, and well-affetted is when the head has waxed by ordinance according to the neck and shape. When the tines be well grown in the beam by good measure, one near the other, then it is called well affetted. Well grown is when the head is of great beam and is well affetted and thick tined, well high and well opened, spread. That other head is called counterfeit, abnormal, when it is different and is otherwise turned behind or wayward in other manner than other common deer be accustomed to bear. That other high head is open, evil affetted with long tines and few. That other is low and great and well affetted with small tines. And the first tine that is next the head is called antler, and the second royal and the third above, the sir royal, and the tines which be called forth if they be two, and if they be three or four or more be called trochane. And when their heads be burnished at the collier's pits commonly they be always black, and also commonly when they be burnished at the collier's pits they be black on account of the earth which is black of its kind. And when they are burnished against rock they abide all white, but some have their heads naturally white and some black. And when they be about to burnish they smite the ground with their feet and welter like a horse. And then they burnish their heads, and when they be burnished which they do all the month of July they abide in that manner till the Feast of the Holy, Cross, in September 14th and then they go to rut as I have said. September 14th. See Appendix, Heart, Seasons. An engine of war used for throwing stones. G. de F., page 12. Ainsi que fait un homme bien amorous, as does a man much in love. This word ligging is still in use in Yorkshire, meaning lair, or bed, or resting place. In Devonshire it is spelt layer. Fortescue, page 132. G. de F., page 12, has limer instead of greyhound. This passage is confused. In G. de F. P. 12, we find that the passage runs, He de y a root en divers lo de la forest et on pigs en put ester en no lu, furs k de don la part. Lavalli translates these last five words, say a dire chu i l n y a de pigs k lorsk les bitches sont plines. In the exceedingly faulty first edition by Verard, the word part is printed park, as it is in our MS. G. de F. P. 14, says the hearts go to gravel pits and bogs to fray. The MS transcriber's mistake. It should be cow. G. de F. has two calves, as it should be. G. de F. has greyhound, as it should be, P. 
15. Giti des lors vont ils ja si tost k un levrier a asses a fur de elatindra, ainsi come un trait d'arc ballest, and from that time they go so quickly that a greyhound has as much to do to catch him as he would the bolt from a crossbow. Well proportioned. See Appendix, Antler. Surely MS has the addition here, which be on top. And the first year that they be calved they be called a calf, the second year a bullock, and that year they go forth to rut. The third year a brocket, the fourth year a staggered, the fifth a stag, the sixth year a heart of ten and then first is he chaseable, for always before shall he be called but rascal or folly. Then it is fair to hunt the heart, for it is a fair thing to seek well a heart, and a fair thing well to harbor him, and a fair thing to move him, and a fair thing to hunt him, and a fair thing to retrieve him, and a fair thing to be at the abbey. Whether it be on water or on land. A fair thing is the curie, and a fair thing to undo him well, and for to raise the rights. And a well fair thing and good is the division it be a good deer. In so much that considering all things I hold that it is the fairest hunting, that any man may hunt after. They crody their fumes, cast their excrements, in diverse manners according to the time and season and according to the pasture that they find, now black or dry either in flat forms or in glamed, glutinous, or pressed. And in many other divers manners the which I shall more plainly devise when I shall declare how the hunter shall judge, for sometimes they misjudge by the fumes and so they do by the foot. When they crody their fumes flat and not thick, it is in April or in May, into the middle of June, when they have fed on tender corn, for yet their fumes be not formed, and also they have not recovered their grease. But yet have men seen sometimes a great deer and an old and high in grease, which about mid-season crody their fumes black and dry. And therefore by this and many other things many men may be beguiled by deer, for some goeth better and are better running and fly better than some, as other beasts do, and some be more cunning and more wily than others, as it is with men. For some be wiser than others. And it cometh to them of the good kind of their father and mother, and of good getting, breeding, and of good nurture and from being born in good constellations, and in good signs of heaven, and that, is the case, with men and all other beasts. Men take them with hounds, with greyhounds and with nets and with cords, and with other harness, with pits and with shot and with other gins, traps, and with strength, as I shall say hereafter. But in England they are not slain except with hounds or with shot or with strength of running hounds. In modern sporting terms, a warrantable deer. See Appendix, Curie. Should be, venison. Harness, appurtenances. See Appendix, harness. Means from a crossbow or longbow. An old deer is wonder-wise and fell, cunning, for to save his life, and to keep his advantage when he is hunted and is uncoupled to, as the limer moveth him or other hounds findeth him without limers. And if he have a deer, with him, that be his fellow he leaveth him to the hounds, so that he may warrant, save, himself, and let the hounds in chase after that other deer. And he will abide still, and if he be alone and the hounds find him, he shall go about his haunt wilily and wisely and seek the change of other deer, for to make the hounds and voice, and to look where he may abide. And if he cannot abide he taketh leave of his haunt and beginneth to fly there where he wots of other change and then when he has come thither he herdeth among them and sometimes he goeth away with them. And then he mocketh a ruse on some side, and there he stalleth or squatteth until the hounds be forth after the other, dear, the which be fresh, and thus he changeth so that he may abide. And if there be any wise hounds, the which can bodily and chase him from the change, and he seeth that all can not avail, then he beginneth to show his wiles and ruseth to and fro. And all this he doth so that the hounds should not find his foos, tracks, in intent that he may be freed from them and that he may save himself. Go off the scent. Sometimes he fleeth forth with the wind and that for three causes, for when he fleeth against the wind it runneth into his mouth and drieth him and doth him great harm. Therefore he fleeth oft forth with the wind so that he may always hear the hounds come after him. And also that the hounds should not scent nor find him, for his tail is in the wind and not his nose. Also, that when the hounds be nigh him he may win them and hide him well from them. 
but nevertheless his nature is for the most part to flee ever on the wind till he be nigh overcome, or at the last sideways to the wind so that it be I, ever, in his nostrils. And when he shall hear that they be far from him, he heath him not too fast. And when he is weary, and hot, then he goeth to yield, and soileth to some great river. And some time he foils down in the water half a mile or more ere he comes to land on any side. And that he doeth for two reasons, the one is to make himself cold, and for to refresh himself of the great heat that he hath, the other is that the hounds and the hunter may not come after him nor see his foos in the water, as they do on the land. And if in the country, there, is no great river he goeth then to the little, one, and shall beat up the water or foil down the water as he liketh best for the maintenance, extent, of a mile or more ere he come to land. And he shall keep himself from touching any of the brinks or branches but always, keep, in the middle of the water, so that the hounds should not send of him. And all that doth he for two reasons before said. This should read as G, the F has it, P. 20 idiosi a fin k les chiens ini puis and bien a centre de lie, quarils orant la cue o venti di non paulones, and also that the hounds shall not be able to wind him, as they will have their tails in the wind and not their noses. And when he can find no rivers then he draweth to great stanks and mirs or to great marshes. And he fleeth then mightily and far from the hounds, that is to say that he hath gone a great way from them, then he will go into the stank. And will soil therein once or twice in all the stank and then he will come out again by the same way that he went in, and then he shall ruse again the same way that he came, the length of, a bow shot or more, and then he shall ruse out of the way. For to stall or squat to rest him, and that he doeth for he knoweth well that the hounds shall come by the foos into the stank where he was. And when they should find that he has gone no further they will seek him no further, for they will well know that they have been there at other times. Ponds, Pools. See Appendix, Stanks. G. De F. P. 21. Eat S. I. L. Fut de Fort Lunge A. U. X. G. N. S. Say A. Dire K. I. L. Les A. P. N. S. Loinhees. See Appendix, For Long. An heart liveth longest of any beast for he may well live an hundred years and the older he is the fairer he is of body and of head, and more lecherous, but he is not so swift, nor so light, nor so mighty. And many men say, but I make no affirmation upon that, when he is right old he beateth a serpent with his foot till she be wrath, and then he eateth her and then goeth to drink. And then runneth hither and thither to the water till the venom be mingled together and make him cast all his evil humours that he had in his body, and mocketh his flesh come all new. The head of the heart beareth medicine against the hardness of the sinews and is good to take away all aches, especially when these come from cold, and so is the marrow. They have a bone within the heart which hath great medicine, for it comforteth the heart, and helpeth for the cardiac, and many other things which were too long to write, the which bear medicine and be profitable in many diverse manners. The heart is more wise in two things than is any man or other beast, the one is in tasting of herbs, for he hath better taste and better savour and smelleth the good herbs and leaves and other pastures and meeting the which be profitable to him. Better than any man or beast. The other is that he hath more wit and malice, cunning, to save himself than any other beast or man, for there is not such a good hunter in the world that can think of the great malice and gins, tricks or ruses, that a heart can do. And there is no such good hunter nor such good hounds, but that many times fail to slay the heart, and that is by his wit and his malice and by his gins. Most old writers on the natural history of deer repeat this fable. See Appendix, Heart. See Appendix, Heart. As of the hind some be barren and some bear calves, of those that be barren their season beginneth when the season of the heart faileth and lasteth till Lent. And they which bear calves, in the morning when she shall go to her lair she will not remain with her calf, but she will hold, keep, him and leave him a great way from her, and smitteth him with the foot and mocketh him to lie down. And there the calf shall remain always while the hind goeth to feed. And then she shall call her calf in her language and he shall come to her. And that she doeth so that if she were hunted her calf might be saved and that he should not be found near her. The hearts have more power to run well from the entry of May into St. 
John's tithe than any other time, for then they have put on new flesh and new hair and new heads, for the new herbs and the new coming out, shoots, of trees and of fruits and be not too heavy, for as yet they have not recovered their grease. Neither within nor without, nor their heads, wherefore they be much lighter and swifter. But from St. John's into the month of August they wax always more heavy. Their skin is right good for to do many things with when it is well tawed and taken in good season. Hearts that be in great hills, when it cometh to rut, sometimes they come down into the great forests and heaths and to the lawns, uncultivated country, and there they abide all the winter until the entering of April. And then they take to their haunts for to let their heads wax, near the towns and villages in the plains there where they find good feeding in the new growing lands. And when the grass is high and well waxen they withdraw into the greatest hills that they can find for the fair pastures and feeding and fair herbs that be thereupon. And also because there be no flies nor any other vermin, as there be in the plain country. And also so doth the cattle which come down from the hills in winter time, and in the summer time draw to the hills. And all the time from rutting time into Whitsunday great deer and old will be found in the plains, but from Whitsunday to rutting time men shall find but few great deer save upon the hills, if there are any, hills, near or within four or five miles. And this is truth unless it be some young deer calved in the plains, but of those that come from the hills there will be none. And every day in the heat of the day, and he be not hindered, from May to September, he goes to soil though he be not hunted. Nativity of St. John the Baptist, June 24. See Appendix, Greece. This sentence reads somewhat confusedly in our MS. So I have taken this rendering straight from G. de F., page 23. Chapter 4. Of the buck and of his nature. A buck is a diverse beast, he hath not his hair as a heart, for he is more white, and also he hath not such a head. He is less than a heart and is larger than a row. A buck's head is palmed with a long palming, and he beareth more tines than doth a heart. His head cannot be well described without painting. They have a longer tail than the heart, and more grease on their haunches than a heart. They are fond in the month of June and shortly to say they have the nature of the heart, save only that the heart goeth sooner to rut and is sooner in his season again, also in all things of their kind the heart goeth before the buck. For when the heart hath been fifteen days at rut the buck scarcely beginneth to be in heat and bellow. And also men go not to sue him with a limer, nor do men go to harbour him as men do to the heart. Nor are his fumes put in judgment as those of the heart, but men judge him by the foot other head as I shall say more plainly hereafter. Buck Hunting with Running Hounds From MSF FR 616, Bib Nat. Paris they crody their fumes in diverse manners according to the time and pasture, as doth the heart, but oftener black and dry than otherwise. When they are hunted they bound again into their coverts and fly not so long as doth the heart, for sometimes they run upon the hounds. And they run long and fly ever if they can by the highways and always with the change. They let themselves be taken at the water and beat the brooks as a heart, but not with such great malice as the heart, nor so ginously, cunningly, and also they go not to such great rivers as the heart. They run faster at the beginning than doth the heart. They bulk, bellow, about when they go to rut, not as a heart doth, but much lower than the heart, and rattling in the throat. Their nature and that of the heart do not love, to be, together, for gladly would they not dwell there where many hearts be, nor the hearts there where the bucks be namely together in herds. The buck's flesh is more savory than is that of the heart or of the roebuck. The venison of them is right good if kept and salted as that of the heart. They abide oft in a dry country and always commonly in herd with other bucks. Their season lasteth from the month of May into the middle of September. And commonly they dwell in a high country where there be valleys and small hills. He is undone as the heart. They do not make such a long flight as the red deer but by ringing return to the hounds. G. de F. P. 29, completes the sense of this sentence by saying that, the flesh of the buck is more savory to all hounds than that of the stag or of the roe. And for this reason it is a bad change to hunt the stag with hounds which at some other time have eaten buck. 
Chapter 5 Of the Roe and of His Nature The roebuck is a common beast enough, and therefore I need not to tell of his making, for there be few men that have not seen some of them. It is a good little beast and goodly for to hunt to whoso can do it as I shall devise hereafter, for there be few hunters that can well devise his nature. They go in their love that is called boking in October, and the bucking of them lasteth but fifteen days or thereabout. At the bucking of the roebuck he hath to do but with one female for all the season, and a male and a female abide together as the hinds till the time that the female shall have her kids. And then the female partaith from the male and goeth to kid her kids far from thence, for the male would slay the young if he could find them. And when they be big that they can eat by themselves of the herbs and of the leaves and can run away, then the female cometh again to the male, and they shall ever be together unless they be slain. And if one hunt them and part them asunder one from another, they will come together again as soon as they can and will seek each other until the time that one of them have found the other. And the cause why the male and the female be ever more together as no others in this world, is that commonly the female hath two kids at once, one male and the other female, and because they are kitted together they hold ever more together. And yet if they were not kitted together of one female, yet is the nature of them such that they will always hold together as I have said before. When they withdraw from the bucking, they mew their heads, for men will find but few roebucks that have passed two years that have not mewed their heads by all hallotide. And after the heads come again rough as a heart's head, and commonly they burnish their horns in march. The roebuck hath no season to be hunted, for they bear no venison but men should leave them the females for their kids that would be lost unto the time that they have kidded. And that the kids can feed themselves and live by themselves without their dame. It is good hunting for it lasteth all the year and they run well, and longer than does a great heart in Higgison time. Roebucks cannot be judged by their fumes, and but little by their track as one can of hearts, for a man cannot know the male from the female by her feet or by her fumes. This is wrong, they run in the beginning of August. See Appendix, Row. A Clerical Error. G. De F., page 36, says, As do birds, which makes good sense. See Appendix, Greece. They have not a great tail and do not gather venison as I have said, the greatest grease that they may have within is when the kidneys be covered all white. When the hounds hunt after the roebuck they turn again into their haunts and sometimes turn again to the hounds. When they see that they cannot dure, last, they leave the country and run right long ere they be dead. And they run in and out a long time and beat the brooks in the same way a heart doth. And if the roebuck were as fair a beast as the heart, I hold that it were a fairer hunting than that of the heart, for it lasteth all the year and is good hunting and requires great mastery, for they run right long and ginously, cunningly. Although they mew their heads they do not reburnish them, nor repair their hair till new grass time. It is a diverse, peculiar, beast, for it doth nothing after the nature of any other beast, and he followeth men into their houses, for when he is hunted and overcome he knoweth never where he goeth. The flesh of the roebuck is the most wholesome to eat of any other wild beast's flesh, they live on good herbs and other woods and vines and on briars and hawthorns with leaves and on all growth of young trees. When the female has her kid she does all in the manner as I have said of a hind. When they be in bucking they sing a right foul song, for it seemeth as if they were bitten by hounds. When they run at their ease they run ever with leaps, but when they be weary or followed by hounds they run naturally and sometimes they trot or go apace, and sometimes they hasten and do not leap. And then men say that the roebuck hath lost his leaps, and they say amiss, for he ever leaves off leaping when he is well hasted and also when he is weary. They ring about in their own country, and often bound back to the hounds, would be a better translation. From the French Durer, to last. G. de F. says acorns. When he runneth at the beginning, as I have said, he runneth with leaps and with rugged standing hair and the eeries, target, and the tail cropping up all white. Middle English R's, hinder parts called target of roebuck. And when he hath run long his hair lieth sleek down, not standing nor rugged and his eeries, target, does not show so white. And when he can run no longer he cometh and yieldeth himself to some small brook, 
and when he hath long beaten the brook upward or downward he remaineth in the water under some roots so that there is nothing out of water save his head. Roebuck Hunting with Greyhounds and Running Hounds From MSF FR 616, Bib Nat, Paris And sometimes the hounds and the hunters shall pass above him and beside him and he will not stir. For although he be a foolish beast he has many ruses and treasons to help himself. He runneth wondrous fast, for when he starts from his lair he will go faster than a brace of good greyhounds. They haunt thick coverts of wood, or thick heaths, and sometimes in cares, marshes, and commonly in high countries or in hills and valleys and sometimes in the plains. The kids are kitted with pummeled, spotted, hair as are the hind calves. And as a hind's calf of the first year beginneth to put out his head, in the same wise does he put out his small brokes, spikes, ere he be a twelve-month old. He is hard held but not undone as a heart, for he has no venison that men should lay in salt. And sometimes he is given all to the hounds, and sometimes only a part. They go to their feeding as other beasts do, in the morning and in the evening, and then they go to their lair. The roebuck remains commonly in the same country both winter and summer if he be not grieved or hunted out thereof. From the Old French Pomili. See Appendix, Ro. See Appendix, Hardell. Chapter 6. Of the Wild Boar and of His Nature. A wild boar is a common beast enough and therefore it needeth not to tell of his making, for there be few gentlemen that have not seen some of them. It is the beast of this world that is strongest armed, and can sooner slay a man than any other. Neither is there any beast that he could not slay if they were alone sooner than that other beast could slay him, be they lion or leopard, unless they should leap upon his back, so that he could not turn on them with his teeth. And there is neither lion nor leopard that slayeth a man at one stroke as a boar doth, for they mostly kill with the raising of their claws and through biting, but the wild boar slayeth a man with one stroke as with a knife. And therefore he can slay any other beast sooner than they could slay him. It is a proud beast and fierce and perilous, for many times have men seen much harm that he hath done. For some men have seen him slit a man from knee up to the breast and slay him all stark dead at one stroke so that he never spake thereafter. In spite of the boar being such a dangerous animal a wound from his tusk was not considered so fatal as one from the antlers of a stag. An old 14th century saying was, Pour le sanglier faux le mire, mais pour le cerf convient la beer. Proud. G. de F. Page 56, Orguilius. G. de F. P. 57, says after this that he has often himself been thrown to the ground, he with his courser, by a wild boar and the courser killed, eat moi misums a il port molta a terra moi etimon corsia, eat mort la corsia. They go in their love to the brimming as sows do about the feast of St. Andrew, and are in their brimming love three weeks, and when the sows are cool the boar does not leave them. Brimming. From Middle English brime, burning heat. It was also used in the sense of valiant spirited, Stratman. November 30th. G. de F., page 57, adds, Come fate lores. He stays with them till the twelfth day after Christmas, and then the boar leaves the sows and goeth to take his covert, and to seek his livelihood alone, and thus he stays unty next year when he goeth again to the sows. They abide not in one place one night as they do in another, but find their pasture for, till, all pastures fail them as hawthorns and other things. Sometimes a great boar has another with him but this happens but seldom. They farrow in March, and once in the year they go in their love. And there are few wild sows that farrow more than once in the year, nevertheless men have seen them farrow twice in the year. A badly worded phrase, the meaning of which is not quite clear. G. de F. has acorns and beech mast, instead of hawthorns. Farrow. See Appendix, Wild Boar. Sometimes they go far to their feeding between night and day, and return to their covert and den ere it be day. But if the day overtakes them on the way ere they can get to their covert they will abide in some little thicket all that day until it be night. They wind a man as far as any other beast or farther. They live on herbs and flowers especially in May, which mocketh them renew their hair and tea flesh. 
and some good hunters of beyond the sea say that in that time they bear medicine on account of the good herbs and the good flowers that they eat, but thereupon I make no affirmation. They eat all manner of fruits and all manner of corn, and when these fail them they root in the ground with the rowel of their snouts which is right hard. They root deep in the ground till they find the roots of the ferns and of the spurge and other roots of which they have the savour, scent, in the earth. And therefore have I said they wind wonderfully far and marvellously well. And also they eat all the vermin and carrion and other foul things. They have a hard skin and strong flesh, especially upon their shoulders which is called the shield. Their season begins from the Holy Cross day in September to the Feast of Esti. Andrew for then they go to the brimming of the sows. For they are in Greece when they be withdrawn from the sows. The sows are in season from the brimming time which is to say the twelfth day after Christmas till the time when they have farrowed. The boars turn commonly to bay on leaving their dens for the pride that is in them, and they run upon some hounds and at men also. But when the boar is heated, or wrathful, or hurt, then he runneth upon all things that he sees before him. He dwelleth in the strong wood and the thickest that he can find and generally runneth in the most covered and thickest way so that he may not be seen as he trusteth not much in his running, but only in his defence and in his desperate deeds. He often stops and turns to bay, and especially when he is at the brimming and hath a little advantage before the hounds of the first running, and these will never overtake him unless other new hounds be uncoupled to him. G. De F. P. 58. Says he wind acorns as well or better than a bear, but nothing about winding a man. See Appendix, Wild Boar. From F. Renouveler. See Appendix, Wild Boar. September 14th. November 30th. Despiteful or furious deeds. G. De F. P. 60. Says that he only trusts in his defenses and his weapons. NSA Defense ET NSES Arms. He will well run and fly from the sun rising to the going down of the sun, if he be a young boar of three years old. In the third March counting that in which he was pharaohed, he partaith from his mother and may well engender at the year's end. As this is somewhat confused we have followed G, the FS text in the modern rendering. They have four tusks, two in the jaw above and two in the nether jaw, of small teeth speak not I, the which are like other boars' teeth. The two tusks above serve for nothing except to sharpen his two nether tusks and make them cut well and men beyond the sea call the nether tusks of the boar his arms or his files, with these they do great harm. And also they call the tusks above gress, grinders, for they only serve to make the others sharp as I have said, and when they are at bay they keep smiting their tusks together to make them sharp and cut better. When men hunt the boar they commonly go to soil and soil in the dirt and if they be hurt the soil is their medicine. The boar that is in his third year or a little more is more perilous and more swift and doth more harm than an old boar, as a young man more than an old man. An old boar will be sooner dead than a young one for he is proud and heavier and deigneth not to fly, and sooner he will run upon a man than fly, and smitteth great strokes but not so perilously as a young boar. From the French grass, grinding stone or grinders. A boar heareth wonderfully well and clearly, and when he is hunted and cometh out of the forest or bush or when he is so hunted that he is compelled to leave the country, he sorely dreads to take to the open country and to leave the forest. And therefore he puts his head out of the wood before he puts out his body, then he abideth there and hearkeneth and looketh about and taketh the wind on every side. And if that time he seeth anything that he thinks might hinder him in the way he would go, then he turneth again into the wood. Then will he never more come out though all the horns and all the hollowing of the world were there. But when he has undertaken the way to go out he will spare for nothing but will hold his way throughout. When he fleeth he mocketh but few turnings, but when he turneth to bay, and then he runneth upon the hounds and upon the man. And for no stroke or wound that men do him will he complain or cry, but when he runneth upon the men he meneseth, strongly groaning. But while he can defend himself he defendeth himself without complaint, and when he can no longer defend himself there be few boars that will not complain or cry out when they are overcome to the death. G. De F. P. 60. Has, fortress, instead of, forest. 
After the word death, a full stop should occur, for in this MS and, singularly enough, also in the Shirley MS. The following words have been omitted, they drop their less, continuing, as other swine do. They drop their less, excrements, as other swine do, according to their pasture being hard or soft. But men do not take them to the curie nor are they judged as of the heart or other beasts of venere. A boar can with great pain live twenty years, he never casts his teeth nor his tusks nor loses them unless by a stroke. The boar's grease is good as that of other tame swine, and their flesh also. Some men say that by the foreleg of a boar one can know how old he is, for he will have as many small pits in the forelegs as he has years, but of this I make no affirmation. The sows lead about their pigs with them till they have farrow twice and no longer, and then they chase their first pigs away from them for by that time they be two years old and three marches counting the march in which they were farrowed. In short they are like tame sows, excepting that they farrow but once in a year and the tame sows farrow twice. When they be wroth they run at both men and hounds and other beasts as, does, the wild boar and if they cast down a man they abide longer upon him than doeth a boar, but she cannot slay a man as soon as a boar for she has not such tusks as the boar. But sometimes they do much harm by biting. Boars and sows go to soil gladly when they go to their pasture, all day, and when they return they sharpen their tusks and cut against trees when they rub themselves on coming from the soil. What men call a trip of tame swine is called of wild swine a sounder, that is to say if there be past a five or six together. At this point G, de F, P. 61, adds, one says of all biting beasts the trace, and of red beasts foot or view, and one can call both one or the other the paths or the foos. See Appendix, Wild Boar. Chapter 7. Of the Wolf and of His Nature. A wolf is a common beast enough and therefore I need not tell of his make, for there are few men beyond the sea, that have not seen some of them. They are in their love in February with the females and then be jolly and do in the manner as hounds do, and be in their great heat of love ten or twelve days. And when the bitch is in greatest heat then if there are any wolves in the country they all go after her as hounds do after a bitch when she is jolly. But she will not be lined by any of the wolves save by one. She doth in such a wise that she will lead the wolves for about six or eight days without meat or drink and without sleep for they have so great courage towards her, that they have no wish to eat nor to drink. And when they be full weary she lets them rest until the time that they sleep, and then she cloth him with her foot and wake him that seemeth to have loved her most, and who hath most laboured for her love. And then they go a great way thence and there he lines her. And therefore men say beyond the seas in some countries when any woman doth amiss. That she is like to the wolf bitch for she taketh to her the worst and the foulest and the most wretched and it is truth that the bitch of the wolf taketh to her the foulest and most wretched. For he hath most laboured and fasted for her and is most poor, most lean and most wretched. And this is the cause why men say that the wolf saw never his father and it is truth sometimes but not always, for it happeneth that when she has brought the wolf that she loveth most as I have said. And when the other wolves awaken they follow anon in her track, and if they can find the wolf and the bitch holding together then will all the other wolves run upon him and slay him, and all this is truth in this case. But when in all the country there is but one wolf and one bitch of his kind then this rule cannot be truth. G. de F., page 63, has, Pors chuil a plus travail et plus chun k and ointi les otras. And sometimes peradventure the other wolves may be awake so late that if the wolf is not fast with the bitch or peradventure he hath left her then he fleeth away from the other wolves. So they slay him not so in this case the first opinion is not true. They may get young whelps at the year's end, and then they leave their father and their mother. And sometimes before they are twelve months old if so be that their teeth are fully grown after their other small teeth which they had first, for they teeth twice in the year when they are whelps. The first teeth they cast when they are half a year old and also their hooks. Then other teeth come to them which they bear all their lifetime and never cast. When these are full grown again then they leave their father and mother and go on their adventures. 
but notwithstanding that they go far they do not bide long away from each other and if it happens that they meet with their father and with their mother the which hath nourished them they will make them joy and great reverence alway. And also I would have you know that when a bitch and a wolf of her kind hath fellowship together they generally stay evermore together. And though they sometimes go to seek their feeding the one far from the other they will be together at night if they can or at the farthest at the end of three days. And such wolves in fellowship together get meat for their whelps the father as well as the mother, save only that the wolf eateth first his fill and then bears the remnant to his whelps. The bitch does not do so for she beareth all her meat to her whelps and eateth with them. And if the wolf is with the whelps when the mother cometh and she bringeth anything and the wolf has not enough he taketh the feeding from her and her whelps, and eateth his fill first, and then he leaveth them the remnant, if there be any. And if there be not any left they die of hunger, if they will, for he recketh but little so that his belly be full. And when the mother seeth that, and has been far to seek her meat she leaveth her meat a great way thence for her whelps, and then she cometh to see if the wolf is with them. And if he be there she stayeth till he be gone and then she bringeth them her meat. But also the wolf is so malicious that when he seeth her come without food he goeth and windeth her muzzle and if he windeth she hath brought anything he taketh her by the teeth and biteth her so that she must show him where she hath left her food. And when the bitch perceiveth that the wolf doth this when she returneth to her whelp she keepeth in the covert and doth not show herself if she perceiveth that the wolf is with them. And if he be there she hideth herself until the time he hath gone to his prey on account of his great hunger, and when he is gone she brings her whelps her food for to eat. And this is truth. Some men say that she bathes her body in her head so that the wolf should win nothing of her feeding when she cometh to them, but of this I make no affirmation. There be other heavy wolves of this nature, the which be not so in fellowship. They do not help the bitch to nourish the whelps but when a wolf and a bitch are in fellowship and there are no wolves in that country by very natural smelling he knoweth well that the whelps are his and therefore he helpeth to nourish them but not well. At the time that she hath whelps the wolf is fattest in all the year, for he eateth and taketh all that the bitch and whelps should eat. The bitch beareth her whelps nine weeks and sometimes three or four days more. Once in the year they are in their love and are jolly. Some men say that the bitches bear no whelps while their mother liveth, but thereof I make no affirmation. The bitches of them have their whelps as other tame bitches, sometimes more, sometimes less. They have great strength especially before, four quarters, and evil they be and strong, for sometimes a wolf will slay a cow or a mare and he hath great strength in his mouth. Sometime he will bear in his mouth a goat or a sheep or a young hog and not touch the ground, with it and shall run so fast with it that unless mastiffs or men on horseback happen to run before him neither the shepherds nor no other man on foot will ever overtake him. They live on all manner of flesh and on all carrion and all kinds of vermin. And they live not long for they live not more than thirteen or fourteen years. Their biting is evil and venomous on account of the toads and other vermin that they eat. They go so fast when they be void, are empty that men have let run for leashes of greyhounds, one after the other and they could not overtake him, for he runs as fast as any beast in the world, and he lasts long running, for he has a long breath. When he is long hunted with running hounds he fleeth but little from them, but if the greyhounds or other hounds press him, he fleeth all the covert as a boar does and commonly he runs by the highways. And commonly he goeth to get his livelihood by night, but sometimes by day, when he is sore hungered. And there be some, wolves, that hunt at the hart, at the wild boar and at the roebuck, and windeth as far as a mastiff, and taketh hounds when they can. There are some that eat children and men and eat no other flesh from the time that they be achurned, blooded, by men's flesh, for they would rather be dead. They are called W.R. wolves, for men should beware of them, and they be so cautious that when they assail a man they have a holding upon him before the man can see them. And yet if men see them they will come upon them so ginously, cunningly, that with great difficulty a man will escape being taken and slain, for they can wonder well keep from any harness, arms, that a man beareth. There are two principal causes why they attack men. One is when they are old and lose their teeth and their strength, and cannot carry their prey as they were wont to do, then they mostly go for children, 
which are not difficult to take for they need not carry them about but only eat them. And the child's flesh is more tender than is the skin or flesh of a beast. The other reason is that when they have been acharned, blooded, in a country of war, where battles have been, they eat dead men. Or if men have been hanged or have been hanged so low that they may reach there too, or when they fall from the gallows. And man's flesh is so savory and so pleasant that when they have taken to man's flesh they will never eat the flesh of other beasts, though they should die of hunger. For many men have seen them leave the sheep they have taken and eat the shepherd. It is a wonderfully wily and genus, cunning, beast, and more false than any other beast to take all advantage, for he will never fly but a little save when he has need, for he will always abide in his strength, stronghold. And he hath good breath, for every day it is needful to him, for every man that seeth him chaseth him away and creeth after him. When he is hunted he will fly all day unless he is overset by greyhounds. He will gladly go to some village or in a brook, he will be little at bay except when he can go no further. Sometimes wolves go mad and when they bite a man he will scarcely get well, for their biting is wonderfully venomous on account of the toads they have eaten as I have said before, and also on account of their madness. And when they are full or sick they feed on grasses as a hound does in order to purge themselves. They stay long without meat for a wolf can well remain without meat six days or more. And when the wolf's bitch has her whelps commonly she will do no harm near where she has them, for fear she hath to lose them. And if a wolf come to a fold of sheep if he may abide any while he will slay them all before he begins to eat any of them. Men take them beyond the sea with hounds and greyhounds with nets and with cords, but when he is taken in nets or cords he cutteth them wonderfully fast with his teeth unless men get quickly to him to slay him. Also men take them within pits and with needles and with hossipides or with venomous powders that men give them in flesh, and in many other manners. When the cattle come down from the hills the wolves come down also to get their livelihood. They follow commonly after men of arms for the carrion of the beasts or dead horses or other things. They howl like hounds and if there be but two they will make such a noise as if there were a root of seven or eight if it is by night, when the weather is clear and bright, or when there are young wolves that have not yet passed their first year. When men lay trains to a carn, with flesh, so as to take them, they will rarely come again to the place where men have put the flesh, especially old wolves, leastways not the first time that they should eat. But if they have eaten two or three times, and they are assured that no one will do them harm, then sometimes they will abide. But some wolves be so malicious that they will eat in the night and in the day they will go a great way thence, two miles or more, especially if they have been aggrieved in that place. Or if they feel that men have made any train with flesh for to hunt at them. They do not complain, cry out, when men slay them as hounds do, otherwise they be most like them. When men let run greyhounds at a wolf he turns to look at them, and when he seeth them he knoweth which will take him, and then he hasteneth to go while he can, and if they be greyhounds which dare not take him, the wolf knows at once. And then he will not hasten at his first going. And if men let run at him from the side, or before more greyhounds which will seize him, when the wolf seeth them, and he be full, he voideth both before and behind all in his running so as to be more light and more swift. Men cannot nurture a wolf, though he be taken ever so young and chastised and beaten and held under discipline, for he will always do harm, if he hath time and place for to do it, he will never be so tame. But that when men leave him out he will look hither and thither to see if he may do any harm, or he looks to see if any man will do him any harm. For he knoweth well and woteth well that he doth evil, and therefore men escreeth, cry at, and hunteth and slayeth him. And yet for all that he may not leave his evil nature. G. de F., page 66, has, evil biting. He keeps to the coverts. A churned, from O, father a carn, to blood, from chair, flesh. Needles. See Appendix, Snares. Ossipes, Shirley M. S. G. de F., page 69, Hossipes, a snare by which they were jerked from the ground by a noose. Men say that the right forefoot of the wolf is good for medicine for the evil of the breast and for the botches, sores, which come to swine under the shoulder. 
And also the liver of the wolf dried is good for a man's liver, but thereof I make no affirmation, for I would put in my book nothing but very truth. The wolf's skin is worn to make cuffs or pilches, polices, but the fur thereof is not fair, and also it stinketh ever unless it be well taught. This should be, jaw. G, de F, page 70, has macelles, i.e. macquars. Prepared. Tawing is a process of making hides into leather, somewhat different from tanning. There were tors and tanners. Chapter 8. Of the fox and of his nature. The fox is a common beast and therefore I need not tell of his making and there be but few gentlemen that have not seen some. He hath many such conditions as the wolf, for the vixen of the fox bears as long as the bitch of the wolf bears her whelps, sometimes more sometimes less, save that the vixen fox whelpeth under the earth deeper than doth the bitch of the wolf. The vixen of the fox is a sauté, in heat, once in the year. She has a venomous biting like a wolf and their life is no longer than a wolf's life. With great trouble men can take a fox, especially the vixen when she is with whelps, for when she is with whelps and is heavy, she always keeps near her hole. For sometimes she whelpeth in a false hole and sometimes in great burrows and sometimes in hollow trees, and therefore she draweth always near her burrow, and if she hears anything anon she goeth therein before the hounds can get to her. She is a false beast and as malicious as a wolf. The term used by Turberville, page 188, is, goeth a clicane. The hunting for a fox is fair for the good cry of the hounds that follow him so nigh and with so good a will. Always they send of him, for he flies through the thick wood and also he stinketh evermore. And he will scarcely leave a covert when he is therein, he taketh not to the plain, open, country for he trusteth not in his running neither in his defence, for he is too feeble, and if he does. It is because he is, forced to, by the strength of men and hounds. And he will always hold to covert, and if he can only find a briar to cover himself with, he will cover himself with that. When he sees that he cannot last, then he goeth to earth the nearest he can find which he knoweth well and then men may dig him out and take him, if it is easy digging, but not among the rocks. If greyhounds give him many touches and overset him, his last remedy, if he is in an open country, will be that he visheteth gladly, the act of voiding excrements, so that the greyhounds should leave him for the stink of the dirt. And also for the fear that he hath. G. de F., page 72, says, because the hounds hunt him closely. Our M.S. only gives this one chapter on the fox, while Gaston Phoebus has another, comment on doit chassier et prendre le renard. In this he gives directions as to earth stopping, and taking him in purse nets, and smoking him out with orpiment and sulphur and nitre or saltpetri. He says January, February, and March are the best months for hunting, as the leaf is off the trees and the coverts are clearer, so that the hounds have more chance of seeing the fox and hunt him closer. He says that one third of the hounds should be put in to draw the covert, and the others in relays should guard the boundaries and paths, to be slipped as required. Although this is a Frenchman's account of fox hunting, we have no reason to believe that the fox was treated at that period better by English sportsmen, for until comparatively recent times the fox was accounted vermin. And any means by which his death could be encompassed were considered legitimate, his extermination being the chief object in hunting him, and not the sport. Even as late as the 17th century we find that such treatment was considered justifiable towards a fox, for, as Macaulay tells us, Oliver St. John told the long parliament that Strafford was to be regarded, not as a stag or a hare, to whom some law was to be given, but as a fox, who was to be snared by any means, and knocked on the head without pity, volume 1, page 149. A little greyhound is very hardy when, if, he takes a fox by himself, for men have seen great greyhounds which might well take a hart and a wild boar and a wolf and would let the fox go. And when the vixen is a sot, and goeth in her love to seek the dog fox she creeth with a hoarse voice as a mad hound doth, and also when she calleth her whelps when she misses any of them, she calleth in the same way. The fox does not complain, cry, when men slay him, but he defendeth himself with all his power while he is alive. He liveth on all vermin and all carrion and on foul worms. 
His best meat that he most loveth are hens, capons, duck and young geese and other wild fowls when he can get them, also butterflies and grasshoppers, milk and butter. They do great harm in warrens of connies and of hares which they eat, and take them so ginously, cunningly, and with great malice and not by running. There be some that hunt as a wolf and some that go nowhere but to villages to seek the prey for their feeding. As I have said they are so cunning and subtle that neither men nor hounds can find a remedy to keep themselves from their false turns. Also foxes commonly dwell in great hedges or in great coverts or in burrows near some towns or villages for to evermore harm hens and other things as I have said. The foxes' skins be wonderfully warm to make cuffs and furs, but they stink evermore if they are not well taught. The grease of the fox and the marrow are good for the hardening of sinews. Of the other manners of the fox and of his cunning I will speak more openly hereafter. Men take them with hounds, with greyhounds, with hays and with purse nets, but he cutteth them with his teeth, as the male of the wolf doth but not so soon, quickly. According to G. De F. P. 74, it should not read that some are hunted like wolves, but that they themselves hunt like wolves. Chapter 9 Of the Grey, Badger, and of his nature. The grey, badger, is a common beast enough and therefore I need not tell you of his making, for there be few men that have not seen some of them. And also I shall take no heed to speak much of him, for it is not a beast that needeth any great mastery to devise of how to hunt him, or to hunt him with strength, for a grey can fly but a little way before he is overcome with hounds. Or else he goes to bay and then he is slain anon. His usual dwelling is in the earth in great burrows and if he comes out he will not walk far thence. He liveth on all vermin and carrion and all fruits and on all things such as the fox. But he dare not venture so far by day as the fox, for he cannot flee. He liveth more by sleeping than by any other thing. Once in the year they pharaoh as the fox. When they be hunted they defend themselves long and mightily and have evil biting and venomous as the fox, and yet they defend themselves better than the fox. It is the beast of the Badger Drawing From MSF FR 616, Bib Nat. Paris World that gathereth most grease within and that is because of the long sleeping that he sleepeth. And his grease bears medicine as does that of the fox, and yet more, and men say that if a child that hath never worn shoes is first shod with those made of the skin of the grey that child will heal a horse of farcy if he should ride upon him. But thereof I make no affirmation. His flesh is not to eat, neither is that of the fox nor of the wolf. G. De F., page 76, adds, And they pharaoh their pigs in their burrows as does the fox. Chapter 10 Of the, wild, cat and its nature the cat is a common beast enough therefore I need not tell of his making, for there be few men that have not seen some of them. Nevertheless there be many and diverse kind of cats, after some master's opinions, and namely of wild, cats. Especially there be some cats as big as leopards and some men call them guillen lu serviers and other cat wolves, and this is evil said for they are neither wolves nor serviers nor cat wolves. Men might, better, call them cat leopards than otherwise, for they draw more to a leopard kind than to any other beast. They live on such meat as other cats do, save that they take hens and hedges and goats and sheep, if they find them alone, for they be as big as a wolf, and almost formed and made as a leopard, but their tail is not so long. A greyhound alone could not take one of them to make him abide, for a greyhound could sooner take and hold fast and more steadfastly a wolf than he could one of them. For he claws as a leopard and furthermore bites right, hard. Men hunt them but seldom, but if the hounds find peradventure such a cat, he would not be long hunted for soon he putteth him to his defence or he runneth up a tree. And because he fleeth not long therefore shall I speak but little of his hunting, for in hunting him there is no need of great mastery. They bear their kittens and are in their love as other cats, save that they have but two kittens at once. They dwell in hollow trees and there they make their ligging and their beds of ferns and of grass. The cat helpeth as badly to nourish his kittens as the wolf doth his whelps. Of common wild cats I need not to speak much, 
for every hunter in England knoweth them, and their falseness and malice are well known. But one thing I dare well say that if any beast hath the devil's spirit in him, without doubt it is the cat, both the wild and the tame. According to the Shirley M.S. this passage runs, Men calleth him in Gain Lopesurriers. See Appendix, Wild Cat. Shirley M.S. has, an eggies, instead of, in hedges, which is the rendering G, the F, gives. Bed or resting place. See Appendix. Chapter 11. The Otter and His Nature. An otter is a common beast enough and therefore I need not tell of his making. She liveth with, on, fish and dwelleth by rivers and by ponds and stanks, pools. And sometimes she feedeth on grass of the meadows and bedeth gladly under the roots of trees near the rivers, and goeth to her feeding as doth other beasts to grass, but only in the new grass time, and to fish as I have said. They swim meth in waters and rivers and sometimes deveth under the water when they will, and therefore no fish can escape them unless it be too great a one. They doth great harm specially in ponds and in stanks, for a couple of otters without more shall well destroy the fish of a great pond or great stank, and therefore men hunt them. They go in their love at the time that ferrets do, so they that hold, keep, ferrets in their houses may well know the time thereof. They bear their whelps as long as the ferrets and sometimes more and sometimes less. They whelp in holes under the trees near the rivers. Men hunt at them with Otter Hunting From MSF FR 616, Bib Nat, Paris Hounds by great mastery, as I say hereafter. And also men take them at other times in rivers with small cords as men do the fox with nets and with other gins. She hath an evil biting and venomous and with her strength defendeth herself mightily from the hounds. And when she is taken with nets unless men get to her at once she rendeth them with her teeth and delivereth herself out of them. Longer will I not make mention of her, nor of her nature, for the hunting at her is the best that men may see of her, save only that she has the foot of a goose, for she hath a little skin from one claw to another. And she hath no heel save that she hath a little lump under the foot, and men speak of the steps or the marches of the otter as men speak of the trace of the heart and his fumes, excrements, tradeals or sprains. The otter dwelleth but little in one place, for where she goeth the fish be sore afraid. Sometimes she will swim upwards and downwards seeking the fish a mile or two unless it be in a stank. The author of, Master of Game, does not say anything more about the otter. Of the remnant of his nature I refer to Milbourne the king's otter hunter. As of all other vermin I speak not, that is to say of martins and pole cats, for no good hunter goeth to the wood with his hounds intending to hunt for them, nor for the wild cat either. Nevertheless when men seek in covert for the fox and can find none, and the hounds happen to find them and then the hunter rejoiceth his hounds for the exploit of his hounds, and also because it is vermin that they run to. Of conies I do not speak, for no man hunteth them unless it be bish hunters, fur hunters, and they hunt them with ferrets and with long small haze. Those ratches that run to a coney at any time ought to be raided saying to them loud, where riot, where, for no other wild beast in England is called riot save the coney only. In Priv, Seal 674-6456, February. 18, 1410, William Melbourne is valet of our otterhounds. See Appendix, Otter. Chapter 12. Of the manner and habits and conditions of hounds. After that I have spoken of the nature of beasts of venere and of chase which men should hunt, now I will tell you of the nature of the hounds which hunt and take them. And first of their noble conditions that be so great and marvellous in some hounds that there is no man can believe it, unless he were a good skilful hunter, and well knowing, and that he haunted them long, for a hound is a most reasonable beast. And best knowing of any beast that ever God made. And yet in some case I neither accept man nor other thing, for men find it in so many stories and, see, so much nobleness in hounds, always from day to day, that as I have said there is no man that liveth, but must think it. Nevertheless natures of men and all beasts go ever more descending and decreasing both of life and of goodness and of strength and of all other things so wonderfully, as the Earl of Phoebus saith in his book. 
that when he seed the hounds that be now hunting and think of the hounds that he hath seen in the time that is past, and also of the goodness and the truth, which was sometimes in the lords of this world, and other common men. And seeth what now is in them at this time, truly he saith that there is no comparison, and this knoweth well every man that hath any good reason. But now let God ordain thereof whatever his good will is. But to draw again to my matter, and tell the nobleness of the hounds, the which have been, some good tales I shall tell you the which I find in true writings. First of King Claudonius of France, the which sent once after his great court whereof were other kings which held of him land, among the which was the King Apollo of Leonis that brought with him to the court his wife and a greyhound that he had. That was both good and fair. The King Claudonius of France had a seemly young man for his son, of twenty years of age, and as soon as he saw the Queen of Leonis he loved her and prayed her of, for her, love. The queen was a good lady and loved well her lord, forsook him and would him not, and said, to, him that if he spake to her any more thereof that she would tell it to the king of France, and to her lord. And after that the feast was passed, King Apollo of Leonis turned again, he and his wife to their country. And when they were so turned again, he and his wife, the King Claudonius son of France was before him with a great fellowship of men of arms for to ravish his wife from him. The King Apollo of Leonis that was a wonderful good knight of his hounds, hands. Notwithstanding that he was unarmed, defended himself and his wife in the best wise that he could unto the time that he was wounded to the death, then he withdrew himself and his wife into a tower. And the King Claudonius son, the which would not leave the lady, went in and took the lady, and would have defiled her, and then she said to him, Ye have slain my lord, and, now, ye would dishonor me, certes I would sooner be dead. Then she drew herself to, from, a window and leapt into the river of lawyer that ran under the tower and anon she was drowned. And after that within a little while, the king Apollo of Leonis died of his wounds that he had received, and on the same day he was cast into the river. The greyhound that I have spoke of, the which was always with the king his master, when his lord was cast in the river leapt after him into the river, insomuch that with his teeth he drew his lord out of the river. And made a great pit with his claws in the best wise that he could, and with his muzzle. And so the greyhound always kept his lord about half a year in the pit, and kept his lord from all manner of beasts and fowls. And if any man ask whereof he lived I say that he lived on carrion and of other feeding such as he might come to. So it befell that the king Claudonius of France rode to see the estate of his realm, and, it, befell that the king passed there where the greyhound was that kept his lord and master, and the greyhound arose against him, and began to yelp at him. The king Claudonius of France the which was a good man and of good perception, anon when he saw the greyhound, knew that it was the greyhound that king Apollo of Leonis had brought to his court, whereof he had great wonder. And he went himself there where the greyhound was and saw the pit, and then he made some of his men alight from their horses for to look what was therein, and therein they found the king Apollo's body all whole. And anon as the king Claudonius of France saw him, he knew it was the king Apollo of Leonis, whereof he was right sorry and sore aggrieved, and ordained a cry throughout all his realm. That whoso would tell him the truth of the deed he would give him whatsoever that he would ask. Then came a damsel that was in the tower when the king Apollo of Leonis was dead, and thus she said to the king Claudonius of France, Sir, quoth she, if you will grant me a boon that I shall ask and assure me to have it, before all your men. I shall show you him that hath done the deed, and the king swore to her before his men, and it so befell that the king Claudonius son of France was beside his father. Sir, she said, here is your son the which hath done this deed. Now require I you as ye have sworn to me that ye give him to me, I will no other gift of you. The king Claudonius of France turned him then towards his son and said thus, Thou cursed harlot, thou hast shamed and shent, disgraced, me and truly I shall shend, disgrace, you. And though I have no more children yet shall I not spare. Then he commanded to his men to make a great fire, and cast his son therein, and he turned him toward the damsel when the fire was great alight, and thus to her he said, Damsel, now take ye him for I deliver him to you. As I promised and assured you. The damsel durst not come nigh, for by that time he was all burnt. 
This and sample have I brought forth for the nobleness of hounds and also of lords that have been in olden times. But I trow that few lords be now that would do so even in so open justice. A hound is true to his lord and his master, and of good love and true. In G. de F. Clodovius, page 82. A hound is of great understanding and of great knowledge, a hound hath great strength and great goodness, a hound is a wise beast and a kind, one. A hound has a great memory and great smelling, a hound has great diligence and great might, a hound is of great worthiness and of great subtlety, a hound is of great lightness and of great perseverance. A hound is of good obedience, for he will learn as a man all that a man will teach him. A hound is full of good sport, hounds are so good that there is scarcely a man that would not have of them, some for one craft, and some for another. Hounds are hardy, for a hound dare well keep his master's house, and his beasts, and also he will keep all his master's goods, and he would sooner die than anything be lost in his keeping. And yet to affirm the nobleness of hounds, I shall tell you a tale of a greyhound that was Aubrey's of Moundedier, of which men may see the painting in the realm of France in many places. Aubrey was a squire of the king's house of France, and upon a day that he was going from the court to his own house, and as he passed by the woods of Bondis, the which is nigh Paris. And led with him a well good and a fair greyhound that he had brought up. A man that hated him for great envy without any other reason, who was called Macari, ran upon him within the wood and slew him without warning, for Aubrey was not aware of him. And when the greyhound sought his master and found him he covered him with earth and with leaves with his claws and his muzzle in the best way that he could. And when he had been there three days and could no longer abide for hunger, he turned again to the king's court. There he found Macari, who was a great gentleman, who had slain his master, and as soon as the greyhound perceived Macari, he ran upon him, and would have maimed him, unless men had hindered him. The king of France, who was wise and a man of perception, asked what it was, and men told him the truth. The greyhound took from the boards what he could, and brought to his master and put meat in his mouth, and the same wise the greyhound did three days or four. And then the king made men follow the greyhound, for to see where he bare the meat that he took in the court. And then they found Oberi dead and buried. And then the king, as I have said, made come many of the men of his court, and made them stroke the greyhound's side, and cherish him and made his men lead him by the collar towards the house, but he never stirred. And then the king commanded Macari to take a small piece of flesh and give it to the greyhound. And as soon as the greyhound saw Macari, he left the flesh, and would have run upon him. And when the king saw that, he had great suspicions about Macari, and said, to, him that he must needs fight against the greyhound. And Macari began to laugh, but anon the king made him do the deed, and one of the kinsmen of Oberi saw the great marvel of the greyhound and said that he would swear upon the sacrament as is the custom in such a case for the greyhound. And Macari swore on the other side, and then they were led into Our Lady's Isle at Paris and there fought the greyhound and Macari. For which Macari had a great two-handed staff, and they fought so that Macari was discomfited, and then the king commanded that the greyhound the which had Macari under him should be taken up. And then the king made inquiry of the truth of Macari, the which acknowledged he had slain Aubrey in treason, and therefore he was hanged and drawn. G. de F., page 84, says, Sentiment, good sense, feeling, or sympathy. The bitches be jolly in their love commonly twice in a year, but they have no term of their heat, for every time of the year some be jolly. When they be a twelve month old, they become jolly, and be jolly while they await the hounds without any defence, twelve days, or less, and sometimes fifteen days, according as to whether they be of hot nature or of cold, the one more than another. Or whether some be in better condition than others. And also men may well help them thereto, for if they give them much meat they abide longer in their heat than if they had but little. And also if they were cast in a river twice in a day they should be sooner out of their jollity. They bear their whelps nine weeks or more. The whelps be blind when they be whelped till they be nine days old and then they may well see and lap well when they be a month old, but they have great need of their dam to the time that they be two months old. And then they should be well fed with goat's milk or with cow's milk and crumbs of bread made small and put therein, especially in the morn and at night. 
because that the night is more cold than the day. And also men should give them crumbs in flesh broth, and in this wise men may nourish them till they be half a year old, and by that time they shall have cast their hooks, and when they have cast their hooks. They should teach them to eat dry bread and lap water little by little, for a hound that is nourished with grease and fat broth when he casts his hooks, and if he hath always sops or titbits, he is a kais, dainty, hound and of evil ward. And also they be not so well breathed than if they have eaten always bread and water. When the bitches be lined they lose their time, and also while they be great with whelps, and also while their whelps suck. If they are not lined, soon they will lose their time, for their teats remain great and grow full of wind until the time that they should have had their whelps. And so that they should not lose their time men spay them, save these that men will keep open to bear whelps. And also a spayed bitch lasteth longer in her goodness than other two that be not spayed. And if a bitch be with whelps the which be not of ward let the bitch fast all the whole day, and give her then with a little grease the juice of a herb men calleth titimal, the which the apothecaries knoweth well, and she shall cast her whelps. Nevertheless it is a great peril namely if the whelps be great and formed within the bitch. The greatest fault of hounds is that they live not long enough, most commonly they live but twelve years. And also men should let run no hounds of what condition that they be nor hunt them until the time that they were a twelve month old and past. And also they can hunt but nine years at the most. G. De F. Page 85, O Moines, at least. Kais, or Cheese, Hound, probably Dainty Hound, a chooser, from Kiesen, mid eng choose to distinguish also written cheese cheese strapman lasts longer good i e lasts as long as two hounds that have not been spayed g the f page 86 adds or at least one and a half chapter 13 of sicknesses of hounds and of their corruptions the hounds have many diverse sicknesses and their greatest sickness is the rage whereof there be nine manners, of the which I shall tell you a part. The first is called furious madness. The hounds that be mad of that madness cry and howl with a loud voice, and not in the way that they were wont to when they were in health. When they escape they go everywhere biting both men and women and all that they find before them. And they have a wonderful perilous biting, for if they bite anything, with great pain it shall escape thereof if they draw blood, that it shall go mad whatever thing it be. A token for to know at the beginning, is this, that they eat not so well as they were wont to, and they bite the other hounds, making them cheer with the tail first. Smelleth upon them and licketh them and then he bloweth a great blast with his nose, and then he looketh fiercely, and beholdeth his own sides and mocketh semblant that he had flies about him, and then he creeth. And when men know such tokens men should take him from the others until the fourth day, for then men may see the sickness all clearly, or else that he is not mad for some time. Many men be beguiled in that way. And if any hound be mad of any of the nine madnesses he shall never be whole. And their madness cannot last but nine days but they shall never be whole but dead. That other manner of madness is known by these signs, in the beginning he doth as I said before, save that they neither bite man nor beast save only the hounds, as perilous is his biting as the first. And evermore they go up and down without any abiding. And this madness is called running madness. And these two madnesses before said taketh the other hounds that they be with, though they bite them not. That other madness is called rage mute, dumb madness, for they neither bite nor run not, eek they will not eat for their mouth. How the hounds were let out. From MSF FR 616, Bib Nat. Paris. Is somewhat gaping as if they were enosed in their throat, and so they die, within the term before said without doing any harm. Some men say that it cometh to them from a worm that they have under the tongue, and ye should find but few hounds that hath not a worm under the tongue. And many men say that if that worm was taken from them they would never go mad, but thereof I make no affirmation. Nevertheless it is good to take it from them, and men should take it away in this manner. Men should take the hound when he is past half a year old and hold fast his four feet, and put a staff athwart his mouth so that he should not bite. 
and after take the tongue and ye should find the worm under the tongue. Then ye should slit the tongue underneath and put a needle with a thread betwixt the worm and tongue and cut and draw the worm out with the thread or else with a small pin of wood. And notwithstanding that men call it a worm it is but a great vein that hounds have under their tongue. This madness diseaseth not other hounds, neither man nor other beast. That other madness is called falling, for when they want to walk straight they fall now on one side and now on the other side, and so die within the aforesaid term. This madness stretcheth to no other hound nor man or beast. That other madness is called flank madness, for they be so sore and tucked up by the middle of the flanks as though they never ate meat, and pant in their flanks with much pain, and will not eat. But stoop low with the head and always look downwards, and when they go they take up their feet high and go rolling as a drunken man. This madness stretcheth to no other hound nor to any other things, and they die as it is said before. The other madness is called sleeping madness, for they lie always and make semblant as if they were asleep, and so they die without meat. This sickness stretcheth to no other thing. That other madness is called madness of head. Nevertheless all madnesses are of foolishness of the head and of the heat of the heart, for their head becometh great and swelleth fast. They eat no meat and so they die in that madness. This madness stretcheth to no other thing. And certainly I never saw a hound that had any of all these madnesses that ever might be healed. Nevertheless many men think sometime that a hound be mad when it is not so, and therefore the best proof that any man may do, is to draw him from the other hounds and assay him three whole days each one after the other following. If he will eat flesh or any other thing. And if he will not eat within three days slay him as a mad hound. The remedies for men or for beasts that be bitten by mad hounds must need be done a short time after the biting, for if it were past a whole day it were hard to undertake to heal him of the two first madnesses whereof I spake at the beginning. For all the others can do no harm, and the remedy may be of diverse manners. Some goeth to the sea, and that is but a little help, and mocketh nine waves of the sea pass over him that is so bitten. Some take an old cock and pull all the feathers from above his vent and hangeth him by the legs and by the wings, and setteth the cock's vent upon the hole of the biting and stroketh along the cock by the neck and by the shoulders because that the cock's vent should suck all the venom of the biting. And so men do long upon each of the wounds, and if the wounds be too little they must be made wider with a barber's lancet. And many men say, but thereof I make no affirmation, that if the hound were mad, that the cock shall swell and die, and he that was bitten by the hound shall be healed. If the cock does not die it is a token that the hound is not mad. There is another help, for men may make sauce of salt, vinegar and strong garlic pulled and stamped, and nettles together and as hot as it may be suffered to lay upon the bite. And this is a good medicine and a true, for it hath been proved, and every day should it be laid upon the biting twice, as hot as it can be suffered, until the time when it be whole, or else by nine days. And yet there is another medicine better than all the other. Take leeks and strong garlic and chives and rue and nettles and hack them small with a knife, and then mingle them with olive oil and vinegar, and boil them together, and then take all the herbs, also as hot as they may be suffered. And lay them on the wound every day twice, till the wound be healed, or at least for nine days. But at the beginning that the wound be closed or garzed, cupped, for to draw out the venom out of the wound because that it goeth not to the heart. And if a hound is bit by another mad hound it is a good thing for to hollow it all about the biting with a hot iron. The hounds have also another sickness that is called the mange, that cometh to them because that they be melancholy. There are four manners of mange, that one is called the quick mange the which pulleth the hounds and breaketh their skins in many places, and the skin waxeth great and thick, and this is wonderfully evil to heal. For though the hounds may be whole it cometh to them again. Commonly to this mange, this is the best ointment that men may make thereto. Nevertheless many men would put many others thereto, first take ye six pounds of honey and a quart of verdigris, and that the honey be first melted and stirred in the bottom with a ladle, and then let it cool. And let it boil often with as much of oil of nuts as of the honey and of water, wherein an herb has been boiled that men call in Latin cleoborum, and in other language valerian, the which make men sneeze. 
and put all these things together and mingle them upon the fire, stir them well and let it be cold, and anoint the hound by the fire or in the sun. And look that he lick not himself, for it should do him harm. And unless he be whole at the first time anoint him from eight days, to eight days, until the time that he be whole, for certainly he shall be whole. And if he will make any more of that ointment, take of the things aforesaid in the same wise or more or less as seemeth to you that need is. That other manner, of, mange is called flying mange, for it is not in all the body but it cometh more commonly about the hound's ears, and in their legs than in any other place of the body, as the farsi, and this is the worst to heal. And the best ointment that any man can make for this manner of mange is this, take quicksilver for as much as ye will make ointment, as ye have need, and put it in a dish with spittle of three or four fasting men. And stir it all together against the bottom of the dish with a pot stick, until the time that the quicksilver be quenched with the water, and then take ye as much verdigris as of the quicksilver and mingle it with spittle. Always stirring with a pot stick, as I have said before, until the time that they can be all mingled together. And after take old swine's grease without salt, a great piece, and take away the skin above, and put it in the dish that I spake of, with the things before said, and mingle and stamp it all together a long while. Then keep it to anoint the hound there where he hath the mange and in no other place, and certainly he shall be whole. This ointment is marvellous and good and true not only for this thing, but also against the canker and fistula and farsi and other quick evils, the which have been hard to heal in other beasts. That other is a common mange when the hounds claw themselves with their feet and snap with their teeth, and it is on all the body of the hound. And all manners of mange come to hounds from great travel and from long hunting, as when they be hot they drink of foul water and unclean, which corrupteth their bodice, and also when they hunt in evil places of pricklings of thorns, of briars. Or peradventure it raineth upon them, and they be not well tended afterwards. Then cometh the scab, and also the scab cometh upon them when they abide in their kennel too long and goeth not hunting. Or else their litter and couch is uncleanly kept, or else the straw is not removed and their water not freshened, and shortly the hounds unclean, I hold, and evil kept or long waterless, have commonly this mange. For the cure of which take ye the root of an herb that groweth upon houses and walls, the which is called in Latin iros, iris, and chop it small and boil it well in water, and then put thereto as much of oil made of nuts as of water. And when it is well boiled cast out the herb, and then take of black pitch and of rosin as much of the one as of the other, well stamped, and cast it in the water and the oil before said. And stir it well about on the fire with a pot stick, and then let it well grow cold, and anoint the hound as before is said. Sometime cometh to the hound's sickness in their eyes, for there cometh a web upon them, and growing flesh which cometh into that one side of the eye, and is called a nail, and so they grow blind unless a man take care thereof. Some men put about their necks a collar of an elm tree both of leaves and of bark, and seeth that when that shall be dry the nail shall fall away, but that is but a little help. But the true help that may be there too is this, take ye the juice of a herb that men call celadoin, celandine, powder of ginger and of pepper, and put all together thrice in the day within the eye, and let him not claw nor rub it a long while. And that customarily by nine days until the time that the hound's eyes be whole, and also it is good to put therein of the seuss of the which men find enough at the apothecaries for the same sickness. And if the nail were so hard grown and so strong that he might not be healed therewith, take a needle and bow it in the middle that it be crooked, and take well and subtly the flesh that is upon the eye with the needle and draw it up on high. And then cut it with a razor, but take good care that the needle touch not the eye. These things the smiths can do well, for as the nail is drawn out of a horse's eye, right so it must be drawn out of the hound's eye, and without fault he shall be whole. And also another sickness cometh into the hound's ears the which cometh out of the room, cold, of the head of the hound, for they claw themselves so much with the hinder feet that they make much foul things come out thereof. And so out of her ears cometh much foul things, and some time thereof they become deaf. Therefore they should take wine lukewarm and with a cloth wash it well, and clean three or four times in the day, and when it is washed ye should cast therein oil and chamomile milk, warm, three drops. 
and suffer him not to claw it nor rub it a great while, and do so continually until the time that he be whole. Also hounds have another sickness that cometh to them of the room, that is to say, they have the male mort, glanders, in their nostrils as horses have, wherefore they can smell nothing nor wind, and at the last some die thereof. And they take it most when they hunt in snow. For this sickness boil mastic and incense in small powder in fair water, and of a thing that men call Osterus's calamint, brigella of rue and mint and of sage. And hold the hound's nose upon the pot's mouth wherein these things should boil so that he may retain within his nostrils the smoke that cometh thereof out of the pot. And in this wise serve him a long while, three or four times every day, until the time that he be whole, and this is good also for a horse when he hath the glanders strongly coming out of the nose. Also there is another sickness of hounds, the which cometh to them in their throats and sometime cometh so to men in such wise that they may not keep down their meat, and so they must cast it out again. In some time the sickness is so strong on them, that they can keep nothing down in their bodies and so die. The best medicine is to let them go wherever they will, and let them eat all that ever they will. For some time the contrary things turneth them to good. And give them to eat flesh right small cut, and put in broth or in goat's milk a little, and a little because that they may swallow it down without labor, and give him not too much at once, that they may digest better. And also buttered eggs doeth them much good. And sometimes the hounds hurt themselves in their feet, and in their legs, and in their breast. And when it is in the joints of their feet that be run out of their places, the best help that there is is to bring them again into joint, by such men as can well do it, and then lay upon that place flax wetted in white of egg. And let them rest until the time that they be whole. And if there be any broken bones men should knit it again in the best wise, the one bone against that other and bind it with flax above as I have said, and with four splints well bound there too that one against that other. Because that the bone should not unjoin, and men should remove the bands from four days to four days all whole. And give them to drink the juice of herbs that are called consolida major and minor, and mix it in broth or in her meat, and that shall make the bones join together. Also many hounds be lost by the feet, and if some time they be heated take vinegar and soot that is within the chimney, and wash his feet therewith until the time that they be whole, and if the soles of the feet be bruised because, peradventure. They have run in hard country or among stones, take water, and small salt therein, and therewith wash their feet, the same day that they have hunted. And if they have hunted in evil country among thorns and briars that they be hurt in their legs or in their feet, wash their legs in sheep's tallow well boiled in wine when it is cold, and rub them well upward against the hair. The best that men may do to hounds that they lose not their claws is that they sojourn not too long, for in long sojourning they lose their claws, and their feet, and therefore they should be led three times in the week a hunting. And at the least twice. If they have sojourned too much, cut ye a little off the end of their claws with pincers ere they go hunting, so that they may not break their claws in running. Also when they be at sojourn, men should lead them out every day a mile or two upon gravel or upon a right hard path by a river side, so that their feet may be hard. Hounds also sometimes be chilled as horses when they have run too long, and come hot in some water, or else when they come to rest in some cold place, then they go all forenoon and cannot eat, nor cannot walk well. Then should men let blood on the four legs. From the four legs in the joints within the leg, from the hinder legs men should let blood in the veins that goeth overthwart above the hocks on the other side, and in the hinder legs men may well see clearly the veins that I speak of. And also in the forelegs, thus he shall be whole. And give him one day sops or some other thing comfortable till the morrow or other day. The hounds also have a sickness in the yard that men calleth the canker, and many be lost thereby. Men should take such a hound and hold him fast and upright and bind his mouth and his four legs also, and then men should take his yurd backward by the ballocks and put him upward. And another man shall draw the skin well in manner that the yurd may all come out, and then a man may take away the canker with his fingers, for if it were taken away with a knife men might cut him. And then men should wash it with wine, milk warm, and then put therein honey and salt, so that the sickness shall not come again, 
and then put again the yurd within the skin as it was before, and look every week that the sickness come not again. And take it always out if aught come thereto until the time that it be whole. And in the same wise a man should do to a bitch, if such a sickness were taken in her nature. In this sickness many hounds and bitches die for default of these cures, whereof all hunters have not full knowledge. Sometimes the hounds have a great sickness that they may not piss, and be lost thereby and also when they may not scumber, dung. Then take ye the root of a cabbage and put it in olive oil, and put it in his fundament so that ye leave some of the end without, so much that it may be drawn out when it is needful. And if he may not be whole thereby make him a clister as men do to a man, of mallows, of beets, and of mercury, a handful of each, and of rue and of incense, and that all these things be boiled in water and put bran within. And let pass all that water through a strainer, and thereto put two drams of agarite and of honey and of olive oil, and all this together put into his anus and he shall scumber. And then take five corns of spurge and stamp them and temper them with goat's milk or with broth, and put it in the hound's throat to the amount of a glassful. And if he may not piss take the leaves of leeks and of a herb that is called merubium album and of motorwort and of peritory and morsus gauline and of nettles and parsley leaves as much of the one as of the other. And stamp them with swine's grease therewith, and make a plaster thereof, and make it a little hot, and lay it upon the hound's yard and along his belly, and that which is hard to understand ye shall find at the apothecaries. The which know well all these things. Also to the hounds cometh sores, that cometh to them under the throat or in other parts of the body. Then take ye of the mallows and of the onions and of white lilies, and cut them small with a knife, and put them in a ladle of iron and mingle these herbs whereof I speak, and lay them upon the sores, and that shall make them rise. And when they be risen, slit them with a sharp knife. And when they be so broken, lay upon them some good drawing salve, and he be whole. Sometimes the hounds fight and bite each other, and then they shall take sheep's wool unwashed, and a little olive oil, and wet the wool in the oil, and lay it upon the hound's wound, and bind it thereupon, and do so three days. And then after twice each day anoint it with olive oil, and lay nothing upon it. And he shall lick it with his tongue and heal himself. If peradventure in the wound come worms as I have seen some time, every day ye shall pick them out with a stick, and ye shall put in the wound the juice of leaves of a peach tree mingled with quicklime until the time that they be whole. Also it happeneth to many hounds that they smite the forelegs against the hinder wherefore their thighs dry and be lost thereby, and then if ye see that it last them longer than three days that they set not their foot to the earth. Then slit ye the thigh along and athwart within the thigh, crosswise upon the bone, that is upon the turn bone of the knee behind, and then put thereupon wool wet in olive oil as before is said, for three whole days. And then after anoint the wound with oil without binding as I have said, and he shall heal himself with his tongue. Sometimes a hound is evil a stifled, so that he shall sometime abide half a year or more ere he be well, and if he be not so tended he will never recover. Then it needeth that ye let him long sojourn until the time that he be whole, until he is no longer halting, that is that one thigh be no greater than the other. And if he may not be all whole, do to him as men do to a horse that is spalled in the shoulder in front, draw throughout a cord of horsehair and he shall be whole. Sometimes an evil befalls in the ballot purse, sometimes from too long hunting or from long journeys, or from rupture, or sometimes when bitches be jolly, and they may not come to them at their ease as they would. And that the humours runneth into the ballocks, and sometimes when they be smitten upon in hunting or in other places. To this sickness and to all others in that manner, the best help is for to make a purse of cloth three or four times double, and take linseed and put it within, and put it in a pot, and let it mingle with veen, and let them well boil together. And mix it always with a stick, and when it is well boiled put it within the purse that I spoke of, as hot as the hound may suffer it, and put his ballocks in that purse, and bind it with a band betwixt the thighs above the back. Make well fast the ballocks upwards, and leave a hole in the cloth for to put out the tail and his anus, and another hole before for the yard so that he may scomber and piss and renew that thing once or twice until the time that he be whole. Also it is a well good thing for a man or for a horse that hath this sickness. 
cherish, wagging their tails and seeming to cherish them, Turbervile, page 223. See Appendix, Madness. It should read, smelleth, as it is in Shirley M.S. and in G. De F., page 87. The friendly licking of other dogs has often been noticed as an early symptom of rabies in a pack of hounds. Du Fullis in his La Venerie, published 1561, copied much from Gaston de Foy's book, but either he or his editors made the ridiculous mistake of saying nine months instead of days. Turbervile, who translated, or rather cribbed, Du Fullis's book, has copied this absurd mistake, and says a hound may continue thus nine months, but not past, page 222. Means, a bone in their throat. G. de F. P. 88, come s i i l s avoyant un o s n la goal. In the Shirley M. S. Enost, i e, un o s. See Appendix, Madness. See Appendix, Worming. Lank Madness, in Turbervile, page 223. Tucked up. G. de F. P. 88, Cusus Parmi Les Flans, the flanks drawn in. In Shirley M.S., Vento used upon or jerst. G. de F., Vento uses, K. on Appel Coops, hence, cupped and lanced, would be the proper meaning. Makes them lose their hair. G. de F., P. 90, E.D.S.I. Poil Lucien. 2. 8. Days, has been omitted. Some confusion, which is still common, between eczema from various causes, and true parasitic mange or scabies. G. de F. P. 91, adds, ed est vermel et saute d'un lu en autre. In the Shirley MS the words are added, to O, high plight, i.e. too high condition. G. de F., page 91, adds, gress. Irios, eng iris. This word is also constantly recurring in old household books. Aniseed and orris powder were placed among linen to preserve it from insects. In Edward IV's wardrobe accounts we read of bags of fustian stuffed with anise and irios. Pterygium, named for the sickness in the eyes of hounds which our MS describes as a web coming upon them. It is called pterygium from its resemblance to an insect's wing. Is an hypertrophy of the conjunctiva or lining membrane of the eye, due to irritation, it extends from the inner angle to the cornea, which it may cover, the treatment is excision. The cure for, the nail, mentioned in our MS. Of hanging a collar of elm leaves round the dog is taken by G. de F., page 92, from Roy Modus 44, where it is given without the saving clause, Messala est bien petit remede. Celandine, Caledonium magus, from Chi Epsilon Lambda Iota Delta Omega Nu, a swallow. The name was derived from the tradition that swallows used it to open the eyes of their young or to restore their sight. Has a yellow flower and an acrid, bitter, orange juice. Internally an irritant poison. Infusions in wine used by Galen and Bioscorides for jaundice, probably from the color of the juice and flowers. Externally the juice was much used for wounds, ulcers, ophthalmic cases, and for the removal of warts. The old French name for this plant was Herb d'Arendelles, Hirondellus. Shirley M.S. has, Fauci, G. de F., page 92, de la poudre de la tutti, oxide of zinc. Shirley M.S. adds, that be marshals for horses. Esterasis calamita, G. de F., p. 93, Lavalli appends the note, Storax ed styrax calamita. Storax, a resin resembling benzoin, was in high esteem from the time of Pliny to the 18th century. It was obtained from the stem of Styrax officinalis, a native of Greece and the Levant. In our MS four other ingredients mentioned by G. de F. have been left out, but the Shirley MS. Gives them, an oil of chamomile and of malleur of ashes and of calamint, i.e. oil of chamomile, melilot, melodiers, rosemary, thymus calamita, a species of balm. Possibly this is a mint called calaminta nepeta, a plant formerly much used in medicine as a gentle stimulant and tonic. Melilot, a genus of clover-like plants of the natural order of leguminose. Mildew. 
G. De F. Page 93, Nigella, Niel. Ru, Maud. Eng Ru, Lat Ruta. This herb was in great repute among the ancients, and is still employed in medicine as a powerful stimulant. Consolida Major. Lavalli in his note, p. 94, translates this consud, which in English is comfrey, Latin symphodum. Consolida Minor, Lavalli, note, petit consud, mod. Father Brunel. G. De F. Page 94. Eng self heal. Lat prunella vulgaris. It was at one time in repute as a febrifuge. Agaris. G. de f. diagrit, probably agrimony, lat agrimonia. It is bitter and styptic, and was much valued in domestic medicine, a decoction of it being used as a gargle and the dried leaves as a kind of tea, and the root as a vermifuge. Euphorbia resinifera, common spurge, exudes a very acrid milky juice which dries into a gum resin. Still used for some plasters. Marubium vulgar. G. de F. Mariber Blanc, ENG White Whorehound. It enjoyed a great reputation as a stimulating expectorant employed in asthma, consumption, and other pulmonary affections. Leonurus cardiaca. G. de F. Artemis, ENG Motherwort, Mod. Father Armois. A plant allied to the whorehound as a vascular stimulant and diuretic and a general tonic, employed in dropsy, gout, rheumatism, and uterine disorders. Parietaria. ENG Wall Pellitory. An old domestic remedy. It was supposed to be astringent and cooling, and used locally for inflammation, burns, erysipelas, and internally as a diuretic. It grows on old walls and heaps of rubbish. Morsus gaulinus. Lilies. The white lilies here mentioned are probably Lilium canalium, lilies of the valley. In an old book of recipes I find them mentioned as an antidote to poison. House UND Land Bib 1700. They have medicinal qualities, purgative and diuretic in effect. Dried and powdered they become a sternutatory. In the Shirley MS there is added, the hound tongue beareth medicine and especially to himself. G. de F. has the same, page 97. Wither or dry up. Inflammation of the stifle joint. Seton. G. de F., page 98, says, un ordi et unsettled accord. His word settle came from the Spanish cedal. The English seton comes from seda, a hare, because hair was originally employed as the inserted material. Testicles. The following words, which are in Shirley M.S. and in G. de F., are left out, sometime for they more foundeth as an or. The Shirley M.S. has the following ending to this chapter, and God forbid that for, a little labor or cost of this medicine, man should see his good kind hound perish, that before hath made him so many comfortable disports at divers times in hunting. Which is not taken from G. De F. Chapter 14. Of running hounds and of their nature. A running hound is a kind of hound there be few men that have not seen some of them. Nevertheless I shall devise how a running hound shall be held for good and fair, and also shall I devise of their manners. Of all hues of running hounds, there are some which be good, and some which be bad or evil as of greyhounds. But the best hue of running hounds and most common for to be good, is called brown tan. Also the goodness of running hounds, and of all other kinds of good hounds, cometh of true courage and of the good nature of their good father and of their good mother. And also as touching greyhounds, men may well help to make them good by teaching as by leading them to the wood and to fields, and to be always near them, in making of many good cures when they have done well. And of raiding at and beating them when they have done amiss, for they are beasts, and therefore have they need to learn that which men will they should do. A running hound should be well born, and well grown of body, and should have great nostrils and open, and a long snout, but not small, and great lips and well hanging down, and great eyes red or black, and a great forehead and great head. And large ears, well long and well hanging down, broad and near the head, a great neck, 
and a great breast and great shoulders, and great legs and strong, and not too long, and great feet, round and great claws, and the foot a little low. Small flanks and long sides, a little pintail not long, small hanging ballocks and well trussed together, a good chine bone and great back, good thighs, and great hind legs and the hock straight and not bowed, the tail great and high. And not cromping up on the back, but straight and a little cromping upward. Nevertheless I have seen some running hounds with great hairy tails the which were very good. Running hounds hunt in divers' manners, for some followeth the heart fast at the first, for they go lightly and fast and when they have run so a while, they have hide them so fast that they be relaxed and all breathless. And stop still and leave the heart when they should chase him. This kind of running hounds men should find usually in the land of Bosco and Spain. They are right good for the wild boar, but are not good for the heart, for they be not good to end chase at a long flight, but only for to press him, for they seek not well, and they run not well nor they hunt not, well, from a distance. For they be accustomed to hunt close. Ratchas or running hounds in the 15th century. From MSF FR 616, Bib Nat, Paris. And at the beginning they have shown their best. Other manners of running hounds there are which hunt a good deal more slowly and heavily, but as they begin, so they hold on all the day. These hounds force not so soon a heart as the other, but they bring him best by mastery and strength to his end, for they retrieve and scent the line better and farther, because they are somewhat slow. They must hunt the heart from farther off, and therefore they scent the foos better than the other that goes so hastily without stopping until the time that they be weary. A bold hound should never complain or howl, unless if he were out of the rights. And also he should again seek the rights, for a heart fleeth and roseth. Commonly a bold hound hunteth with the wind when he seeth his time. He dreads his master and understands him and does as he bids him. A bold hound should not leave the heart neither for rain, nor for heat, nor for cold, nor for any evil weather, but at this time there be few such, and also should he hunt the heart well by himself without help of man. As if the man were always with him. But alas! I know not now any such hounds. Hounds there are which be bold and brave. And be called bold for they are bold and good for the heart, for when the heart comes in danger they will chase him, but they will not open nor quest while he is among the change, for dread to envoys and do amiss, but when they have dissevered him. Then they will open and hunt him and should overcome the heart well, and perfectly and masterfully throughout all the change. These hounds be not so good nor so perfect as be the bold hounds before said to most men for two reasons, that one reason is for they hunt not at men's best pleasure for they hunt not but the heart. And the first bold hound hunts all manner of beasts that his master will uncouple him to. He opens always through all the changes, and a bold hound for the heart opens not for the heart, as I have said when the heart is amid the changes. He dreadeth where he goeth that men see him lest he do amiss or in voice, but men cannot always see him. Of this kind of hound have I seen many a one. There be other kinds of hounds which men beyond the sea call heart hounds, good and restrained heart hounds. They hunt no other beast but the heart, and therefore they are called heart hounds and bold hounds, for they be bold and good and wise for the heart. They be called restrained, because if the heart fall among the change they should abide still until the hunter come, and when they see their master they make him welcome, and wag their tails upon him, and will bypiss the way and the bushes. But in England men make them not so. These be good hounds of our land, but not so good as the bold hounds aforesaid. They be well wise, for they know well that they should not hunt the change, and they are not so wise as to dissever the heart from the change, for they abide still and restive. These hounds I hold full good, for the hunter that knows them may well help them to slay the heart. None of all these three kinds of hounds hunt at the heart in rutting time, unless it be the good bold hound, which is the best of all other hounds. The best sport that men can have is running with hounds, for if he hunt at hare or at the roe or at buck or at the heart, or at any other beast without greyhound it is a fair thing, and pleasant to him that loveth them. The seeking and the finding is also a fair thing, and a great liking to slay them with strength, and for to see the wit and the knowledge that God hath given to good hounds, and for to see good recovering and retrieving. 
and the mastery and the subtleties that be in good hounds. For with greyhounds and with other kinds of hounds whatever they be, the sport lasteth not, for anon a good greyhound or a good allant taketh or faileth a beast, and so do all manner of hounds save running hounds. The which must hunt all the day questing and making great melody in their language and saying great villainy and chiding the beasts that they chase. And therefore I prefer them to all other kinds of hounds, for they have more virtue it seems to me than any other beast. Other kind of hounds there be the which open and jangle when they are uncoupled, as well when they be not in her foos, on their line, and when they be in her foos they questy too much in seeking their chase whatever it be. And if they learn the habit when they are young and are not chastised thereof, they will evermore be noisy and wild, and namely when they seek their chase, for when the chase is found, the hounds cannot questy too much so that they be in the foos. And to raunt and make hounds there are many remedies. There be also many kinds of running hounds, some small and some big, and the small be called kennets, and these hounds run well to all manner of game, and they, that, serve for all game men call them harriers. And every hound that hath that courage will come to be a harrier by nature with little making. But they need great nature and making in youth, and great labor to make a hound run boldly to a chase where there is great change or other chases. Hounds which are not perfectly wise take the change commonly from May until St. John's Tide, June 24, for then they find the change of hinds. The hinds will not fly far before the hounds, but they turn about and the hound sees them very often, and therefore they run to them with a better will, because they keep near their calves the which cannot fly, therefore they hunt them gladly. And commonly when the hearts go to rut, hounds hunt the change, for the hearts and the hinds be commonly standing in herds together, and so they find them and run to them sooner than at any other time of the year. Also the hounds sent worse from May until St. John's time than in any other time of all the year, for as I shall say the burnt heath and the burning of fields taketh away the scent from the hounds of the beasts that they hunt. Also in that time the herbs be best and flowers in their smelling, each one in their kind, and when the hounds hope to scent the beast that they hunt, the sweet smelling of the herbs takes the scent of the beast from them. Danger of his being lost to the hounds. Challenge, i.e. the noise the hounds make on finding the scent of an animal. Get off the line. Separated him from the other deer. From here to the middle of the thirteenth line on the next page the text is copied from the Shirley M.S., the scribe who wrote the Vespasian B. 12. M.S. Having made a mistake in his transcript, copying on folio 65 the folio 64, which therefore appears twice over, to the exclusion of the matter here copied from the Shirley M.S. This sentence is difficult to understand without consulting G. De F. P. 110, who says, as the hound does not challenge when the stag is with change, one does not know where he is going unless one sees him, and one cannot always see him. G. De F. Serf's boss re stiffs is the name which he gives these hounds. G. De F. adds, and remain quite quiet. Lucien Baud, G. De F., page 111. See Appendix, Running Hounds. The text of the MS differs from G. De F. Who says if one hunts stags, O U Otras bests and trailant sans limier, drawing from them without having first harbored them with a limer, and does not say, without greyhounds, page 111. G. De F. Has here, ils criant tro and quirant ler best kel k soit, page 111. The hounds cannot challenge too loudly when they are on the line. G. De F. Chien any put tro crier, page 112. From mid eng harian, heron, to harry, or worry game. See Appendix, Harrier. Chapter 15. Of Greyhounds and of their nature. The greyhound is a kind of hound there be few which have not seen some. Nevertheless for to devise how a greyhound should be held for good and fair, I shall devise their manner. Of all manner of greyhounds there be both good and bad, nevertheless the best hue is red fallow with a black muzzle. The goodness of greyhounds comes of right courage, and of the good nature of their father and their mother. And also men may well help to make them good in the encharning of them with other good greyhounds, and feed them well with the best that he taketh. The good greyhound should be of middle size, 
neither too big nor too little, and then he is good for all beasts. If he were too big he is not for small beasts, and if he were too little he were not for the great beasts. Nevertheless whoso can maintain both, it is good that he have both of the great and of the small, and of the middle size. A greyhound should have a long head and somewhat large made, resembling the making of a base, pike. A good large mouth and good caesars the one against the other, so that the nether jaw pass not the upper, nor that the upper pass not the nether. Their eyes are red or black as those of a sparrow hawk, the ears small and high in the manner of a serpent, the neck great and long bowed like a swan's neck, his chest great and open, the hair under his chyn hanging down in the manner of a lion. His shoulders as a roebuck, the forelegs straight and great enough and not too high in the legs, the feet straight and round as a cat, great claws, long head as cow hanging down. In charning, feed with the flesh of game, to blood. Should be loose, and g, the f has loose, from lat lucius, pike, page 103. g, the f, page 104, says, la harp bien avali en guise de lion, harp meaning in this instance, flanks. Long head as a cow is evidently a mistake of translator or scribe. G. de F. has, lo cost long come on bitch et bien avail, the sides long as a hind, and hanging down well. The bones and the joints of the chine great and hard like the chine of a heart. And if his chine be a little high it is better than if it were flat. A little pintel and little ballocks, and well trussed near the ars, small womb, the hawk straight and not bent as of an ox, a cat's tail. The smooth and the rough-coated greyhounds. From MSF FR 616, Bib Nat. Paris. Making a ring at the end and not too high, the two bones of the chine behind broad of a large palm's breadth or more. Also there are many good greyhounds with long tails right swift. A good greyhound should go so fast that if he be well slipped he should overtake any beast, and there where he overtakes it he should seize it where he can get at it the soonest, nevertheless he shall last longer if he bite in front or by the side. He should be courteous and not too fierce, following well his master and doing whatever he command him. He shall be good and kindly and clean, glad and joyful and playful, well willing and goodly to all manner of folks save to the wild beasts to whom he should be fierce, spiteful and eager. The following words should be added here, a line having been omitted by the scribe, and straight near the back as a lamprey, the thighs great and straight as a hare. They are in Shirley M. S. and G. de F., page 104. In lieu of this original passage G. de F., page 105, has, sans a bayer, e sans marchander, without baying or bargaining. Chapter 16. Of Alantes and of their nature. An Alant is of the manner and nature of hounds. And the good Alantes be those which men call Alantes gentle. Others there be that men call Alantes vitraires, others be Alantes of the butcheries. They that be gentle should be made and shaped as a greyhound, even of all things save of the head, the which should be great and short. And though there be alantes of all hues, the true hue of a good alant, and that which is most common should be white with black spots about the ears, small eyes, and white standing ears and sharp above. Men should teach alantes better, and to be of better custom than any other beasts, for he is better shaped and stronger for to do harm than any other beast. And also commonly alantes are sturdy, giddy, of their own nature and have not such good sense as many other hounds have, for if a man prick a horse the Alantes will run gladly and bite the horse. Also they run at oxen and sheep, and swine, and at all other beasts, or at men or at other hounds. For men have seen Alantes slay their masters. In all manner of ways Alantes are treacherous and evil understanding, and more foolish and more hare-brained than any other kind of hound. And no one ever saw three well-conditioned and good. For the good alant should run as fast as a greyhound, and any beast that he can catch he should hold with his caesars and not leave it. For an alant of his nature holds faster of his biting than can three greyhounds the best any man can find. And therefore it is the best hound to hold and to nime, seize, all manner of beasts and hold them fast. And when he is well conditioned and perfect, men hold that he is good among all other hounds. 
but men find few that be perfect. A good allant should love his master and follow him, and help him in all cases, and do what his master commands him. A good allant should go fast and be hardy to take all kinds of beasts without turning, and hold fast and not leave it, and be well conditioned, and well at his master's command, and when he is such, men hold, as I have said. That he is the best hound that can be to take all manner of beasts. That other kind of allant is called vitrayers. They are almost shaped as a greyhound of full shape, they have a great head, great lips and great ears, and with such men help themselves at the baiting of the bull and at hunting of a wild boar, for it is their nature to hold fast. But they be, heavy, and foul, ugly, that if they be slain by the wild boar or by the bull, it is not very great loss. And when they can overtake a beast they bite it and hold it still, but by themselves they could never take a beast unless greyhounds were with them to make the beast tarry. That other kind of alantes of the butcheries is such as you may always see in good towns, that are called great butcher's hounds, the which the butchers keep to help them to bring their beasts that they buy in the country. For if an ox escape from the butchers that lead him, his hounds would go and take him and hold him until his master has come, and should help him to bring him again to the town. They cost little to keep as they eat the foul things in the butcher's row. Also they keep their master's house, they be good for bull baiting and for hunting wild boar, whether it be with greyhounds at the tryst or with running hounds at bay within the covert. For when a wild boar is within a strong hat of wood, thicket, perhaps all day the running hounds will not make him come out. And when men let such mastiffs run at the boar they take him in the thick spires, wood, so that any man can slay him, or they make him come out of his strength, so that he shall not remain long at bay. G. De F. Has Asturias, which the master of game translates as sturdy or sturdy, but the modern sense would be harebrained, giddy, not sturdy. Means chase a horse. G. de F. says, Southeast on court un cheval, ILS le prenant volunteers, page 100. Chapter 17. Of spaniels and of their nature. Another kind of hound there is that be called hounds for the hawk and spaniels for their kind cometh from Spain, notwithstanding that there are many in other countries. And such hounds have many good customs and evil. Also a fair hound for the hawk should have a great head, a great body and be of fair hue, white or tawny, for they be the fairest, and of such hue they be commonly best. A good spaniel should not be too rough, but his tail should be rough. The good qualities that such hounds have are these. They love well their masters and follow them without losing, although they be in a great crowd of men, and commonly they go before their master, running and wagging their tail. And raise or start fowl and wild beasts. But their right craft is of the partridge and of the quail. It is a good thing to a man that hath a noble goshawk or a tiersel or a sparrow hawk for partridge, to have such hounds. And also when they be taught to be couchers, they be good to take partridges and quail with a net. And also they be good when they are taught to swim and to be good for the river, and for fowls when they have dived, but on the other hand they have many bad qualities like the country that they come from. For a country draweth to two natures of men, of beasts, and of fowls, and as men call greyhounds of Scotland and of Britain, so the alantes and the hounds for the hawk come out of Spain and they take after the nature of the generation of which they come. Hounds for the hawk are fighters and great barkers if you lead them a hunting among running hounds, whatever beasts they hunt to they will make them lose the line, for they will go before now hither now thither. As much when they are at fault as when they go right, and lead the hounds about and make them overshoot and fail. Also if you lead greyhounds with you, and there be a hound for the hawk, that is to say a spaniel, if he see geese or kine, or horses, or hens, or oxen or other beasts, he will run anon and begin to bark at them. And because of him all the greyhounds will run to take the beast through his egging on, for he will make all the riot and all the harm. The hounds for the hawk have so many other evil habits that unless I had a goshawk or falcon or hawks for the river, or sparrow hawk, or the net, I would never have any, especially there where I would hunt. Setters, from coucher, to lie down. G. De F. Chien Couchant, page 113. Brittany. In Shirley M. S. England, precedes Scotland. G. 
G. De F. says nothing about Scotland. He says, Britain, meaning Brittany, page 113. Chapter 18. Of the Mastiff and of his nature. A Mastiff is a manner of hound. The Mastiff's nature in his office is to keep his master's beasts and his master's house, and it is a good kind of hound, for they keep and defend with all their power all their master's goods. They be of a churlish nature and ugly shape. Nevertheless there are some that come to be bursletis, and also to bring well and fast and wanlace, range, about. Sometimes there be many good, especially for men who hunt for profit of the household to get flesh. Also of mastiffs and alaunts there be, bred, many good for the wild boar. Also from mastiffs and hounds for the hawk, there be bred, hounds that men should not make much mention of, therefore I will no more speak of them, for there is no great mastery nor great readiness in the hunting that they do. For their nature is not to be tenderly nosed. Bursaletis or burslets, hounds, most likely shooting dogs, from berser, to shoot, bursal, an archer's butt. Wanlasor, one who drives game. Appendix, Wanlace. The five breeds of hounds described in the text. From MSF FR 616, Bib Nat. Paris. Chapter 19. What manner and condition a good hunter should have. Thou, sir, whatever you be, great or little, that would teach a man to be a good hunter, first he must be a child past seven or eight years of age or little older. And if any man would say that I take a child in too tender age for to put him to work, I answer that all nature shortens and descends. For every man knoweth well that a child of seven years of age is more capable in these times of such things that he liketh to learn than was a child of twelve years of age, in times that I have seen. And therefore I put him so young thereto, for a craft requires all a man's life ere he be perfect thereof. And also men say that which a man learns in youth he will hold best in his age. And furthermore from this child many things are required, first that he love his master, and that his heart in his business be with the hounds, and he must take him, and beat him when he will not do what his master commands him. Until the time that the child dreads to fail. And first I shall take and teach him for to take in writing all the names of the hounds and of the hues of the hounds, until the time that the child knoweth them both by the hue and by the name. After I will teach him to make clean every day in the morning the hounds kennel of all foul things. After I will learn him to put before them twice a day fresh water and clean, from a well, in a vessel there where the hound drinks, or fair running water, in the morning and the evening. After I will teach him that once in the day he empty the kennel and make all clean, and renew their straw, and put again fresh new straw a great deal and right thick. And there where he layeth it the hounds should lie, and the place where they should lie should be made of trees a foot high from the earth, and then straw should be laid thereupon. Because the moisture of the earth should not make them more founder or engender other sicknesses by the which they might be worse for hunting. Also that he be both at field and at wood delivered, active, and well-eyed and well advised of his speech and of his terms, and ever glad to learn and that he be no boaster nor jangler. Take is probably the scribe's mistake for, tatch, teach. Chapter 20 how the kennel for the hounds and the couples for the ratches and the ropes for the limer should be made. The hounds' kennel should be ten fathoms in length and five in breadth, if there be many hounds. And there should be one door in front and one behind, and a fair green, where the sun shineth all day from morning till eve. And that green should be closed about with a paling or with a wall of earth or of stone of the same length and breadth as the hounds' kennel is. And the hinder door of the kennel should always be open so that the hounds may go out to play when they like, for it is a great liking to the hounds when they may go in and out at their pleasure, for the mange comes to them later. In the kennel should be pitched small stones wrapped about with straw of the hounds' litter, unto the number of six stones, that the hounds might piss against them. Also a kennel should have a gutter or two whereby all the piss of the hounds and all the other water may run out that none remains in the kennel. The kennel should also be in a low house, and not in a solary, an upper chamber, but there should be a loft above, so that it might be warmer in winter and cooler in summer. And always by night and by day I would that some child lie or be in the kennel with the hounds to keep them from fighting. 
Also in the kennel should be a chimney to warm the hounds when they are cold or when they are wet with rain or from passing and swimming over rivers. And also he should be taught to spin horse hair to make couples for the hounds, which should be made of a horse tail or a mare's tail, for they are best and last longer than if they were of hemp or of wool. And the length of the hound's couples between the hounds should be a foot, and the rope of a limer three fathoms and a half, be he ever so wise a limer it sufficeth. The witch rope should be made of leather of a horse skin well taut. They are not likely to get the mange so soon. The Kennel and Kennelman From MSF FR 616, Bib Nat. Paris Chapter 21 How the Hounds Should Be Led Out to Scomber Also I will teach the child to lead out the hounds to scomber twice in the day in the morning and in the evening, so that the sun be up, especially in winter. Then should he let them run and play long in a fair meadow in the sun, and then comb every hound after the other, and wipe them with a great wisp of straw, and thus he shall do every morning. And then shall he lead them into some fair place there where tender grass grows as corn and other things, that therewith they may feed them, selves, as it is medicine for them. For sometimes hounds are sick and with the grass that they eat they void and heal themselves. The first four words are omitted in our MS but they are in the Shirley M.S. and in others, and in G. the F. Chapter 22 How a Hunter's Horn Should Be Driven There are divers kinds of horns, that is to say bugles, great abbots, hunter's horns, ruets, trumpets, small foresters' horns and meaner horns of two kinds. That one kind is waxed with green wax and greater of sound, and they be best for good hunters, therefore will I devise how and in what fashion they should be driven. First a good hunter's horn should be driven of two spans in length, and not much more nor much less, and not too crooked neither too straight, but that the flu be three or four fingers upper more than the head. That unlearned hunters call the great end of the horn. And also that it be as great and hollow driven as it can for the length, and that it be shorter on the side of the baldric than at the nether end and that the head be as wide as it can be, and always driven smaller and smaller to the flu, and that it be well waxed thicker or thinner according as the hunter thinks that it will sound best. And that it be the length of the horn from the flu to the binding, and also that it be not too small driven from the binding to the flu, for if it be the horn will be too mean of sound. As for horns for futurers and woodmen, I speak not for every small horn and other mean horn unwaxed be good enough for them. Surely M.S., lewd, i.e. laid or unlearned, Stratman. Baldric, the belt on which the horn was carried. Futurer, the man who held the greyhounds in slips or couples. Chapter 23 How a man should lead his groom in quest for to know a heart by his trace. Then should his groom lead his limer, tracking hound, in quest after him in the morning. And teach him to know what difference is between a heart's trace and a hind's. As I have said before, this word quest is a term of heart hunters beyond the sea, and is as much for to say as when the hunter goeth to find of a heart and to harbor him. For to know a great heart's trace from a young, and to know the trace of a young deer of antler from a hinds, and how many judgments and what knowledge there be, and for to make more certain thereof. He should have an old heart's foot and a young heart's and a hinds foot also, and should put it in hard earth and in soft, and once put it fast in the earth as though the heart were hunted and another time soft, as if the heart went apasse, slowly. Thereby he may advise him to know the differences of a heart's feet, and he shall find that there is no deer so young if he be from a brocket upwards. That his talon, heel, is not larger and better and hath greater ergots, do claws, than the master teaching his huntsman how to quest for the heart with the limer or trackhound. From M.S. F. F.R. 616, Bib Nat, Paris. Hath a hind, and commonly longer traces. Nevertheless there are some hounds well traced, which have the sole of the foot as a staggered or a small stag, but the talon and the ergots are not so great nor so large. Also a great heart and an old one has a better sole to his foot, and a better talon and better bones and greater and larger than has a young deer or hind. And so in putting in the earth the heart's foot and the hind's foot as I have said, he shall know the difference and better than I can devise. 
And also the hinds commonly have their traces more hollow than a staggered or a stag, and more open the cleaves, toes, in front than a heart of ten, for of the others wreck I never. The judgment is in the talon, when it is great and large. And in the sole of the foot, when it is great and broad, and the point of the foot broad. And men have seen a great heart and an old one, the which had hollow traces, and that cannot matter so that he hath the other signs before said. For a hollow trace and sharp cleaves betoken no other thing than that the country the heart hath haunted is a soft country or hard, and where there be but few stones, or that he has been hunted but little. And also if a man find such a heart, and men ask him what heart it is, he may answer that it is a heart chaseable of ten, that should not be refused. And if he sees an heart's foot that hath these signs aforesaid the which are great and broad, he may say that it is an heart that some time had borne ten times. And if he see that the aforesaid signs are greater and broader he may say that it is a great heart and an old, one, and this is all he may say of the heart. Also he should call the foot of the heart the trace, and of the wild boar also. Also the hunters of beyond the sea call of an heart and of a boar the roots and the pace, path, and both is one. Nevertheless pace, they call their goings where a beast goes in the roots, there where he has passed, nevertheless I would not set this in my book. But for as much as I would English hunters should know some of the terms that hunters use beyond the sea, but not with intent to call them so in England. The words in brackets have been omitted in our MS but are in the Shirley MS and G. de F. page 129, they have been thus inserted to complete the sense. Chapter 24 How a man should know a great heart by the fumes. See Appendix, Excrements. After I shall teach you to know a great heart by the fumes of the heart, for sometimes they crody in wreaths, and sometimes flat and sometimes formed, and sometimes sharp at both ends, and sometimes pressed together. And sometime in many other manners as I have said before. When they crody flat and it be in April or in May or in June if the crotis be great and thick it is a token that it is a heart chaseable, and if he find the fumes wreathed. And it be from the middle of June to the middle of August in great forms and in great wreaths and well soft, it is a token that it is a heart chaseable. And if he find the fumes that are formed and not holding together as it is from the beginning of July into the end of August, if they are great and black and long and are not sharp at the ends, and are heavy and dry without slime. It is a token that it is a heart chaseable. And if the fumes are faint and light and full of slime, or sharp at both ends, or at one end, these are the tokens that he is no dear chaseable. But if it be when they burnish that they crody their fumes more burnt and more sharp at the one end, but anon when they have burnished, they crody their fumes as before, and for that the fumes be good and great. If they be slimy it is a token that he has suffered some disease. From the end of August forward, the fumes are of no judgment for they undo themselves for the rut. How a great heart is to be known by his fumes, excrements. From MSF, FR. 616, Bib Nat. Paris. Chapter 25. How a man should know a great heart by the place where he hath frayed his head. Furthermore ye should know a great heart by the fraying, for if ye find where the heart hath frayed. And see that the wood is great where he hath frayed, and he hath not bent it, and the tree is frayed well high, and he hath frayed the bark away, and broken the branches and wreathed them a good height, and if the branches are of a good size. It is a sign that he is a great heart and that he should bear a high head and well trochade, for by the trochaying he breaketh such high the boughs that he cannot fold them under him. For if the fraying were bare and he had frayed the boughs under him, it is no token that it be a great heart, and especially if the trees where he had frayed were small. Nevertheless men have seen some great deer fray sometimes to a little tree, but not commonly, but a young deer shall evermore fray to a great tree, and therefore should ye look at several frayings. And if ye see the aforesaid tokens oftener upon the great trees than upon the small ye may deem him a great heart. And if the frayings be continually in small trees and lo, he is not chaseable and should be refused. Also ye may know a great heart by his lairs. When a great heart shall come in the morning from his pasture, he shall go to his lair and then a great while after he shall rise and go elsewhere there where he would abide all the day. 
Then when ye shall rise and come to the lair there where the heart hath lain and rested, if ye see it great and broad and well trodden and the grass well pressed down, and at the rising when he passeth out of his lair. If ye see that the foot and the knees have well thrust down the earth and pressed the grass down it is a token that it is a great deer and a heavy, one. And if at the rising he make no such tokens, because that he hath been there but a little while, so that his lair be long and broad ye may deem him a heart chaseable. Also ye may know a great heart by the bearing of the wood, for when a great heart hath a high head and a large, one, and goeth through a thick wood, he findeth the young wood and tender boughs, his head is harder than the wood. Then he breaketh the wood aside and mingleth the boughs one upon the other, for he beareth them and putteth them otherwise than they were wont to be by their own kind. And when the glades of the woods are high and broad then he may deem him a great heart, for if he had not a high head and wide he could not make his ways high and large. If it happen so that ye find such glades and have no limer with you, if ye will know at what time this glade was made, ye must set your visage in the middle of this glade, and keep your breath, in the best wise that ye may. And if ye find that the spider hath made her web in the middle of them, it is a token that it is of no good time or at the least it is of the middle, of the noon, of the day before. Nevertheless ye should fetch your limer for so ye should know better. Also ye may know a great heart by the steps that in England is called trace. And that is called stepping, when he steppeth in a place where the grass is well thick, so that the man may not see therein the form of the foot, or when he steppeth in other places, where no grass is but dust or sand and hard country. Where fallen leaves or other things hinder to see the form of the foot. And when the heart steppeth upon the grass and ye cannot see the stepping with your eyes, then ye shall put your hand in the form of the foot that hunters call the trace, and if ye see that the form of the foot be of four fingers of breadth, ye may judge that it is a great heart by the trace. And if the sole of the foot be of three fingers breadth ye may judge him a heart of ten, and if ye see that he hath well broken the earth and trodden well the grass, it is a token that it is a great heart and a heavy deer. And if ye cannot well see it for the hardness of the earth, or for the dust, then ye must stoop down for to take away the dust and blow it away from the form of the foot until the time that ye may clearly see the form that is called the trace. And if ye cannot see it in one place, ye should follow the trace until the time that ye can well see it at your ease. And if ye can see none in any place, ye should put your hand in the form of the foot, for then ye shall find how the earth is broke with the cleaves of the foot on either side, and then ye can judge it for a great heart or a heart chaseable. As I have said before by the treading of the grass. And if leaves or other things be within the form that ye may not see at your ease, ye should take away the leaves all softly or the other things with your hands. So that ye undo not the form of the foot and blow within and do the other things as I have before said. After I will tell you how a man shall speak among good hunters of the office of Veneri. First he shall speak but a little, and boast little, and well, work, and subtly, and he must be wise and do his craft busily, for a hunter should not be a herald of his craft. And if it happen that he be among good hunters that speaketh of hunting he should speak in this manner. First if men ask him of pastures he may answer as of hearts and for all other deer, sweet pastures, and of all biting beasts as of wild boar, wolves, and other biting beasts he may answer, they feed, as I have said before. And if men speak of the fumes ye shall call fumes of a heart, croteing of a buck, and of a roebuck in the same wise of a wild boar and of black beasts and of wolves ye shall call it less, and of hare and of conies ye shall say they crote. Of the fox wagging, of the grey the wardrobe, and of other stinking beasts they shall call it drit, and that of the otter he shall call sprain ting as before is said. And if men asketh of the beast's feet, of the hearts ye shall say the trace of a heart and also of a buck, and that of the wild boar and of the wolf also they call traces beyond the sea. And that of the stinking beasts that men call vermin, he shall call them steps as I have said. And if he hath seen a heart with his eyes, there are three kinds of hues of them, that one is called brown, the other yellow, and the third dun, and so he may call them as he thinks that they beareth all their hues. And if men ask what head beareth the heart he hath seen, he shall always answer by even and not by odd, for if he be forked on the right side, and lack not of his rights beneath. And on the right side antler and royal and sir royal and not forked but only the beam, he shall say it is a heart of ten at default, 
for it is always called even of the greater number. And every buck's tines should be reckoned as soon as a man can hang a baldric or a leash thereupon and not otherwise. And when a heart beareth as many tines on the one side as on the other, he may say if he be but forked that he is a heart of ten, and if he be trochade of three he is a heart of twelve, if he be trochade of four he is a heart of sixteen. Always if it be seen that he hath his rights beneath as before is said. And if he lack any of his rights beneath he must abate so many on the top, for a heart's head should begin to be described from the mule upwards, and if he hath more by two on the one side than on the other. You must take from the one and count up that other withal, as I shall more clearly speak in a chapter hereafter in describing a heart's head. And if it be so that the heart's trace have other tokens than I have said and he thinks him a heart chaseable, and men ask what heart it is he may say it is a heart of ten and no more. And if it seem to him a great heart and men ask what heart it is, he shall say it is a heart that the last year was of ten and should not be refused. And if he happen to have well seen him with his eye or the before said tokens, so that he knoweth fully that it is as great a heart as a heart may be, if men ask him what heart it is, he may say it is a great heart and an old dear. And that is the greatest word that he may say as I have said before. And if men ask him whereby he knoweth it, he may say for, he hath good bones and a good talon and a good sole of foot, for these four things makes the trace great, or by fair layers or the grass or the earth well pressed or by the high head. Or by the fumes or else other tokens as I have said before. And if he see a heart that hath a well effetted, fashioned, head after the height and the shape and the tines well ranged by good measure, the one from the other. And men ask him what he beareth he may answer at he beareth a great head and fair of beam, and of all his rights, and well opened. And if a man ask him what head he beareth, he shall answer that he beareth a fair head by all tokens and well grown. And if he see a heart that hath a low head or a high, or a great, or a small, and it be thick set, high and low and men ask him what head he beareth he may answer he bears a thick set head after his making. Or that he hath low or small or other manner whatever it be. And if he see a heart that hath a diverse head, or that antlers grow back or that the head hath double beams or other diversities than other hearts commonly be wont to bear, and men ask what head he bears. He may answer a diverse head or a counterfeit, abnormal, for it is counterfeited. And if he see a heart that beareth a high head that is wide and thin tined with long beams, if men ask what head he beareth, he shall answer a fair head and wide, and long beams, but it is not thick set neither well effetted. And if he see a heart that hath a low and a great and a thick set, head, and men ask what head he beareth, he may say he beareth a fair head and well effetted. And if men ask him by the head whereby he knoweth that it is a great heart and an old, he may answer, that the tokens of the great heart are by the head. And so the first knowledge is when he hath great beams all about as if they were set as it were with small stones, and the mules nigh the head and the antlers, the which are the first times. Be great and long and close to the mule and well appering, pearled, and the royals which are the second tines, be nigh the antlers, and of such form, save that they should not be so great. And all the other tines great and long and well set, and well ranged and the trochaing as I have said before, high and great, and all the beams all along both great and stony, as if they were full of gravel. And that all along the beams there be small valas that men call gutters, then he may say that he knows it is a great heart by the head. The words in brackets are omitted in our MS but are in the Shirley MS and in G. de F. page 132. The Tines at Top See Appendix, Antler Evermore is here a mistake, it should be nevermore. G. de F. Says, Mess jun surf any froyera ja en gro arbre, page 132. Also in the Shirley M.S. Not of good time means in the old sporting vocabulary an old track, not a recent one. G. de F. Calls the track of deer on grass, foules, from which the modern foil, stepping on grass, is derived. A whole line is missing here in our M.S. The words in brackets are taken from the Shirley M.S. It runs, after I will tell yo a man how he shall speak amongst good hunters of why office of venery. The word work has been omitted. 
Et bien over a settlement, G. De F. Page 134. Brow, Bay, and Trey Tynes. See Appendix, Antler. In Shirley M.S. it is, left. Instead of this original passage G. De F. says, for if he had on one side ten points and on the other only one, it should be called summed of twenty, page 135. G. De F. has spur, instead. Burr, mule, from the father mule. Do clause. According to Shirley M.S. and the sense, the I, I, I should be omitted. G. De F. P. 136, says, O bells portees, portees being the branches, and twigs broken or bent asunder by the head of the deer, termed entry, or rack, in mod. E.N.G., Stewart, Volume 2. 551. After I will tell you how ye should know a great wild boar, and for to know how to speak of it among hunters of beyond the sea. And if a man see a wild boar the which seemeth to him great enough, as men say of the heart chaseable of ten, he shall say a wild boar of the third year that is without refusal. And whenever they be not of three years men call them swine of the sounder, and if he see the great tokens that I shall rehearse hereafter he may say that he is a great boar. Of the season and nature of boar and of other beasts, I have spoken here before. And if men ask him of a boar's feeding, it is properly called of acorns of oaks bearing, and of beech mast, the other feeding is called worming and rooting of the roots out of the earth that feed him. The other kind of feeding is of corn and of other things that come up out of the land, and of flowers and of other herbs, the other kind of feeding is when they make great pits, and go to seek the root of ferns and of spurge within the earth. And if men ask whereby he knoweth a great boar, he shall answer that he knoweth him by the traces and by his den, and by the soil, wallowing pool. And if men ask whereby he knoweth a great boar from a young, and the boar from the sow, he shall answer that a great boar should have long traces and the cleaves round in front, and broad soles of the feet and a good talon, and long bones. And when he steppeth it goeth into the earth deep and mocketh great holes and large, and long the one from the other, for commonly a man shall not see the traces of a boar without seeing also the traces of the bones, and so shall he not of the heart. For a man shall see many times by the foot, that which he will not see by the ergots, but so shall he not see of the boar. What I call the bones of the boar, of the heart I call the ergots, and the cause that a man shall not know as well by the ergots of the heart as by bones of the boar is this, for the bones of the boar are nearer the talon than those of a heart are. And also they are longer, and greater and sharper in front. And therefore as soon as the form of the traces of his foot is in the earth, the form of the bones is there also, and commonly a great boar mocketh a longer trace with one of his claws than with the other in front or behind, and sometimes both. And when a man seeth the tokens before said greater, he may deem him greater, and the smaller the trace, the smaller the boar. The sow from the boar ye may know well, for the sow mocketh not so good a talon as a right young boar doth. And also a sow's claws are longer and sharper in front than a young boar's. And also her traces are more open in front and straighter behind, and the sole of the foot is not so large as of a young boar, and her bones are not so large nor so long, nor so far the one from the other as those of a young boar. Nor go not so deep in the earth, for they be small, and sharp and short, and nearer the one to the other, than a young boar's. And these are the tokens by the which men know a young boar so that he be two year old from all sows, by the trace, for that say I not of the young boars of sounder. And if men ask him how he shall know a great boar by his den, he may answer that if the den of the boar be long and deep and broad, it is a token that it is a great boar so that the den be newly made and that he hath lain therein but once. And if the boar's den is deep without litter, and if the boar lie near the earth it is a token that it is no fat boar. And if men ask him how he knoweth a great boar by the soil, then may he answer that commonly when a boar goeth to soil in the coming in or in the going out, men may know by the trace. And so it may be deemed as I have said by his wallowing in the soil. Nevertheless some time he turneth himself from the one side upon the other, and up and down, but a man shall evermore know the form of his body. Also sometimes when the boar partaith from the soil, he rubbeth against a tree, and there a man may know his greatness and his height. 
and sometime he rubs his snout and his head higher than he is, but a man may well perceive which is of the chine and which is of the head. For by his less, that is to say what goes from him behind, nor by other judgment a man cannot know a great boar unless he see him, save that he mocketh great less, and that is a token that he hath a great bowel, and that he be a great boar. And also by the tusks when he is dead, for when the tusks of a boar be great as of half a cubit or more and be both great and large of two fingers or more and there be small gutters along both above and beneath. These be the tokens that he is a great boar and old, and of a smaller boar the judgment is less. And also when the tusks be low and worn, by the nether tusks it is a token of a great boar. G. de F., page 139, says if, Lo sanglier guys pres de la terra, say signa chuil eight bon vinoisen, so our ms. is evidently wrong when it says, it is a token that it is no fat boar. Chapter 26 How the ordinance should be made for the heart hunting by strength and how the heart should be harbored. When the king or my lord the prince or any of their blood will hunt for the heart by strength. The master of the game must forewarn on the previous evening the sergeant of the office, and the yeoman burners at horse, and also the limer. And then he must ordain which of them three shall go for to harbor the heart, and with them the limer for the morrow, and charge the foresters, or if it be in a park, the parkers to attend to him busily. And all the four must accord where the meeting shall be on the morrow, and he must charge the sergeant and one of the two yeomen, if the sergeant be not there, to warn all the yeomen and grooms of the office to be at the meeting at sunrise. And that the yeoman burners on foot and the grooms that are called chastians bring with them the heart hounds and this done ask for the wine, and let them go after. And he that is charged to harbour the heart must accord with the forester of the bailey in which they seek him where they should meet in the grey dawning. Nevertheless it were good readiness to look if they might see any deer at its meeting, feeding, the previous evening to know the more readily where to seek and harbour him on the morrow. And on the morrow when they meet the forester that well ought to know of his great deer's haunts, he shall lead the hunter and the limer thither, where he best hopes to see him or find of him without noise. And if they can see him and they be in the wind they ought to withdraw from him in the softest manner they can, for dread of frightening him out of his haunt, and then go privily till they be under the wind. And as he stareth, stalks, and passeth forth feeding, they are to draw nigh him as readily and warily as they can so that the deer find them not. And when he has entered his covert, and to his ligging, they ought to tarry till they know that he be entered two skilful bowshots from thence. And then ought the limer by bidding of the hunter to cast round with his limer the quarter that the deer is in, if it be in a huge covert, and if it be in a little covert that the deer is in. Set all the covert to know whether he is gone away or abides there still. And if he abides, then shall the limerer go there where the heart went in, and take the scantilin, measure, of the trace for which he should cut off the end of his rod, and lay it in the talon of the trace, there where he went in hardest ground. In the bottom thereof, so that the scantilin will scarcely touch at either end. And that done he should break a bough of green leaves and lay it there where the heart went in. And cut another scantilin thereafter to take to the hunter that he may take it to the lord or to the master of the game at the meeting which some men call assembly. But on the other side, if it be so that they cannot see him as before is said, the forester ought to bring him where most deaf oil is, tracks, of great male deer within his bailiwick, and there where the best haunt is, and most likely for a heart. And when the harbour and the limer be there, the limer if he crosses the foos of a deer he will anon challenge it, and then shall the limer take heed to his feet to know by the trace what deer it is that the limer findeth. And if he finds thereby that it is no heart he shall take up his hound and say to him softly, not loud, where rascal, where. And if it be of a heart that the limer findeth, and that it be new he ought to sue, hunt up, with as little noise as he can contriangle, hunting heel, to undo all his moving till he find his fumes, excrements. Which he ought to put in the great end of his horn, and stop it with grass to prevent them falling out and reward his hound a little. And that done come again there where he began to sue and sue forth the right line till he comes to the entering of the quarter where he thinks that the heart is in. And always with little noise and cast round the quarters, if it be in a great covert as I said before. And also if it be in a little covert, to do of the scantlin and of all other things right as I have said before. 
and if he be voided, gone, to another quarter or wood, and there be any other covert near always to sue forth and cast round quarter by quarter, and wood by wood till he be readily harboured. And when he is harboured of the scantolin and of all other things do as before is said, and then draw fast to the meeting that men call assembly. And it is to be known that oftentimes a deer is harboured by sight of man's eye, but who should do it well it behoves him to be a skilful and wise hunter. Nevertheless to teach hunters the more readily to seek and harbour a heart according to the country that he is in, I have devised it in certain chapters as ye may hereafter hear. The man who leads the hound in leash when harbouring the heart. To set the covert was for the huntsman or limer with his hound on a leash to go round the covert that he had seen the deer enter, and to look carefully whether he could find any signs of the stag having left the place. This in more modern parlance is called making his ring walks. Moving, moves. See Appendix, Move. Chapter 27 How a hunter should go in quest by the sight. Afterwards I shall show you how a man should go in quest for the heart with his limer or by himself. This word quest for the heart is a term of hunters beyond the sea, and means when a man goeth to find a deer and to harbour him, and it is a fair term and shorter said than our term of England to my seeming. And then shall the groom quest in the country that shall be devised to him the night before, and he shall rise in the dawning, and then he must go to the meeting, pasturing, of the deer to look if he may see anything to his liking. And leave his limer in a certain place where he may not alarm them. And thence he should go to the newly hewn wood of the forest or other places where he hopes best to see a heart, and keep always from coming into the wind of the heart, he should also climb upon a tree so that the heart shall wind nothing of him. And that he can see him further. And if he sees a heart standing stably he must look well in what country he shall go to his lair, and privily repair to some place where he can best see. How the hunter should view the heart. From MSF FR 616, Bib Nat. Paris. Him and there break a bow for a mark. But he must remain a great while after, for some time a heart will stall and look about a great while before he will go to his lair, and specially when a great dew is falling, or else sometimes he cometh out again to look about. And to listen and to dry himself, and therefore he should stay long, so as not to frighten him. Then he should fetch his limer and cast round as it is before said in the chapter of the harboring of a heart, and take care that neither he nor his hounds make but little noise for dread lest he void. Chapter 28 How an hunter should go in quest between the plains and the wood. Also a man may go in quest in the fields in corn, in vines, in gardens, and in other places, where the harts go to their pasture in the fields out of the wood. And he must go forth right early so that he may look at the ground and judge well, and if he sees anything that pleases him he can break boughs and lay his mark and cast round as before is said. Chapter 29 how a hunter should go in quest in the coppice and the young wood. Also a man may go in quest among young wood, and although he has been in the morning and, seen, not. Nevertheless he should not neglect to quest with his limer when it is high day when all the deer have gone to their lairs, for peradventure the heart will sometimes have gone into the wood before the hunter and limer came to quest for him. Chapter 30 How an hunter should go in quest in great coverts and strengths. Also a hunter may go in quest and put himself and his limer in the great thickets by high time of day, as I have said. For it befalleth sometimes that hearts are so malicious, that they pasture within themselves, that is to say within their covert, and go not out to the fields nor to the coppices nor to the young wood. Especially when they have heard the hounds run before in the forest once or twice. He must have a feeded, trained, his limer in such a manner that he neither opens nor quests when he hunts in the morning, for he would make the heart void, and that must be by high noon, as I have said, when all beasts are in their lairs. And if his limer find anything he should hold him short and leave him behind him, and look what deer it is, and if it be anything that pleases him, then he shall sue with his limer till the time that he has brought it into some thicket. And then he shall break his boughs and take the scantolin and cast round as is before said, and then return home again to the assembly that in England is called a meeting or gathering. Should not give tongue. Chapter 31 How a hunter should quest in clear spires and high wood. In the text of our MS, the Vespasian, 
no break occurs here, but in the table of chapters at the beginning of the MS. The chapter as here given is enumerated, and this corresponds also with the Shirley and other MSS. Also I will tell you how a hunter should go in quest among clear spires, and among high trees, and specially when it has rained the night before and in the morning. Eke in the time when the heads of the hearts be tender, commonly they abide among clear spires and in high woods, for a thick country peradventure would do harm to their heads which be tender. If he meets rain as I before have said, or when their heads, are tender, and he meeteth, anything that pleaseth him, he should not follow it with his limer, for they remain in such a country as I have said in that time. That is to say in rain and when their heads are tender, for he might make the deer void into some other place of the quests as it is before said. And whoso meets him in the wood in sight of his eyes, then he must set his limer in his foos. And if it be a deer that interchangeth, that is to say if a deer puts his hind feet in the trace of the fore feet without passing on, it is no good token, but if he sets his hinder feet far from the fore feet it is a good token. For when a hart entre marcheth it is a token that he is a light deer and well running and of great flight, for if he had a side belly and great flanks he could not entre marche, but the contrary would he do. And sometimes when the hart makes a long stride with the hind foot, commonly they cannot fly well, and have been little hunted. And if he has of the fumes, he should put them in his horn with grass, or in his lap with grass, for a man should not bear them in his hand, for they would all break. And when he should meet in the fields anything that pleaseth him, he should draw towards his covert, for to make him draw the sooner to his stronghold, and when he findeth where he goeth in. Then he should break about towards the place where the heart is gone, and take the scantlin, and follow him no further in the wood. Then he should make a long turn and cast round about by some ways or by paths, and if he sees that he hath not passed out of his turn, he may return again to the gathering, and make them his report. And if it be so that he pass there where he would umbicast, cast round, and make his turn, and his limer before him, then he should look if it is the same heart he had umbicast, cast round, and if he cannot well see at his ease. Then he should reconnoitre the country till he can see easily and plainly, but have a care that his limer open not, and if his limer be deslave, be wild, let him investigate it with his eye. And if he seeth that it is his first heart he should not follow him, but then he should take another turn and umbicast. He must look that he go not along the ways, for it is the worst suing that is, for the limer commonly overshoots. But he should go a little way off the paths on one side or the other, until he, the heart, be within his turn, for then he is most securely harbored and the search shall be shorter. But if he see that it be too late to run him with strength, and if he see that the heart goes but softly pacing towards his stronghold he need not do all these things. And I pray him where he hath met with the heart, or harbored him in his stronghold or in coppices or in other thickets, that he take all his blenches, tricks, and his ruses before said, to be more secure, and to make a shorter search. If he hath time to do as I have said. Thus I have rehearsed the readiness that belongs to the harboring of the heart. And now will I devise where men will best find them in bellowing time. It is known that they begin to bellow fifteen days before grease time ends, especially old deer, and also if the end of August and the beginning of September be wet and rainy. The scribe who copied the Vespasian MS omitted the bracketed words. See Appendix, Heart. The explanation of this sentence is that a stag which entre marched or sir marched, or in other words placed the hind foot on the track or beyond the track made by the front foot, was a thin or light deer, and therefore not a fat stag. Which latter was what the hunter would be looking for? Lappet of his coat. Surely M.S. Dislavi, obsolete word meaning going beyond bounds, immoderate. After Grease Time. See Appendix, Grease Time. Chapter 32 How a good hunter shall go in quest to hear the heart's bellow. Also a good hunter should go before daybreak to hear the heart's bellow which peradventure bellow in the forest in divers parts. And to look by the bellowing of the hearts which seemeth to him the greatest. And always hearkening nearer and nearer under the wind, in such wise that when he will begin to sue, that he need nothing but to bring the limer to the foos. And anon when he seeth that it is a heart that he findeth, uncouple the finders, but not too many, 
and this, for fear of falling in danger, of losing the right deer, should be done right early as soon as men can see daylight. For in that time the harts chase the hinds, and go hither and thither and abide no while in one place as they do in the right season. And because a man cannot come nigh him with a limer, it is good to uncouple the hounds, for the hounds will get nigh them quicker and the bolder hounds will soon dissever, separate, the hearts from the hinds. The hearts bellow in diverse manners, according as they be old or young, and according whether they be in a country where they have not heard the hounds, or where they have heard them. Some of them bellow with a full open mouth and often cast up their heads. And these be those that have heard the hounds only a little in the season, and that are well heated and swelled. And sometimes about high noon they bellow as before is said. The others bellow low and great and stooping with the head, and the muzzle towards the earth, and that is a token of a great heart, and an old and a malicious, or that he hath heard the hounds. And therefore dare not bellow or only a few times in the day, unless if it be in the dawning. And the other belloweth with his muzzle straight out before him, bulking and rattling in the throat, and also that is a token of a great and old heart that is assured and firm in his rut. In short all the hearts that bellow greatest and mightiest by reason should be greatest and oldest. Chapter 33 How the assembly that men call gathering should be made both winter and summer after the guise of beyond the sea. The assembly that men call gathering should be made in this manner, the night before that the lord or the master of the game will go to the wood. He must cause to come before him all the hunters and the helps, the grooms and the pages, and shall assign to each one of them their quests in a certain place, and separate the one from the other. And the one should not come into the quest of the other, nor do him annoyance or hinder him. And every one should quest in his best wise, in the manner that I have said, and should assign them the place where the gathering shall be made, at most ease for them all, and the nearest to their quests. And the place where the gathering shall be made should be in a fair mead well green, where fair trees grow all about, the one far from the other, and a clear well or beside some running brook. And it is called gathering because all the men and the hounds for hunting gather thither, for all they that go to the quest should all come again in a certain place that I have spoken of. And also they that come from home, and all the officers that come from home should bring thither all that they need, every one in his office, well and plenteously, and should lay the towels and board clothes all about upon the green grass. And set divers meats upon a great platter after the Lord's power. And some should eat sitting, and some standing, and some leaning upon their elbows, some should drink, some laugh, some jangle, some joke and some play, in short do all manner of disports of gladness. And when men be set at tables ere they eat then should come the limers and their grooms with their limers the which have been questing. And every one shall say his report to the Lord of what they have done and found and lay the fumes before the Lord he that hath any found. And then the Lord or the master of the hunting by the counsel of them all shall choose which they will move and run to and which shall be the greatest heart and the highest deer. And when they shall have eaten, the Lord shall devise where the relays shall go and other things which I shall say more plainly, and then shall every man speed him to his place, and all haste them to go to the finding. G. De F. P. 151, says, in great plenty, not, upon a great platter. How to quest for the heart in coverts. From M. S. F. F. R. 616, Bib Nat. Paris. Chapter 34. How the heart should be moved with the limer and run to and slain with strength. When the heart is harbored as before is said and they before named come to the meeting that some men call the assembly, and also the scantolin. And the fumes well liked by the lord and master of the game, then shall the master of the game choose of the sergeants or of the yeoman at horse, which of them shall be at the finding, or all, or some. Nevertheless, if the deer be likely to fall among danger it were good to assign some of the horsemen among the relays to help more readily the hounds, if they fall upon the stint. And when the hunters on horseback be assigned then he must assign which of the yeoman burners on foot shall be finders, and which hounds he shall have with him to the finding, and the limer and the pages to go with him. And after that to assign the relays by advice of them that know the country and the flight of the deer. And there where most danger is, there set the readiest hunters and the best footers with the boldest hounds with them. 
and that every relay sufficeth two couple of hounds or three at the most. And see that amid the relays, somewhat toward the hindermost relay, especially if it be in danger, that one of the limer's pages be there with one of the limer's. And the more danger, there is, the older and the readier, and the most tender-nosed hound. And when all is ordained then shall the lord and the master of the game, if he liketh better to be at the finding than with a relay, shall go thither where the deer is harboured, and set ready weights about the quarter of the wood that the deer is in. To see what cometh out, or to see if the deer that is harboured would start and steal away ere the limer moved him. And this done, then should the lord and master of the game bid the limerer bring them there where he marked that the heart went in, and when they be there the limerer should take away the boughs he laid over the trace at the harbouring. And set his limer in the foos, and then shall the lord if he can blow, blow three motes, and after him the master of the game, and after the hunters, as they be greatest in office, that be at the finding, and then the limerer. And after that if the limer sue boldly and lustily the limerer shall say to him loud, Ho moi, ho moi, ho ho ho. And ever take good heed to his feet, and look well about him. And as oft as he findeth the foos, or if it be in thick spires, boughs or branches broken, where the deer hath walked, he should say aloud, Sai va, sai va, sai va, and rally with his horn. And always should the yeoman burner the which is ordained to be finder, follow the limer and be as nigh him as he might with the ratches that he letteth for the finding, and if the limer as he sueth, overshoot and be out of the foos. The limer should always, till his hounds be fallen in again, speak to him, calling his name, be it lawyer, or Beaumont, or Latimer or Beaumont according to what the hound is named. And anon as he falls in again and finds the foos or branches as before is said he shall say loud, Sai va, as before and rally and so forth at every time that he findeth thereof, until that the limer move him. Nevertheless I have seen when a limer sueth long and could not so soon move him as men would, that they have taken up the limer and uncoupled one or two hounds, to have him sooner found, but this truly no skillful hunter ought to do. Unless the limer cannot put it forth, nor bring it any further, or that the deer be stirring in the quarter, and hath not waited for the moving of the limer. Or else that it be so far advanced in the day, that the sun hath dried up the foos, and that they have little day enough to run him and hunt him with strength. But now to come again to the limer, it is to wit that when the limer hath moved him, if the limerer can see him he shall blow a moat, and rechase, wreck heat, and if the deer be sole, alone, the burners shall uncouple all the finders. And if he be not alone two hounds sufficeth till he be separated, and if the limerer saw him, not, at the moving he should go to his lair and look thereby whether it be a heart or not. And if he see by the lair or by the foos that it is the same deer, that he hath sued, hunted, and alone he should rechase without a long moat, for the moat should never be blown before the rechasing, unless a man seeth that which he hunteth for. And then the burner should do as I have said before, and if he be not alone the burner should do as above is said, for it is to wit that the moat before rechasing, wreck heating, shall never be blown but when a man seeth what he hunteth for. As I have said. Now furthermore, when the heart is moved and the finders cast off, then should the limerer take up his hounds and follow after, and foot it in the best wise that he can. And the burner also and every horseman go that can go, so that they come not into the foos, across the line, nor in front of the hounds, and shape, their course, as often as they can to meet him. And as often as any man see him or meet him, he should go to the foos and blow a moat and rechase and then hollow it to the hounds to come forth withal, and this done, speed him fast in the manner that I have said to meet with him again. And the relay that he, the heart, cometh to first should take good heed that he vaunt lay not, if other relays be behind for dread of bending out from the relay. But he should let the deer pass and go to the foos, and there blow a moat, and rechase and rally upon the foos. And the hunter ought to be advised that his hounds catch it, the scent, well in couple, ere he relay, that they run not counter. For that might make the hounds that come therewith and the hunters to be on Estiwain, at fault, and peradventure not recover it all the day after. And if it so be that the hunter that hath relayed, see that the deer be likely to fall into danger, that is to say among other deer, and else it needeth not, he should when he hath relayed stand still in the foos. 
and hollow of the hounds that come forth therewith and take up the hindermost, and if it be in a park go stand again with them at his place, and if it be out of park in a forest or other would follow after as well as he is able. And in this wise ought every relay to do till he come among the back relays. For if they at the back see by the spreading of the cleaves, claws, by setting fast and deep his ergots, do claws, in the earth, and if they see him also cast his chawl, then they ought to vauntlay for advantage of the hounds. For so shall they sooner have him at bay, and from then he is but dead if the hunters serve aright the hounds. Nevertheless men have seen at the first finding or soon after, deer turn the head, to bay, and oftenest in rutting time, but I mean not of deer that turneth so to bay. But I mean of hunted deer when men have seen of them the token said before that he stand at bay. And if it be so that the hounds have envoyed or have overshot, or that they be unestuante by any other ways, those hunters on horseback or on foot to whom belongs the right. First should blow the estuante as I shall devise in a chapter that shall be of all blowing. And after that he should fall before the hounds as soon as he can and take them up, and if so be that they have envoys too dear of antler they should not be rated badly, but get in front of them and take them off in the fairest way that men can. And if they run aught else they should be got in front of and rated and well lashed. And what hounds they may get up, bring them to the next rights, right line, if they know where, or else there where he, the heart, was last seen. And if it be great danger they ought to blow a moat for the limer and let him sue till he hath retrieved him or else till he hath brought him out of danger. And as oft as he findeth or seeth that he is in the rights the limer should say loud, sigh vie, twice or thrice, and wreck heat, and so should the hunters as oft as they lust to blow. And if the limer overshoot or cannot put it forth, every hunter that is there ought to go some deal abroad for to see if he may find the rights by vesting, searching, thereof. And whoso may find it before the limer be fallen in again, he should wreck heat in the rights, and blow after that a moat for the limer and sue forth as is said before. And if the limer gave it up, and cannot and will not do his devoir, duty, then should they blow two moats for the ratches and cast them off there where they were last in the rights. And if the hunters hear that the hounds run well and put it lustily forth they should rout and jopey to them lustily and often and wreck heat also. And if there be but one hound that undertaketh it lustily they shall hew and jopey to him, and also wreck heat. As oft as they be on Estiwen they should blow the Estiwen and do as before is said. And if any of the aforesaid hounds retrieve him so that men may know and hear it by the doubling of their mani. But if they hear any hunter above them that hath met, the deer, that bloweth the rights and holloweth else, where, they should haste them thither where they thought the hounds retrieved it. Or else to meet with the hounds for to see the foos whether it be the hunted deer or not. And if it is not he, they should do as above is said when they be on Estiwanti, and if it be he every man shall speed him that speed may, and every relay do as before is said. And if any of the hunters happen while they be on Estiwan to see a hart that he think to be the hunted deer he ought to blow a moat and wreck heat and after that blow two moats for the hounds and stand still before the foos till the burner with the hounds do come. And if they suppose that they may not hear him he should draw to them till they have heard him. And when any of the burners or the limer hear a man blow for them, they should answer blowing in this wise in their horn, trut 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 but he should know readily by the foos after the tokens that have been said before. Whether it be the hunted deer or not. And in the same wise shall a hunter do that findeth an heart quat, couched, and he think that to be the hunted deer, and he sees that his fellows and the hounds be on estiwanti, he should well beware that he blow not too nigh him, lest he start. And go away, before the hounds come. Nevertheless for to wit whether it be the hunted deer or no, the tokens have been rehearsed before, and when he hath been so well run to and enchased and retrieved, and so oft relayed and vauntilate to. And that he seeth that, neither, by beating up the rivers nor brooks nor foiling him down, nor going to soil, nor rusing to and fro upon himself, which is to say in his own foos, can help him, then turns he his head and standeth at bay. And then as far as it may be heard every man draweth thither, and the knowing thereof is that the hunter that cometh first, and the hunters, one, after the other they hollow a all together, and blow a moat and rechase all at once. And that they never do but when he is at bay or when bay is made for the hounds, 
after he is dead, when they should be rewarded or enquired. And when the hunters that held the relays be there, or that they be nigh the bay, they should pull off the couples from the hounds' necks and let them draw thither. And the hunters should break the bay as often as they can for two causes. The one lest he, the stag, hurt the hounds, if he stand and rest long in one place, another is that the relays that stand far can come up with their hounds the while he is alive, and be at the death. And it is to be known that if any of the hunters have been at any time while the deer hath been run to out of hearing of hound and horn, he should have blown the forloin, unless he were in a park, for there it should never be blown. And whoso first heard him so blow should blow again to him the perfect, if it so be that he were in his rights, and else not. For by that shall he be brought to readiness and comfort who before did not know where the game or any of his fellows were. And when it so is, that they have thought that the bay has lasted long enough, then should he whoso be the most master bid some of the hunters go spay him behind the shoulder forward to the heart. But the limer should let slip the rope while he, the deer, stood on his feet, and let the limer go to, him, for by right the limer should never, go, out of the rope, though he, be let, slip from ever so far. And when the deer is dead, and leath on one side then first it is time to blow the death, for it should never be blown at heart hunting till the deer be on its side. And then should the hounds be coupled up and as fast as a man can. One of the burners should encorn him, that is to say turn his horns earthwards and the throat upwards, and slit the skin of the throat all along the neck, and cut labels, small flaps, on either side of the skin. The witch shall hang still upon the head, for this belongeth to an heart slain with strength, and else not. And then should the hunter flay down the skin as far as he can, and then with a sharp trencher cut as thick as he can the flesh down to the neck bone, and this done every man stand abroad and blow the death. And make short bay for to reward the hounds. And every man, shall, have a small rod in his hand to hold the hounds that they should the better bay and every man blow the death that can blow. And as oft as any hunter beginneth to blow every man shall blow for the death to make the better noise, and make the hounds better know the horns and the bay, and when they have bayed a while let the hounds come to eat the flesh. To the hard bone from in front of the shoulders right to the head, for that is their reward of right. And then take them off fair and couple them up again. And then bring to the limers and serve each by himself, and then should the lord if he list or else the master of the game, or if he be absent whoso is greatest of the hunters, blow the prize at coupling up. And that should be blown only of the aforesaid, and by no others. Nevertheless it is to wit that if the Lord be not come soon enough to the bay, while the deer is alive they ought to hold the bay as long as they can, without rebuking the hounds, to await the Lord, and if the Lord remains away too long. When the deer is spayed and laid on one side, before they do aught else, the master of the game, or which of the horsemen that be there at the death should mount their horses and every man draw his way blowing the death till one of them hath met with him, or heard of him, and brought him thither. And if they cannot meet with him, and that they have word that he is gone home, they ought to come again, and do, whoso is greatest master, as the Lord should do, if he were there. And right so should they do to the master of the game in the Lord's absence. Also if the Lord be there all things should be done of the bane rewarding as before is said, and then he should charge whom he list to undo the deer, if the hounds shall not be inquired thereon, for if they should. There needeth no more but to caboche his head, all the upper jaw still thereon, and the labels aforesaid. And then hold him and lay the skin open, and lay the head at the skin's end right in front of the shoulders. And when the hounds are thus inquired the limer should have both the shoulders for their rights, and else they should not have but the ears and the brain whereof they should be served, the heart's head lying under their feet. But on the other hand if the Lord will have the deer undone, he that he biddeth as before is said, should undo him most woodmanly and cleanly that he can and wonder ye not that I say woodmanly, for it is a point that belongeth to woodmanscraft. Though it be well suiting to an hunter to be able to do it. Nevertheless it belongeth more to woodmanscraft than to hunters, and therefore as of the manner he should be undone I pass over lightly, for there is no woodman nor good hunter in England that cannot do it well enough. And well better than I can tell them. Nevertheless when so is that the paunch is taken out clean and whole and the small guts, 
one of the groom chastians should take the paunch and go to the next water withal, and slit it, and cast out the filth and wash it clean. That no filth abide therein. And then bring it again and cut it in small gobets in the blood that should be kept in the skin and the lungs withal, if they be hot and else not, and all the small guts withal, and bread broken therein according whether the hounds be few or many. And all this turned and meddled together among the blood till it be well brewed in the blood, and then look for a small green, and thither bear all this upon the skin with as much blood as can be saved, and there lay it. And spread the skin thereupon, the hair side upward, and lay the head, the visage, forward at the neck end of the skin. And then the Lord shall go take a fair small rod in his hand, the which one of the yeomen or of the grooms should cut for him, and the master of the game and other, and the sergeants, and each of the yeomen on horse, and others. And then the Lord should take up the heart's head by the right side between the Sir Royal and the four Courtroche whichever it be that he bear, and the master of the game, the left side in the same wise. And hold the head upright that the nose touch the earth. And then every man that is there, save the burners on foot and the chastians and the limers which should be with their hounds and wait upon them in a fair green where there is a cool shadow, should stand in front on either side of the head. With rods, that no hound come about, nor on the sides, but that all stand in front. And when it is ready the master of the game or the sergeant should bid the burners bring forth their hounds and stand still in front of them a small quoits cast from thence, as the bay is ordained. And when they be there the master of the game or sergeant should cry skillfully loud, devour, and then hollow a every white, and every hunter blow the death. And when the hounds be come and bay the head, the burners should pull off the couples as fast as they can. And when the Lord think the bay hath lasted long enough, the master of the game should pull away the head and anon others should be ready to pull away the skin and let the hounds come to the reward. And then should the Lord and master of the game, and all the hunters stand around all about the reward, and blow the death. As oft as any of them begin every man bear him fellowship till the hounds be well rewarded, and that they have not left. And right thus should be done when the hounds should be inquiried of the whole deer. And when there is not left then should the Lord, if he wishes, or else the master of the game or in his absence whoso is greatest next him, stroke, blow, in this wise. That is to say blow for motes and estiwen, stop, not, for the time of, half an Ave Maria and then blow other four motes a little longer than the first four motes. And thus should no white stroke, but when the heart is slain with strength, and when one of the aforesaid hath thus blown then should the grooms couple up the hounds and draw homewards fair and soft. And all the rest of the hunters should stroke in this wise, trut, trut, tararo, tararo, and four motes all of one length not too long and not too short. And otherwise should no heart hunter stroke from thenceforth till they go to bed. And thus should the burners on foot and the grooms lead home the hounds and send in front that the kennel be clean and the trough filled with clean water, and their couch renewed with fresh straw. And the master of the game and the sergeant and the yeoman at horse should come home and blow the mani at the hall door or at the cellar door as I shall devise. First the master, or whoso is greatest next him, shall begin and blow three motes alone, and at the first mote the remnant of the aforesaid should blow with him, and beware that none blow longer than another. And after the three motes even forthwith they should blow the recoupling is thus, trut, trut, trororo rout, and that they be advised that from the time they fall into blow together. That none of them begin before, the, other nor end after, the, other. And if it be the first heart slain with strength in the season, or the last, the sergeant and the yeoman shall go on their office's behalf and ask their fees of the which I report me to the old statutes and customs of the king's house. And this done the master of the game ought to speak to the officers that all the hunters' suppers be well ordained, and that they drink not ale. And nothing but wine that night for the good and great labor they have had for the lord's game and disport, and for the exploit and making of the hounds. And also that they may the more merrily and gladly tell what each of them hath done all the day and which hounds have best run and boldest. Measure of the Deer's Footprint In Old English, a measure, Stratman. Wrong scent, or check. Shoots, fresh growing young wood. A long note. Wreck heat, a hunting signal on the horn. Wreck heating. See Appendix, 
hunting music. Vontlay, to cast off the relay before the hounds already hunting have passed. See Appendix, Relays. Do not hunt heel, contra, counter. Drop his jaw. Gone off the right line. This chapter does not exist. If the hounds have gone away after two stags. Call to the hounds encouragingly. Surely M.S. Doubling of their mouths, from the father Mani. See Appendix, Mani. See Appendix, Curie. A horn signal denoting that the chase is being followed at a distance by those who blow. From the father Fort Loin, written for long. See Appendix, for long. A note sounded only by those who are on the right line. To kill with a sword or hunting knife. See Appendix, Spay. Cut off the head close behind the antlers. Shirley M.S., Cabac. Shirley M.S. says four notes. Should read, at the last moot. Chapter 35 How an hunter should seek and find the hare with running hounds and slay her with strength. Ere I speak how the hare should be hunted, it is to be known that the hare is king of all veneery. For all blowing and the fair terms of hunting cometh of the seeking and the finding of the hare. For certain it is the most marvellous beast that is, for ever she fumeth or croteth and roungeth and beareth tallow and grease. And though men say that she fumeth inasmuch as she beareth tallow, yet that which cometh from her is not called fumes but crotes. And she hath teeth above in the same wise as beneath. It is also to be known that the hare is at one time male and another time female. When she is female sometimes she kindles in three degrees, two rough, two smooth and two knots that afterwards should be kindles, but this happeneth but seldom. Now for to speak of the hare how he shall be sought and found and chased with hounds. It is to be known what the first word, should be, that the hunter should speak to his hounds when he lets them out of the kennel. When the door is opened he shall say loud, ho ho a rear, because that his hounds will come out too hastily. And when he uncoupleth his hounds, he shall say to them when he comes into the field, sto mon ami sto a treat, but when he is come forth into the field he shall blow three motes and uncouple the hounds. Then he shall speak twice to his hounds in this wise, or de couple, avant si avant, and then he shall say thrice, so how, and no more. Afterward he shall say loud, sa say si avant, and then, sa si avant, essay si avant so how, and if he see the hounds draw fast from him and would fain run, he shall say thus to them here, how amy, how amy. And then shall he say, Sui mon fami swef, for to make them go softly, and between always blow three motes. And if any of his hounds find an own to the hare where he hath been, he shall say to them in this wise, O ye is a Beaumont lo valiant, or what the hound is called. And if he seeth that the hare hath been at pasture in green corn or in any other place and his hounds find of her and that they fall well in in quest, hunt, and chase it well, then he shall say, La daus. La il a este, and therewith, so how, with a high voice, and if his hounds chase. Hare hunting with greyhounds and running hounds. From M.S. F. Fr. 616, Bib Nat, Paris. Not well at his pleasure and they greed, hunt, there where he has not pastured, then shall he say, Iliox Iliox, in the same place while they seek her. And then he should cast and look about the field, to see where she hath been and whether she hath pastured or not, or whether she be in her form, for she does not like to remain where she hath pastured except in time of relief. If any hound sent her, and she hath gone from thence to another place, he shall say thus to his hounds as loud as he can, Ha si dao si et venus a rear, so how. And if he see that she be gone to the plain or the field or to arable land or into the wood, if his hounds get well on her scent, then he shall say, La daus ami, Illinois ad est Iliox, and therewith he shall say, So how Iliox. Sy daus si valent, and twice, so how, and when he is come there where he supposeth the hare dwells then shall he say thus, La daus la est il venus, and therewith thrice, so how, and no more. And if he thinks he is sure to find her in any place then he shall say, La daus how here, how here, how here, how here, daus how here how here. 
And when she is found and started he shall blow a moat and rechase and hollow a as often as he wishes and then say loud, Oh yes. A Beaumont, or what the hound is named, lo valant oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, who bow low, and then, avant assemble, avant. And then should the horsemen keep well to one side and some way to the front with long rods in their hands to meet with her, and so blow a moat and rechase and hollow and set the hounds in the rights if they see her. And also for to prevent any hound following sheep, or other beasts, and if they do to ascry, rate, them sorely and dismount and take them up and lash them well, saying loud, where where ha ha where, and lash them back to their fellows. And if it happens that the hare be seated in her form in front of the hounds, and that they cannot find her as soon as they would, then shall he say, how essay amy essay essay a couplera, essay a rear, so how, but not, blow, the estiwan too soon. And if he seeth that his hounds cannot put her up as soon as he would, then shall he blow the estiwanti, and say loud, ho ho or swef a la daus, a louis, a louis, so how. Hair driving with low bells. From MSF FR 616, Bib Nat. Paris. Asami, Asami, la arrear so how, as a couplera, and thus as oft as the aforesaid case happeneth. And as oft as any hound catcheth it, the scent, he should hew to him by his name, and rout him to his fellows as before is said, but not rechase till the hare be found, or that some man meet it and blow the rites and hollow Or else that he findeth her pointing or pricking whichever it be, for both mean the same, but some call it the one and some the other. And if he find that he can well blow the rites and hollow and jopi three or four times and cry loud, lo voy, lo voy, till the hounds come thither and have well caught it. And, when, she is retrieved blow and hollow a and rout to the hounds as it is said you should do at the finding, and follow after and foot it who can foot it. And if it happen when men hunt her and hounds chase her that she squat anywhere before the hounds, and that any hunter find her squatting, if the hounds be nigh about, he should blow a moat and rechase and start her. And then hello and rout to them as above is said. And if he find her squat, and the hounds be far from him, then should he blow as I last said before, and after two motes for the hounds, and the burners that hear him should answer him thus, trut, 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 and draw all towards him with the hounds as fast as they can, saying to their hounds, so how, mon Amy, so how. And when they be there and the hounds have all come up, they should check them with one of their rods, and when she is started, blow, hollow and rout as before is said, and according to what the case requireth, do as before is said and devised. And when she hath been well chased and well retrieved, notwithstanding her rusing and squatting and receding, so that by strength at last she is bitten by the hounds, whoso is nearest should start to take her hold from them. And hold her in his one hand over his head high, and blow the death that men may gather thither, and when they be come, then should she be stripped, all save the head, and the gall and the paunch cast away. And the remnant should be laid on a great staff or on a board, whoso hath it, or on the earth, and then it should be chopped as small as it can be, so that it hang together. And when it is so done then should one of the burners take it up with the head and hold it as high as he is able in his hands, and then whoso is most master, blow the death, and anon as he beginneth every man help and hollow up. And when the hounds have bayed, as long as is wished by the aforesaid most master, then should the burner pull as high as he can every piece from the other and cast to every hound his reward. And then should the most master blow a moat and stroke, if so be that he thinks that the hounds have done enough, and else he should rest a while, if the hounds be hot, till they be cooled, and then led to the water to lap. And then if he wish blow three moats and netting hairs in their muses. From MSF FR 616, Bib Nat, Paris. Uncouple and speak and so do as before is said. And if they will seek a covert for the hare and set greyhounds without, they should blow and seek and speak in the manner as before is said, save that if the hounds find anything whatsoever it be, he shall rally and jopy till he has seen it. Or that he knows what it is, and if it be in hare do as above is said, and if it be aught else he shall blow drawing with his horn and cry loud, so how mon Amy, so how, sto a rear, so how, so how and seek forthwith again with three long motes till the hare be found. Yet nevertheless if they be heart-hunters that seek a covert for the hare, and their hounds find a fox, 
whoso meeteth with him should blow out upon him to warn the futurers that there is a thief in the wood. And if they run at the hare and the hare happen to come out to the greyhounds in front of the ratches and be killed, the futurer that let run should blow the death and keep it as whole as he may till the hunters be come. And then should they reward the hounds as before is said. Back there, from the father Ariere. Out of couples, forward there, forward. Precisely the same instructions are given by the later Tweedy and Gifford. Gently, my friend, gently. Quest, hunt, seek, also challenge. Softly, there he has been. In this place, or here, here. This passage, which reads somewhat confusedly in our MS, is clearer in Tweedy and Gifford, Reliqui Antiqui, Volume 1, page 149. It reads as follows, And then ye shall blow iij notes, why if your hund any chase not well hym, there one there another, as he hath pastured hym, ye shall say, Iliosk, Iliosk, Iliosk. Meaning that three motes should be blown where the hare has pastured to bring your hounds to the place, Iliosk meaning here, in this place. Softly there, here she has been, back there. Following this the Shirley M.S. and Tweedy and Gifford contain a passage which our M.S. has not got, and then S.A. Sai, a Este Sohau, and afterwards S.A. Sai Avant. Softly, my friend, she has been here. Here gently, here valiantly. To call back the hounds from a wrong scent, the same as, wreck heat. The words in brackets are in the Shirley M.S. Huntsman Holding Hounds in Leash Chapter 36. Of the ordinance and the manner of hunting when the king will hunt in forests or in parks for the heart with bows and greyhounds and stable. The master of the game should be in accordance with the master forester or parker ere it should be that the king should hunt such a day. And if the tract be wide, the aforesaid forester or parker should warn the sheriff of the shire where the hunting shall be, for to order sufficient stable, and carts. Also to bring the deer that should be slain to the place where the cures at huntings have been usually held. And thence he should warn the hunters and futurers whither they should come, and the forester should have men ready there to meet them, that they go no farther, nor straggle about for fear of frightening the game, before the king comes. And if the hunting shall be in a park all men should remain at the park gate, save the stable that ought to be set ere the king comes, and they should be set by the foresters or parkers. And early in the morning the master of the game should be at the wood to see that all be ready, and he or his lieutenant or such hunters that he wishes, ought to set the greyhounds and who so be teasers to the king or to the queen. Or to their attendants. As often as any heart cometh out he should when he passes blow a moat and wreck heat, and let slip to tease it forth, and if it be a stag, he should let him pass as I said and rally to warn the futurers what is coming out. And to lesser deer should no white let run, and if he hath seen the stag, not unless he were commanded. And then the master forester or parker ought to show him the king standing if the king would stand with his bow, and where all the remnant of the bows would stand. And the yeoman for the king's bows ought to be there to keep and make the king standing, and remain there without noise, till the king comes. And the grooms that keep the king's dogs and broken greyhounds should be there with him, for they belong to the yeoman's office. And also the master of the game should be informed by the forester or parker what game the king should find within the set, and when all this is done. Then should the master of the game wore the mount, upon, his, horse and meet the king and bring him to his standing and tell him what game is within the set, and how the greyhounds be set, and also the stable. And also tell him where it is best for him to stand with his bow or with his greyhounds, for it is to be known that the attendants of his chamber and of the queen's should be best placed. And the two futurers ought to make fair lodges of green boughs at the tryst to keep the king and queen and ladies, and gentlewomen and also the greyhounds from the sun and bad weather. And when the king is at his standing or at his tryst, whichever he prefers, and the master of the game or his lieutenant have set the bows and assigned who shall lead the queen to her tryst. Then he should blow the three long motes for the uncoupling. And the hart hounds and the harriers that before have been led by some forester or parker thither where they should uncouple, and all the hounds that belong to both the mutes, packs, waiting for the master of the game's blowing. 
Then should the sergeant of the mute of the heart hounds, if there be much rascal within the set, make all them of office, save the yeoman of the horse, hardell their hounds, and in every hardell two or three couple of hounds at the most suffice. And then to stand abroad in the woods for relays, and then blow three motes to the uncoupling. And then should the harrier uncouple his hounds and blow three motes and seek forth saying loud and long, who sto ho sto, mon amy. Ho sto, and if they draw far from him in any unruly manner he should speak to them in that case as when he seeketh for the hare. And as oft as he passes within the set from one quarter to another, he should blow drawing, and when he is past the boundary of the quarter, and entered into a new quarter, he should blow three motes and seek forth, but if so be. That his hounds in chase anything as he wishes, and if any hound happen to find of the king's, game, he should hew to him by his name and say loud, Oyez a bemond, Oyez Oyez, assemble, assemble, or what the hound is named, assemble. Assemble, and jopy and rally. And if it be in heart and any of the heart hounds meet with it they should blow a moat and rechase and relay, and go forth there with all rechasing among. And if it come to the bows or to greyhounds and be dead, he should blow the death when he is come thither, and reward his hounds a little, and couple them up and go again to his place. And if the heart has escaped he should no longer rechase, but blow drawing and draw in again, and in the best way that he can, take up his hounds and get in front of them. And after that the harriers have well run and well made the rascal void, then should the sergeant and the burners of the heart hounds blow three motes. The one after the other and uncouple there where they suppose the best ligging, lair, is for a heart, and seek as before is said. Unless it be the season when the heart's head is tender, then he shall use some of the aforesaid words of seeking to the hounds, lo doles, mon amy, lo doles, lo doles, and if his hounds find anything do as before is said, and if it be a heart. Do as above is said, as he may know by his foos or by men that meet with him. And if it be aught else, the burner ought to blow drawing, and who meeteth with him, the heart, call to them, and the burner should say, sto a rear so how, so how. And if the limer meet with all, or see by the foos that it is an heart, he should sue thereto till he be dead. If it go to the greyhounds and if it go to the bows, and be smitten anon, as he findeth blood he should take up his hounds and lead them thence and reward them a little, and then if he escape out of the set, he should reward his hounds. And take them up and go again to the wood and look if he may meet with anything. And as often as he meeteth and findeth, or his hounds run on a fresh scent, do as before is said. And one thing is to be known, that the heart hounds should never be uncoupled before any other, unless a heart be readily harbored, and that he may be sued to and moved with the limer. Or else that they be uncoupled to a herd of great male deer at the view, namely within a set in a forest or in a park. The undoing or growlicking of the heart the master instructing his hunters how it is done. From M.S. F. Fr. 616, Bib Nat, Paris. There where there is a great change of rascal. And that is the cause why the other hounds shall be first uncoupled to make the rascal void, for small deer will sooner leave their covert than will a great heart, unless it be a hind that hath her calf in the wood, and hath lately calved. And when the rascal is thus voided then the heart hounds are uncoupled and they find the great old wily deer that will not lightly void, and they enchase him well and lustily and make him void both to bows and to greyhounds. So that they fully do their duty. And all the while that the hunting lasteth should the carts go about from place to place for to bring the deer to the curie. And there should the server of the hall be to arrange the cures, and to lay the game in a row, all the heads one way, and every deer's feet to the other's back. The hearts should be laid in two or three rows, by themselves, according to whether there be many or few, and the rascal in the same way by themselves, and they should take care that no man come within the curie till the king come. Save the master of the game. And when the covert is well hunted and cleared, then should the master of the game come to the king to know if he would hunt any more. And if the king say yea, yeah, then shall the master of the game if the greyhounds or bows or stable need not to be removed, blow two long motes for the hounds, and forthwith blow drawing with three long motes that men should stand still. And the hunters may know that they should come to a new seeking with their hounds. 
And when the hounds be come there where they should uncouple blow three long motes and do and seek and blow, as is before said. And if the bows and greyhounds and stable should be removed, then should he blow a moat and stroke, without the moat in the middle, for to draw men together, and thereby may men know that the king will hunt more ere he go home. And when men come together, then should the master of the game see to the placing of the king and of the queen and of the bows and of the greyhounds and of the stable, as I have said here before, and the hunters to their seeking. And of all other things do in the same manner as I have said. And if the king will hunt no more, then should the master of his game, if the king will not blow, blow a moat and stroke with a moat in the middle and the sergeant or whoso bloweth next him, and no man else. Should blow the first moat but only the middle, and so every man as oft as he likes to stroke, if they have obtained that which they hunted for. And the middle moat should not be blown save by him that bloweth next the master. And thereby may men know as they hear men stroke homeward whether they have well sped or not. And this way of stroking should serve in the manner I have rehearsed for all hunting save when the heart is slain with strength. And when the moat is blown and stroked, then should the master of the game lead the king to the curie, and show it him, and no man as I have said above should come within it, but every man, keep, without it. And then the king shall tell the master of the game what deer he would work, given away, and to whom, and, after this, if the king wishes to stay he may. Nevertheless he usually goes home when he hath done this. And then should the master of the game begin at one row and so forth, and tithe all the deer right as they lie, rascal and others, and deliver it to the proctors of the church that ought to have it. And then, separate, the deer that the king commandeth him to deliver, and if any of them that should have part of the deer be not there he should charge the master forester to send it home. And then he should deliver a certain, part, of the remnant to the aforesaid sewers and to the sergeant of the larder and the remnants should be given by the master of the game. Some to the gentlemen of the country by the information of the forester or parker, as they have been friendly to the bailey, and the remnant to the officers and hunters as he liketh best. And it is to be known that every man bow and futurer that hath slain anything should mark it that he might challenge his fee, and have it at the curie, but let him beware that he marks no lord's mark nor other, futurers nor hunters. Or he will lose his fee. And also it is to be known that the fees of all follies belong to the master of the harriers, if so be that he or his deputy be at the hunting, and blow three motes and else not. In which case the master of the game can give it to whom he wishes save what the king slayeth with his bow or the queen or my lord the prince, or that which they bid with their own mouth to let run to. And all shall be judged folly of red deer which is beneath the heart, and of fallow deer which is beneath the buck, nevertheless if the harrier would challenge the deer for folly, and it is not folly, if there be a strife with him who asketh the fee. The master of the game shall judge it, and right so shall he do of all these strifes for fees between bow and bow, and futurer and futurer, and of all other strifes and discords that belong to hunting. And when all the deer be delivered, and the hunters and the futurers of the kennel be assigned to undo the deer that be delivered for the king's larder. Then should the groom's chastions of the harthounds gather the paunches and small guts together and do with them as is advised in the chapter of the heart hunting with strength, and get them a skin to lie thereover. And do as in the same chapter described with the heart hunting with greyhounds and ratches. From M.S. F. Fr. 616, Bib Nat, Paris. Greatest and best head, antlers, that they can find in all the curie. Save the blowing of the prize and the stroking and the money, the bay should wait till the cures be done, and the flesh taken away, and there should the master of the game be, and the sergeant and all the yeomen and grooms of the office. And if the greyhounds shall be rewarded it should be done right as is devised in the aforesaid chapter, except that the blowings above described shall be left out. And also whosoever slew the deer the yeoman of the office should have the skin that lieth upon the deer when the hounds are rewarded. And also it is to know that the harriers when they have run shall be rewarded with the paunches and guts, but there is no need to make a long bay with the heart's head to them, for they are made to run and chase all game that one wishes. And that is the cause why the master of them has the fees of all deer save the heart and the buck, unless it be in the certain case before mentioned. And when the curie is done, and the bay made, 
then is the time for every man to draw homeward to his supper and to make himself as merry as he can. And when the yeoman burners and grooms have led home the hounds and set them well up and supplied them with water and straw according to what they need, then should they go to their supper and drink well and make merry. And of the fees it is to be known that the man whoever he be, who has smitten a deer while posted at his tree with a deathstroke so that the deer be got before the sun goes down, he shall have the skin. And if he be not posted or has gone from his tree, or has done otherwise than is said, he shall have none. And as of the futurers, if they be posted, the first teaser and receiver that draweth the deer down shall divide the skin. Nevertheless in other lords hunting whoso pincheth first and goeth therewith to the death he shall have the skin. And all the deer's necks are the hunter's, and one shoulder and the chine is his that undoeth the deer, and the other shoulder is the forester's or the parker's fee that keepeth the bailey that is hunted. And all the skins of hearts slain with strength of the heart hounds, belong to the master of the heart hounds as his fee, that is to say he that hath the wages of twelve pence a day for the office. It is to be known that when the king hunteth in the park or in the forest with bows and greyhounds, and it happens that any heart be slain with strength of heart hounds. All the heart hunters after the king or the master of his game have blown a moat and stroked, all day they should stroke the assize that belongeth to the the curie or rewarding of the hounds. From M.S. F. F.R. 616, Bib Nat, Paris. Heart slain with strength but not with eight long motes, but with four short and four long motes, as is in the aforesaid chapter plainly devised. And all the other hunters should stroke the common stroking as is above described and said. Men and hounds stationed at different places, usually on the boundaries of the district in which the game was to be roused and hunted, or at convenient passes from whence the hounds could be slipped at the game. Teasers, a small hound to tease forth or put up the game. A difficult sentence to unravel. In the Shirley M.S. it runs, and yif hit have essen not to ye staggy, but yif he were avanced. Within the set, means within that quarter of the forest or park around which are set or stationed the men and hounds, called the stable. To tie the couples of hounds together. Made the smaller deer clear out of the forest. The beginning of this sentence relating to the th server of the hall, is not in our M.S. but in the Shirley M.S. Shirley M.S., Heart Hounds. Shirley M.S. has, Restainer. This means that the men in whose charge the teasers and receivers were placed were given the skin or fee. End of the British Museum M.S. Vespasian B. 12. The following is the concluding passage of the Shirley Manuscript, Ad. M.S. 16. 165, in the British Museum. Now I pray unto every creature that hath heard or read this little treatise of whatever estate or condition he be that there where there is too little of good language that of their benignity and grace they will add more. And there where there is too much superfluity that they will also abridge it as may seem best by their good and wise discretion. Not presuming that I had over much knowledge and ability to put into writing this royal disportful and noble game of hunting so effectually that it might not be submitted to the correction of all gentle hunters. And in my simple manner as best I could and as might be learned of old and many diverse gentle hunters. I did my business in this rude manner to put the craft and the terms and the exercise of this said game more in remembrance and openly to the knowledge of all lords, ladies, gentlemen and women. According to the customs and manners used in the high noble court of this realm of England. Finis. Appendix. Aquila's father, to take, to hold at bay, to gather. Eat sal voit k les chiens husen de quaili le change, g de f, page 156, if he sees that the hounds have taken the change. It also denotes, owning to the scent, Senecal, p. 8, Roy Modus, 29. v. Twice I says, les chevaros any sunt mia and chases any aquiles, which Dryden translates, the roebuck is not chased nor hunted up, from inquiller or aquiller, O, oh, father a form of a queller, to push, put in motion, excite. The word in English which is nearest to it is, to imprime, which was afterwards used for the unharboring of the heart, twice I, page 26. In the Old English translation of twice I, Vesp. B. 12. 
Aquilees is construed, gator, which is certainly one sense, but not the one here required, twice I, page 53. The master of game, translates ILS equivalent in G, the F, page 112, by, they run to them, page 111. See also Godefroy. A fetid, mid, ang. A phaeton, o, father of fadier, to trim, to fashion. A well a fated or a fetid head, a well fashioned or good shaped head. In speaking of stag's antlers, means regularly tined and well grown. A fetid also meant trained, retained, reclaimed, made gentle, thoroughly manned. A fader is still in use in M. Father, as a term of falconry. We find this word employed in this sense in the vision of Piers Plowman, 1362, and go a fate the falcons, wild fowls to kill. And in O, oh, Father Sporting Literature one constantly reads of Chien's Bien, a facetis, well-broken dogs. Oizo Bien a facetis, well-trained hawks. Roy Modis, 79, Bormans, page 52, Le Chase do Cerf, Jub. 157, T. M., Volume 2. Page 933. Alantes, Alans, Canis Alanus, Father Alans. Also spelt Alanda, Alant, Alans, Aloundis, M. S. Britt. Muse. Edgerton, 1995. See also twice I, page 56. A strong, ferocious dog, supposed to have been brought to Western Europe by a Caucasian tribe called Alans or Alani. This tribe invaded Gaul in the 4th century, settling there a while, and then continued their wanderings in overran Spain. It is from this country that the best Alans were obtained during the Middle Ages, and dogs that are used for bull or bear baiting there are still called Alanos. Gaston de Foy, living on the borders of this country, was in the best position to obtain such dogs, and to know all about them. His description, which we have here, tallies exactly with that written in a Spanish book, Libro de la Monteria, on hunting of the 14th century, written by Alfonso XI. Alontes were used as war dogs, and it was said that when once they seized their prey they would not loose their hold. Cotgrave, Sherwood's app, says that the Mastiff resembles an Allen, and also Wynne in his book on the British Mastiff, p. 45, says that he is inclined to think that the Allen is the ancient name for Mastiff, and thinks it possible that the Phoenicians brought this breed to the British Isles. He cannot have known the description given us of the Allen by the Master of Game, nor can he have been acquainted with the work of Gaston Phoebus, for he says that the Allen is not mentioned among any of the earlier dogs of France and Germany. There is ample evidence that they existed in France from very early days. Probably they were relics left there by the Alani in their wanderings through Gaul. About the same period as our MS. We find Alans mentioned by Chaucer, who in the Knight's Tale describes Lycurgus seated on his throne, around which stand white alants as big as bulls wearing muzzles and golden collars. The ancient Gallo-Latin name of Veltrahus, or Veltris, which in the first instance denoted a large greyhound used for the chase of the bear and wild boar, passed later to a different kind of dog used for the same purpose. These velters, viaters, or vauders were also known under the name of Allen, and resembled the Great Dane or the German boarhound, De Noir, Volume 2. Pages 295-7. Antler, O, Father Antiler, Antoiler, or Andoiler, derived from a Teutonic root. Anglo-Saxon and Lit, Frank. Antlut or Antlus, Goth Andalis, O, Gajar Antlis, Face. Gaston Phoebus and Roy Modus and other old French authors almost invariably use test, or head, when referring to a heart's antlers, but English writers did not observe time-hallowed terms of venere so rigorously. And our author frequently uses the jarring and, from every point of view, incorrect term, horns, when speaking of the heart's attire or head. The substance of deer's antlers is true bone, the proportion of their constituents differing but very slightly from ordinary bones. The latter, when in a healthy condition, consist of about one-third of animal matter or gelatin, and two-thirds of earthy matter, about six-sevenths of which is phosphate of lime and one-seventh carbonate of lime. With an appreciable trace of magnesia. 
The antlers of deer consist of about 39 parts of animal matter and 61 parts of earthy matter of the same kind and proportion as is found in common bone. Later on, a more sportsmanlike regard for terms of venere is observable, and Turberville in one of his few original passages impresses upon his fellow sportsmen, note that when you speak of a heart's horns, you must term them the head and not the horns of a heart. And likewise of a buck, but a rose horns and a got's horns are tolerable terms in Venere, 1611, page 239. Up to the end of the 17th century it was customary when speaking of a stag's head to refer only to the tines, on top, or the crotches, or troches, leaving unconsidered the brow, bez and tres tines, which were called the stag's rights. And which every warrantable heart was supposed as a matter of course to possess. When referring to the number of tines a head bore, it was invariably the rule to use only even numbers, and to double the number of tines borne by the antler which had most. Thus, a stag with three on each top was a head of twelve of the less, or lasse. Twelve of the greater, when he had three and four on top, or, counting the rights, six and seven tines, or, as a modern Scotch stalker would call it, a thirteen-pointer. The extreme number of tines a heart was supposed to bear was thirty-two. Burslet, Barcelet, Burcelet, is a corruption of the O, Father Berseret, a hunting dog, dim. Of Bersier, a huntsman, in Latin, Berserius, French, Berser, Berser, to hunt especially with the bow. Bursal, Bursal, meant a butt or target. Italian, Bersaglio, an archer's butt, whence Bersagliere, archer or sharpshooter, Oxford, and Godefroy Dictionary. Given the above derivation, it may be fairly accepted that Burslet was a dog fitted to accompany a hunter who was going to shoot his game, a shooting dog. The master of games allusion also points to this. He says some mastiffs, see mastiff, become Bursletus, and also to bring well and fast a wan lace about. We might translate this sentence, there are nevertheless some mastiffs, that become shooting dogs, and retrieve well and put up the game quickly, see Appendix, Wanlace. Jesse conceives Brasiletas and Bursaletas to come from Brace, but that can scarcely be so, as we see the two words used together, as the following quotations will show. Parler amores dun bune brachet. Kens any royce eno antitel Bursaret. T. M. I. 14404. When the fair Isolt is parting from her lover Tristan she asks him to leave her this same brachet, and says that no huntsman's shooting dog will be kept with more honor. Husband me less, ton brachet. Ains berseret a venir. Nert gardi a tel honor. Come sist Sarah. Ibid, I, 2660. Jesse quotes Blunt's anti tenures in the 6th of John, Joan, late wife of John King, held a sergeantry in Stanhow, in the county of Norfolk, by the service of keeping Brasiletum de Maretum of our lord the king. And Jesse thinks these might have been a bitch pack of deerhounds, overlooking the fact that it was only in later days that the words brache and rake were used for bitch hounds. As de Maretum meant fallow deer, the Brasiletum or Bursaletum de Maretum may be taken, I think, to mean those hounds that were used for buck shooting, Jesse, too. 21. Burner, Burner, O, F, R. Bernier, Brenier, a man who has the charge of hounds, a huntsman, or, perhaps, would be more accurately described as a kennel man. The word seems to have been derived from the French Brenier or Bernier, one who paid his dues to his feudal lord in Bran of which bread was made for the lord's hounds. Brennage, Brennage, or Burnage was the tenure on which land was held by the payment of Bran, and the refuse of all grains, for the feeding of hounds. Burner in its first sense meant finder of bran, then feeder of hounds. This word seems to have remained in use in England long after it had disappeared from the language of French venere. Gaston no longer uses the word burner, but has valet de chiens. Bish hunters, fur hunters. Our M.S. P. 74, declares that no one would hunt conies unless they were bish hunters, that is to say rabbits would not be hunted for the sake of sport, but only for the sake of their skins. Bis, bice, bice was a fur much in vogue at the period of our MS. 
as its frequent mention in contemporaneous records testifies. Blanche's trick, deceit, O and Blechja, strap. Blanche, or Blench, to head back the deer in its flight. Blancher or Blencher, a person or thing placed to turn the deer in a particular direction. Bos, from the French boss, O, father Bos, boss, hump or swelling. Cotgrave says, boss, the first putting out of a deer's head, formerly cast, which our woodmen call, if it be a red deer's, the burl or seal, and, if a fallow deer's, the button. Bows, bows, brises. When the huntsman went to harbor the deer he broke little branches or twigs to mark the place where he noticed any signs of a stag. Also, at times during the chase he was instructed to do the same, placing the twigs pointing towards the direction the stag had gone, so that if the hounds lost the scent he could bring them back to his last markings, and put them on the line again. In harboring the stag a twig was broken off and placed in front of the slot with the end pointing in the direction in which the stag was going. Each time the harbor turned in another direction a twig was to be broken and placed so as to show which way he took. Sometimes the twig was merely bent and left hanging on the tree, sometimes broken off and put into the ground, in French this was called making brises hautes or brises bases. When making his ring walks round the covert the harbour was told to put a mark to every slot he came across, the slot of a stag was to be marked by scraping a line behind the heel of a hind by making a line in front of the toe. If it was a fresh footing a branch or twig should be placed as well as the marking, for a hind one twig, for a stag two. If it be a stale trace no twig must be placed. Thus, if he returned later, the hunter would know if any beast had broken from or taken to covert since he harbored his stag in the morning. When the harbor went to remove the stag with his limer he was to make marks with boughs and branches so that the burners with their hounds should know which way to go should they be some distance from the limer, Roy Modus, X, V, 12. R, 13. R. Du Fullis, 32 R. Blemish is the word used by Turbervile for brises. Turbervile, 1611, page 95, 104, 114. Change, the change, in the language of stag hunting, was the substitution of one deer for another in the chase. After the hounds have started chasing a stag, the hunted animal will often find another stag or a hind, and pushing it up with its horns or feet will oblige it to get up and take his place, lying down himself in the spot where he found the other and keeping quiet, with his antlers close over his back, so that the hounds will, if care is not taken, go off in chase of the substitute. Sometimes a stag will go into a herd of deer and try to keep with them, trying to shake off his pursuers, and thus give them the change. A hound that sticks to the first stag hunted, and refuses to be satisfied with the scent of another deer, is called a staunch hound, one who will not take the change, which was considered one of the most desirable qualities in a stag hound. G. De F. In speaking of the different kinds of running hounds, says that there were some that, when they came to the change, they would leave off speaking to the scent, and would run silently until they found the scent of their stag again. G. De F. P. 109. Cure, Kier, Quiri, or Quarry. The ceremony of giving the hounds their reward was thus called because it was originally given to the hounds on the hide or queer of the stag. Twice I, the huntsman of Edward II. Says that after the stag is taken the hounds should be rewarded with the neck and bowels and the liver. E D I L S E Sarah Mange Sir Le Queer. E Per C E O Est I L A P L E Queer I. When the hounds receive their reward after a hare hunt he calls it the hallow. In the Boke of Esti. Albans, we find the quarry given on the skin, and it is only in the to master of game, that it is expressly stated that a nice piece of grass was to be found on which the hound's mess was to be put, and the hide placed over it, hair side upwards. The head being left on it and held up by the antlers, and thus drawn away as the hounds rush up to get their share. According to Turberville, in his day the reward was placed on the hide, at least he does not in his original chapter on the breaking up of the deer notice any such difference between the French and English customs. In France, it is as well to expressly state, the curie was always given on the hide until the 17th century, but after that it seems the hide was placed over it just as described in our text, Den Warmont, 
Volume 2, page 458. Preceding the quarry came the ceremonial breaking up of the deer. The stag was laid on its back with feet in the air, slit open, and skinned by one of the chief huntsmen, who took a pride in doing it according to laws of woodmanscraft. They took a pride in not turning up their sleeves and performing everything so daintily that their garments should show no bloodstains, nobles, and princes themselves, made it a point of honor to be well versed in this art. After the skinning was done, it was customary to give the huntsman who was undoing the deer a drink of wine, and he must drink a good hearty draught, for if he should break up the deer before he drank the venison would stink and putrefy, turb. 1611, page 128. In the Master of Game the limers were rewarded after the other hounds, but they were never allowed to take their share with the pack. The bowels or guts were often reserved, and put on a large wooden fork, and the hounds were allowed to have this as a sort of dessert after they had finished their portion. They were hallowed to buy the huntsman whilst he held the fork high in the air with cries of tally ho. Or teal oat. Or lao, lao. This tidbit was then thrown to them. This was called giving them the foro, from the word forthur, to whoop or hollow loudly. Probably our term of giving the hounds the hollow was derived from this. It was done to accustom the hounds to rally round the huntsmen when excited by a similar hollowing when they were hunting, and had lost the line of the hunted beast. In some instances the daintiest morsels were reserved for the king or chief personage, and for this purpose placed on a large wooden fork as they were taken from the deer. The vein of the heart and the small fillets attached to the loins, Turbervile says also the haunches, part of the nombles and sides, should also be kept for the lord, but these were generally recognized as the perquisites of the huntsmen, kennelmen, foresters, or parkers. Excrements, fumes, fumets, OBS term for the droppings of deer. From the father fumes. G. De F. says that the droppings of all deer, including fallow and roe deer, are to be called fumes. The master of game, no doubt following the custom then prevalent in England, says the droppings of the heart only are to be called fumes, and of the buck and the roebuck crotes. The following names are given to droppings by Gaston de Foy and Master of Game of the heart, fumes of the heart, fumes buck buck crotes roebuck roebuck bear, blazes wild boar, bless Wild boar. Black beasts. Wolf. Wolves. Hare and conies, croats. Hare and conies, crotes. Fox, the fiantes. Fox, the wagging. Badger. Gray or badger, the wardrobe. Stinking beasts. Stinking beasts, the drit. Otter, sprain tez. Otter, Sprain tez. Other forms of this term are fumets, fumishing, crotels, crotisings, fraying, fuents, billetings, and sprates. Fence month, the month so called began, according to Manwood, fifteen days before and ended fifteen days after midsummer. During this time, great care was taken that no men or stray dogs should be allowed to wander in the forest, and no swine or cattle were allowed to feed within the precincts so that the deer should be absolutely undisturbed during three or four weeks after the fawning season. He tells us that because in this month there must be watch and ward kept with men and weapons for the fence and defense of wild beasts, for that reason the same is called fence or defense month, man, page 76, edition 1598. Fut, fwite, fut, m e, o. Father fwite, voie de cerf que fut, track, trace, foot. Gawain, Fut. Will of Palern, 90 Fot. Some beasts were called of the sweet Fut, and some of the stinking Fut. The lists of the beasts which should come under either heading vary somewhat, some that are placed by the Boke of St. Albans under sweet Fut, coming under the other category in the M.S. Harl, 2340. In Boke of St. Albans. In Harl. M.S. 2340, Folios 50b. Beasts of sweet fut. The buck, the dew, the beer, 
the Reind, the Elka, the Spikard, the Oder, and the Martin, the Buk, the Du, the Br, the Reindeer, the Elka, the Spikard, Beasts of the Stinking Fute, the Rubuck, the Ru, the Fulmerd, the Fitches, the Ba, the Grey, the Fox, the Squirrel, the White Cat, the Oder, the Stot, the Polecat, the Fulmerd, the Fichu, the Cat, the Grey, the Fox, the Wessel, the Martyrin, the Squirrel, the Whiterake, the Oder, the Stoat, the Polecat. In Roy Modus, the beasts are also divided into Best Stalses and Best Quans. The reasons for doing so are also given, Folio 62, Les Best Stalses Sant, Le Cerf, La Bitch, Le Dane, Le Chevrol et Le Livre. E Sant Apolis Dalses pour trois causes, la première si est que d'elles en évite nul mauvais centre. La seconde, elles ont poil de couleur aimable, l'équal est blonde ou fauve, la tierce cause, si any sont mieux bests mordens comme les autres cinq, car elles en ont nulls dens desses, e pour ces raisons point bien ester nommies bests dalses. Under the bests poins are classed the wild boar, the wild sow, the wolf, the fox, and the otter. Futurer, the man that lets loose the greyhounds, Blome, page 27, from Veltraria, a dog leader or courser. Originally one who led the dogs called Velters, the otters, see Velters. In Gallo Latin, Veltrahus. It has been asserted that the word Futurer is a corruption of Vauder or Vyotter, a boarhound, but although both evidently owe their origin to the same parent word, Futurer can scarcely be derived from Vauder, a boarhound. It was only in the Middle Ages in France that the word Vauder, from originally meaning a powerful greyhound, was applied to a large boarhound. Futurers in England appear invariably as attendants on greyhounds, not boarhounds. Another derivation has been also given from Fut, Foot or Track, a Futurer being, according to this, a huntsman who followed the track of the beast. But Venator was the contemporary designation for a huntsman, and as far as we can ascertain the Futurer was always merely a dog leader. For long, for loin, for loan, from the father Fort Loin. G. de F. says, flies far from the hounds, i.e. Having well distanced them, Fut de Fort Lunge a u x g n s, say a dire k i l less a p n s loinhes. Hounds are said to be hunting the for long when the deer is some way in front of them, or when some of the hounds have got away with the deer and have outpaced the rest. As our M.S. P. 173, says, the furlone should be blown if the stag has run out of hearing of hound and horn, but it should not be blown in a park. In old French hunting literature it is an expression one constantly comes across. Twice I, writing almost a hundred years earlier than the Duke of York, says, the heart is moved and I do not know where the heart is gone, nor the gentlefolk, and for this I blow in that manner. What chase do we call this? We call that chase the chase of the furloin. Furloineth, when a hound meeteth a chase and goeth away with it far before the rest then we say he furloineth, Turber, ed. 1611, page 245. Fox, according to the laws of Canute the fox was neither reckoned as a beast of Veneri nor of the forest. In Manwood's Forest Laws he is classed as the third beast of chase, page 161, as he is also in Tweedy and Gifford, and the Boak of St. Albans. Although early records show that the English kings kept their foxhounds, we hear nothing of their having participated in this sport, but they seem to have sent their hounds and huntsmen about the country to kill foxes. Probably as much for the value of the pelt as for relieving the inhabitants of a thievish neighbor. In Edward's I.S. wardrobe accounts, 1299-1300, appear some interesting items of payments made to the huntsman for his wages and the keep of the hounds and his one horse for carrying the nets. These allusions to nets throw an interesting light on the fox hunting of those days. William de Blatherwyke, or, as he is also called, William de Fox Hunt, and William Fox Dog Keeper, had besides their wages and allowance made to them for clothes and winter and summer shoes, see Appendix hunt officials. As only one horse was provided, and that to carry the nets, the huntsmen, we must presume, had to hunt on foot, not such an arduous undertaking when we remember that the country was so much more thickly wooded than at present. 
and that every possible precaution was taken to prevent Reynard's breaking covert. We see by our text, page 65, that it was usual to course foxes with greyhounds, and although the passages referring to this are translated from G, the F. We know from many old records that this fox coursing was as usual in England at this time as in France. In the earlier days hounds used for the chase of the fox one day, probably hunted hare, or even buck or stag, on another, such as the harriers, which, if we can believe Dr. Caius, were entered to any animal from stag to stoat, see appendix, harriers. The first real pack of foxhounds is said to be the one established by Thomas Founds, E.S.Q., of Stepleton, in Dorsetshire, 1730. They were purchased at an immense price by Mr. Bowes, of Yorkshire. A very amusing description is given in Cranbourne Chase of the first day's hunting with them in their new country. There must have been several packs entered to fox only about the end of the 18th century, for an erstwhile master of the Cheshire foxhounds had in his possession a horn with the following inscription, Thomas Boothby Esker. Tully Park Leicester. With this horn he hunted the first pack of foxhounds then in England five years, born in 1677 died 1752. This pack, which was purchased by, the great Mr. Menel, in 1782, had been hunted both in Hampshire and in Wiltshire previously by the ancestors of Lord Arundel, Bad. Lib, Hunting, page 29. Fraying post, the tree a stag has rubbed his antlers or frayed against. By the fraying post the huntsman used to be able to judge if the stag he wished to harbour was a warrantable stag or not. The greater the fraying post the larger the deer, Stuart, Volume 2. Page 551. Fues, not find his foos, not to find his line of flight, his scent, Gaston says, Napuissant deaf fair ses esterses, literally, cannot unravel his turnings. Foos, flight, flight, track. Gaston calls these sometimes voice. Voice was written later foys, folus. Fuey. Se metre a la fuey, var. Fui, to take flight, Borman, page 89. Gladness, glade. The original sense is a smooth, bare place or perhaps a bright, clear place in a wood. Grease, one of the important technical terms of veneery, related to the fat of game, for in the Middle Ages, when game was hunted to replenish the larder as much as for sport, it entered largely into the economy of even the highest households. The fat of the red deer and fallow deer was called suet, occasionally tallow. That of the roebuck was bevy grease. Between that of the hare, boar, wolf, fox, marten, otter, badger, and coney no difference was made, it was called grease. And in one sense this general term was also used for deer, a deer of high grease, or, a heart in the pride of grease, were phrases used for the season of the year when the stag and the buck were fattest, see appendix, seasons of hunting. Grease time, not grace time or grass time, as Strutt and others have it. It did not include the whole season when the heart or buck could be killed, but meant to indicate the time when they were fat and fittest for killing. As pointed out already by Dryden, page 25, the Excerpta Historica, London. 1831, contains an interesting example of the use of this word. This is a letter written, page 356, about 1480 by Thomas Stoner, steward of the manor of Thame. He was in fleet prison at the time he writes to his brother in the country concerning some property of his own in his brother's neighborhood. No more to you at this time but. Moreover I intend to keep my grest time in yet country, wherefore I will yet no main hunt tile I have been either. In the privy purse expenses of Henry VIII. 1532, is an entry of a payment for attendance on the king during the last grease time. Cavendish in his Life of Wolsey says, My lord continued at Southwell until the latter end of grease time. Both these passages refer to the month of June. In the laws of Howell the Good, King of Wales, a fine of twelve kine was imposed on whoever kills a heart in Greece time, Kaliak, of the kings. Confusion arose occasionally owing to the similarity of the words as formerly spelt, grass being sometimes spelt, gris, Dryden, page 25. 
man would, also, misinterprets Greece time. In the agreement between the Earl of Winchester and the Baron of Dudley of 1247, in which their respective rights of hunting in Charnwood Forest and Bradgate Park, Leicestershire, were defined. And which agreement Shirley has given, in a translation, in his, English Deer Parks, the time of the fallow buck season, Tempus Pinguidinis, or Greece time or the fat season, is fixed between the feast of Asti. Peter ad vincula, August 1st, and the exaltation of Holy Cross, September 6, 14, while the time of the doe season, Tempus Formationis, was fixed between the feast of St. Martin, November 11th, and the purification of the Blessed Virgin, February 2nd. Greyhound, Father Levrier, Lat Leperarius. Under this name a whole group of dogs were included, that were used for the chase of big and small game. They were swift hounds, hunting chiefly and in most cases by sight only. For in the Middle Ages the name Greyhound, or Levrier, denoted such seemingly different dogs as the immense Irish Wolfhound, the Scotch Deerhound, and the smaller, smooth-coated, elegant Italian Greyhound. The powerful Greyhound used for the chase of stag, wolf, and wild boar were known in France as Levrier d'Attaché, and the smaller, nervous Harehound as Petit Levrier pour Livre. In our illustrations we can see what are intended to be portraits of both the larger and the smaller kinds, some being smooth and some rough-coated. The bigger hounds were considered capable of defending their masters against their armed enemies, as is shown by numerous legends of the Middle Ages, which, although they may not be strictly historical facts, showed the reputation these dogs enjoyed in those days, Jesse, p. 19. Greyhounds were the constant companions of their masters during journeys and wars, and at home. In the houses they were allowed the greatest liberty, and seem to have ranged at will in both living and bedrooms. One sees them at the board when their owners are at meals, at the fireside, and they even accompanied their masters as good Christians to mass. No hound seems to belong so peculiarly to the epoch of chivalry as the greyhound, and indeed one can scarcely picture a knight without one. A Welsh proverb declared that a gentleman might be known, by his hawk, his horse, and his greyhound. By a law of Canute, a greyhound was not to be kept by any person inferior to a gentleman, greyhounds, by a sportsman, page 28, and Dalziel, volume 1, page 25. Canis Gallicus was the name used by the Gauls for their coursing dogs, which were most probably greyhounds, and Arian says they were called Vertragia, from a Celtic word denoting swiftness. In Gallo-Latin the name for a large greyhound was Veltrahus or Veltris, de Noir, 2. 295, they were also called Velters Leperariae, Blaine, page 46. There is some difference of opinion as to the derivation of our word greyhound. In the early Anglo-Norman days they retained their French name of Levrier, or Latin Leperarius. When our MS was penned the English word grey, gre, or grewhound was in general use. It is thought by some to be derived from Grewhound or Greek Hound, as they were supposed to have been originally brought from Greece. Others, again, consider that the name was simply taken from the prevalent color of the common greyhound. Jesse gives the most likely origin of the name. Originally it was most likely Grehund, and meant the noble, great, choice, or prize hound, Jesse, too. 71, and Dalziel, I, 23. Probably the Celtic denomination for a dog, Gretsch or Greg, stands in close connection with our word greyhound, couples, page 230. White seems to have been the favorite color, and to say one had I Levrier plus Blanc K. Flores de Lis, Heroes de Mess, 107a, 44, Bangert, page 172, would be the greatest tribute to the beauty of one's hound. Co si sunt deus levires nerit en ma maison, cum cisne sunt blondes, Horn, 613f. When Froissart went home from Scotland he is depicted as riding a grey horse and leading on Blanc Levrier, perhaps one of the four he took from these isles and presented to the Comte de Foy at Orthez, whose names have been preserved to us as Tristan, Hector, Brun, and Roland, La Kern de la Palai. Greyhounds were used, as has already been mentioned, for all kind of hunting and every kind of game, in conjunction with limers who started the game for them. 
They were let slip as relays to a pack of running or scenting hounds, and they were used by themselves for coursing game in an open country. Or were placed at the passes where game was likely to run and were slipped to turn the game back to the archer or to chase and pull down the wounded deer, see appendix, stables. In our illustrations we see them in the pictures of stag dash, hare dash, roe, and boar hunting, to say nothing of badger hunting, for which one would have thought any other dog more suitable. They seem always to have been held in couples except when following their master and he not bent upon the chase. The collars to which these couplings were attached were often wonderful gems of the goldsmith's and silversmith's art. Such an item appears in the Q.R. Wardrobe ACC for 1400, Wiley, 4. Page 196, two collars for greyhounds, Levere, Le tissue white and green with letters and silver turrets. Another one of Soy Chequery Vert et Noir avec Lutret. Turret, letters and bells of silver gilt. The ancient doggerel in the Book of St. Albans, head like a snake, and neck like a drake. Foat like a cat. Tailed like a rat, side like a team. Chined like a beam, Book of St. Albans, F. 4. Was preceded by a very similar one written some time previously by Gaste de la Bigny. Of these verses G. de F. gives, twenty-eight years later, a prose version, which our master of game has rendered into English. Pardel, pardiel, to tie couples of hounds together. From the French word harder, which has the same meaning, harder less chiens, and hard, the rope with which they are tied. It is derived from heart, hard, art, a binder of willow or other pliable wood used for fastening faggots together, lit. And God. The primitive way of tying hounds together was by passing such a small flexible branch through the couplings which bent back on itself, both ends being held. Les Chiens. Surant and Hardes par les couples à Genoivres ou à autres Jason Boitors, Roy Modus, F. 47. Recto. In France there used to be two hards to each relay and not more than eight hounds in every hard, Diaville. In England there used to be about the same number. The term was still used in Blome's time, 1686, for he writes in his, Gentleman's Recreation, the huntsman on foot that hath the charge of the coupled hounds, and before that must have hard led them, that is, with a slip. For the purpose ready secured three or four couple together, that they may not break in from him, to run into the cry of the finders, p. 88. Harling was a word used in Devonshire, and as it meant tying the hound together by means of a rope passed through the rings of the couples, it is undoubtedly a corruption of the word hardelling. Until comparatively recent times the hounds in Devonshire were taken to the meat and held in this manner until the time came to lay the pack on, Collins. Hardell, the technical O.E. Term for binding together the four legs of the roebuck, the head having been placed between the two forelegs, in order to carry him whole into the kitchen. Hare, Pliny records the fable that hares, are of many and various sexes. Topsell remarks that, the Hebrews call the hare Arnbet, in the feminine gender, which word gave occasion to an opinion that all hares were females, pages 264, 266. In the Gwentian Code of Welsh laws supposed to be of the 11th century, the hare is said not to be capable of any legal valuation, being in one month male and in another female, twice I, page 22. Certainly in many of the older writings on hares the pronouns, her, and, him, are used indiscriminately in the same sentence. Sir Thomas Brown in his treatise on vulgar errors asserts from his own observation that the sex of the hare is changeable, and that the buck hare will sometimes give birth to young. Up to the end of the 18th century there was a widespread and firm belief in this fable, Brem, 2. Page 626. Buffon describes it as one of the animal's peculiar properties, and from the structure of their parts of generation he argues that the notion has arisen of hermaphrodite hares, that the males sometimes bring forth young. And that some are alternately males and females and perform the functions of either sex. Master of Game, copying G. de F., states that the hare carries her young for a period of two months, but in reality the period of gestation is only thirty days. Harding says that the adult hare will breed twice or thrice in the year, 
but Brehm declares they breed as many as four times, and but seldom five times, in Cyclop. Of Sport, Volume 2. Page 504, Brehm, Volume 2. Page 626, G. De F. Page 47. G. De F. P. 43, says of a hair, Eloit bien, mais el voit mal. Master of Game, translates this simply as she hath evil sight, but does not say she hears well. The sense of hearing is most highly developed in the hair, and every lightly breaking twig or falling leaf will disturb her. It is said that of old when warreners wished to prepare hairs for the market they filled their ears with wax, so that, not being continually disturbed by noises, they did not move about much, and grew sleek and fat, Blome, page 95. G. De F. S. assertion that the hare has evil sight is also confirmed by Brehm, who, however, says that they are endowed with a keen sense of smell, whereas G. De F. says L. Sent Po. Attention has already been called to the Duke of York's statement that the hare hath great fear to run. This arose probably from the similarity of the words pear and pouvoir in the MSS. For it should read, hath great power to run, the principal misses which we have examined showing pouvoir. Verid in his first edition of G. de F. also has the same rendering as the Duke of. Shooting hares with blunt bolts. From MSF FR 616, Bib. Nat. Paris. York, to which Lavallee draws attention as being one of the many ludicrous mistakes in this edition, G. de F. Zlai. Our text calls the hare the most marvelous beast, P. 181, the reasons given being because she fumeth or croteth and roungeth and beareth tallow and grease. By roungeth, fr. Rangier, it was meant that the hare chewed the cud, as by the ancients it was generally supposed that the hare was a ruminant. Although this is not the case, and the hare has not a compound stomach, nevertheless this belief showed a close observation of nature, for when a hare is seated she can bring up parts of her food and give it a second mastication. The hare and rabbit have little or no fat, but what they do possess is called grease. Twice I says, I.L. Port Gress, pages 1 and 21. She has teeth above in the same wise as beneath, p. 181, is another of the peculiarities noticed in our text, which shows that the difference in dentition that distinguishes the hare from all other rodents had been remarked. Instead of two incisors in the upper jaw, the hare has four, having two small rudimentary incisor teeth behind the two large front ones, and five or six molars in the upper jaw, with two incisors and five molars in the lower jaw, Brem, 2. Page 627. Cornish, Shooting, 2. Page 153. It is difficult to know why the hare was considered a melancholy beast, and how this curious reputation was kept up during the whole of the Middle Ages. It was thought that eating the flesh of the hare rendered one also subject to melancholy. G. de F. Does not mention this, and altogether his book is comparatively free of such superstitions, but he says the flesh of the hare should not be given to the hounds after a day's hunting. As it is indigestible, cor l est fastius viande et les fet vomer, p. 2.10, therefore, when rewarding the hounds, they should only have the tongue and the kidneys, with some bread soaked in the blood of the hare. In our MS, at the end of the chapter on the nature of the hare, p. 22, the Duke of York says that he trows no good hunter would slee them so, alluding to pockets, purse nets, and other poaching devices, and although G. de F. gives six ways of taking the hare, he does not approve of such methods for the true sportsman, but enters an amusing protest, I would that they who take hares thus should have them, the cords, round their own necks, page 171. Snaring hares was never considered legitimate sport. In hare hunting proper, the hounds were taken into the fields to find the hare, as at present. Or hare finders were sent out early in the morning, and the tufts of grass or plants where the hare was likely to be seated were beaten, and the hounds uncoupled only when the hare was started. One of the chief differences in the sport between then and now was that often, when the hare was once on foot, greyhounds were also uncoupled, and our plate, page 182, 
shows greyhounds and running hounds hunting seemingly happily together. It must have been rather discouraging for the old-fashioned, slow-scenting hound to have the hare he has been diligently hunting suddenly bitten in front of him by the swifter greyhound. Trencher-fed packs also existed as early as the 14th century, and we read in Gaste de la Bigny that the small farmers would assemble together, bringing all told some forty hounds of different breeds and sizes, immensely enjoying their sport. And accounting for many hares. Harness means in our text, paraphernalia wherewith animals can be caught or taken. It is frequently used in this sense by Gaston, Hayes et autres Harnois, page 126. In Julian's note to this same sentence occurring in Le Bon Varlet, he says, Autres Harnois, Autres Engins, Instruments, Proceeds. Harrier, spelt in early documents with many variations, a rare, erroris, error, herrers. A hound which is described in modern dictionaries as, resembling a foxhound but smaller, used for hare hunting, Murray. This explanation would not have been a correct one for our harriers of the 14th century, for as far as we can gather they were used to hunt all kinds of game and by no means only the hare. They were evidently a smaller kind of running hound, for as our M.S. says, there are some small and some large running hounds, and the small are called kinetis, or small dogs, see kennet, and these hounds run well to all manner of game and they that serve for all game men call them errors, page 3. And in chapter 36 we see that errors were used to hunt up the deer in the forest, the hurt hounds and greyhounds meanwhile being held in leash till a warrantable deer was on foot. Or till, the error have well run and well made the rascal void, made the smaller deer clear out of that part of the forest, p. 191, then the hurt hounds were to be uncoupled where the most likely, ligging is for an hurt, and seek. The hurt hounds then put up the wary old stag and hunted him till he came to the tryst where the king would be with his long bow or crossbow, or till the hurt was pulled down by them or the greyhounds which had been slipped at him. In the chapter on hare hunting in our MS the word harrier does not occur, only hounds, greyhounds, and ratches are mentioned. So when Henry IV. Paid for, La Garde de Nos Chiens Appelles Herrers, Privy Seal, August 20, 9th Henry, 1408, no. 5874, or Henry V, for the, Custodium Canum Nostrum Vocatorum Harriers, Rot. Pat. I Henry V, 1413, it was not because they were especially addicted to hare hunting, but because they kept these useful hounds to, hairy, game. In 1407 we find one Hugh Malgrave, Servienti Venatori, Vocat, Haters P. C. V. O., Servo, which we may accept as another proof that their office was to hunt the stag. The Duke of York also repeatedly says that errors run at all game, C. P. P. 3, 196. 197. In 1423 Hugh Malgrave still held the office of the Herrers, by grant from Henry IV. In the curious legal Latin of the 13th century, we find the word Keynes Eretz, and Eretter, wardrobe accounts, 34 ed. I. There are a great number of early records which show us that these hounds were used then for hunting red and fallow deer, sometimes in conjunction with greyhounds and sometimes without their aid. Harriers were sometimes taken with buckhounds on hunting expeditions as well as with greyhounds. In some of the documents harriers are simply alluded to as Cain's currents. As they were not a distinct breed, but were included under the designation ratches, or running hounds, a separate chapter is not given to them in our text, and neither twice I nor the Dame of St. Albans mentions these hounds. Gradually we find the spelling, although presenting still countless variations, bringing the a more constantly than the e, the terrors, become herrers, herrers, harriers, and after the 16th century harriers. It is also probable that the word was originally derived from the Anglo-Saxon herjan, harrian, to harry, to disturb, to worry, o, father harrier, 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 to harry, f, hare and harer, to set a dog on to attack. The harrier, in fact, was a dog to hare the game. Although now obsolete, we find this word used late in the 17th century. Let the hounds kill the fox themselves and worry and hare him as much as they please, cox, gent. Rec, page 110.
It is also in the 16th century that one comes across the first allusions to their use in hunting the hare. Hart It is not necessary to dwell here at length upon the great esteem in which the hart was held by all devotees to sport in Europe during the Middle Ages. It was royal game, and belonged to the prince or ruler of the country, and the chase was their prerogative. Few unconnected with the court were ever able to enjoy the chase of the stag unless in attendance on or by special license granted by the sovereign. Those who had extensive property of their own and had permission to erect a fence could, of course, keep deer on it, but this did not enable them to enjoy the sport of real wild deer hunting, or la chasse royale as the French called it. The stag was one of the five beasts of Veneri, and was, according to the ancient French regulations, a beast of the sweet foot, although in the list of beasts of sweet and stinking foot given in the Boke of Esti. Albans, the heart is included in neither category, see Appendix, Fut. One of the first essentials for a huntsman in the Middle Ages was to learn to know the different signs of a stag, according to German Veneri there were seventy-two signs, so as to be able to judge well. These signs were those of the slot, the gate, the fraying post, the rack or entry, i.e. the place where the stag entered covert, and the fumes. By recognizing differences in these signs made by a young stag, a hind, and a warrantable stag, he was enabled to find out where the latter was harboring, and by the slot and gate he could recognize when the chased stag was approaching his end. There were many things that the huntsman of old had to learn regarding the stag before he could be considered as more than an apprentice, for instance, how to speak of a heart in terms of veneery. The terms used were considered of the greatest importance, even to the manner in which the color of the stag was spoken of, brown, yellow, or dun being the only permissible terms to distinguish the shade of color. Special terms are given for every kind of head, or antlers, a stag might bear. The huntsman spoke of the stag's blenches and ruses when alluding to the tricks of a deer when trying to rid himself of the hounds, of his doubling and rusing to and fro upon himself when he retraced his steps. Of his beating up the river when he swam upstream, and of foiling down, when he went downstream, or of going to soil when he stood in water. When the deer lay down he was quat, when he stood still in covert he was stalling. When he was tired he cast his chawl, i.e. drooped his head, a well-known sign when the deer is done, as was his closed mouth when dead beat. The heart was meaved or moved, when he was started from his resting place, he was quested or hunted for, and sued or chased, his resting place was called his ligging or lair, his scent of line of flight, his foos. He was spoken of as soul or soil, f, soul, if unaccompanied by other deer, and in, heard with rascal and folly, if keeping company with lesser deer. Besides many other quaint terms of Veneri the following were the designations given to the heart according to his age by Master of Game Twice I, Boke of St. Albans, Man Wood, Turbervile Blome, Cox's, Gentleman's Recreations First Year A Calf A Calf. A Hind Calf or Calf Second, A Bullock. A Brocket. A Nobbler or Nobber Third, A Brocket. A Spayer, Spyard or spade. A brocket or brock. Fourth, a staggart. A staggart or stag. A staggered. Fifth, a heart of ten. A heart. A heart. Until he was a heart of ten, our text tells us he was not considered a chaseable or warrantable deer. By the above, one will see that the master of game is exceptional in calling a deer of the second year a bullock, brocket being the usual term. In old French literature we occasionally find the word brochet used for the tines of a deer's antlers, brochet would be the diminutive, i.e. a small tine, and hence perhaps brocket, a young stag bearing small tines. Any stag of ten or over if hunted by the king became a heart royal, and if hunted and not taken, but driven out of the forest, a proclamation was made to warn everyone that no person should chase or kill the said heart. And he was then a heart royal proclaimed man. Page 180. All stags not chaseable, such as young or lean stags and hinds, were classed as folly or rascal. A young stag accompanying an old one was called his squire, F. Escuir. Hinds also were called by different names from the first to the third year, but the master of game does not give these, nor do any of the earliest works. Man would, 
Blome, and Cox give the following terms, first year, a calf. Second year, a hearse or brocket sister, third year and ever after, a hind. A somewhat similar term was employed in France to denote a young stag between six months and a year old. Hare, also spelt her, G. De Champ Grand Baudrillard, and Harpale, was the term for a herd of young stags and hinds. Hart's Age. The fable that a stag can live a hundred years, which the master of game repeats, page 34, after G. de F. was not of the latter's invention, but one that had been current for many centuries before their day. Horns, when the master of game was written, hunting horns were the curved primitive shape of those made from the horns of animals, and most of them probably were still made of the horns of cattle. While those used by the richer gentry and nobles were fashioned from some rarer animal's trophy, such as the ibex, or carved of ivory, and some were made of precious metal. But whether of simple horn, ivory, or of wood, they were decorated with gold or silver ferrules, rings, and mouthpieces, and some being provided with a stopper, could be converted into drinking horns. Unfortunately the master of game does not tell us the material of which horns should be made. He simply says how they should be drive. They were to be two spans long, one foot six inches. Slightly curved so that both ends were raised from three to four fingers breadth above the center, the larger end or the bell was to be as wide as possible, and the mouthpiece not too small. It was waxed thickly or thinly, whichever the huntsman thought produced the best sound. What effect the wax had can scarcely be judged, but it was evidently considered an improvement, as it is stated that for foresters, mean horns and unwexed are good enough for them. Besides the hunter's horn five different kinds of horns are mentioned in our MS, the bugle, great abbots, ruits, small foresters, and mean horns. The bugle was not the trumpet we now understand by that name, but a simple curved horn, most probably deriving its name from the bugle, as the wild ox was called, although Dryden says from the German word bugle, a curve or bend. Ruits may have been the name for a much curved or almost circular horn, from French ruette, small wheel. The mean horns were probably the medium-sized, trill-sounding horns made out of wood or bark, known as menules, menuo, moyenal, menuir, and k. Perk. 27,166 and 27,140. A good length for a horn is mentioned as being un palm et de mai, per se val, 31,750. It is uncertain whether this length and that given by the master of game were measured round the inside of the bend or in a straight line between the two extremities. The famous Borstal horn, also known as Nigel's horn, is 2 feet 4 inches long on the convex and 23 inches on the concave bend, the inside measure of the bell end being 3 inches in diameter. The size of another noted horn, i.e. The Pusey horn, is 2 feet half an inch long, the circumference at the widest end being 12 inches. The general length of these horns seems to have been somewhere between 18 inches and 2 feet. The above-mentioned specimens were horns of tenure, the first being a hunting dash, the second a drinking horn. The Borstal horn is said to have been given by Edward the Confessor to one Nigel, in reward for his killing an immense wild boar, and by this horn he and his successors for generations held lands of the crown. The curved horn remained in fashion in England till about the latter half of the 17th century, then a straight one came into use about 1 foot 6 inches. To 2 feet long, such as we see depicted in Blome. Of this shape, but a few inches shorter, is the hunting horn still in use in England. The French hunting horn was used in England in the 18th century, but did not remain long in fashion. Hunting cries, we can see that the hunting cries and the language used in speaking to the hounds when hunting in the days of the master of game were still those brought into Britain by the Normans. And in most instances the words can actually still be recognized as French. There are only a few examples given by him as to the manner a huntsman should speak to his hounds in the stag hunting chapters, such as Ho moi, ho moi, ho, ho, ho to encourage the limer when drawing for a stag, page 166. Sai VA, Sai VA, Sai VA, to call the hounds when any signs of the stag were seen, p. 
page 167. Ludaus mon ami, Ludaus, softly, my friend, softly. To the hounds when they were uncoupled near to where the stag was supposed to be lying. Sto arrear, so how, so how, hark back, if the hounds were on a wrong scent. Who sto, ho sto, mon ami, ho sto, to harriers drawing for a stag. Oh yes, ah Beaumont, oh yes, assemble ah Beaumont, hark to Beaumont, hark, get to him. To the hound of that name who picks up the right line, and to bring the other hounds to him. It is in the hare hunting chapter that we have more of the fair wardis of Veneri, and here, if the master of game does not slavishly copy twice I, yet he employs the same cries, with a slight difference only in orthography. The book of Esti. Albans has also most of the following. Who are rear, back there. When the hounds come too hastily out of the kennel. So mount Amy a trait, until they come into the field. These two are not given by twice I, but the following are identical in both books. Or de couple, avant s y avant, and thrice so how, when the hounds are uncoupled. Sa s a si avant, si s a avant, s a si avant, avant, sire, avant, in twice I forward, sir, forward. Here how, Amy, how Amy, and Sweff, mon Amy, Sweff, gently, my friend, gently, Sweff, from Latin suaves, when the hounds draw too fast from the huntsman. Oh yes, a Beaumont, in twice I, oh yes, a Beaumont le valent kil quide trover le coward o de la court coe, hark to Beaumont the valiant, who thinks to find the coward with the short tail. La daus, la il ad este sohau, softly, there, here he has been, if the place where the hare has pastured is seen. Illo x, illo x, here, here, if the hounds hunt well on the line, see appendix, illo x. Ha s y touts, si est il venus a rear, so how. Sa si este so how. Sa si avant, here, he has gone back. Here he has been. Forward there. When the hare has doubled. La daus Amy, Illinois est venus illo x, so how, softly, friend, he is here. When the hounds hunt well in fields or arable land. La daus, Amy, la est il venus, per lu sigir so how, softly, friend, here he has come to seat himself, mid eng, sedge, a seat. Latin, sedir. La daus, Amy, la il est venus, per mainder, here he has been to feed, mainder, from Latin mangicare, mandare. The bracketed part of the last two cries are given in the MS of Tweedy and GYFF. And the following are only in the Master of Game. Lu valiant oyes, oyes who bow bow, and then, avant, assemble, assemble, war war, aha war, for running riot. How asami asami so arrear so how blues a coupler. On seeing the pricking or footing of the hair, lu voy, lu voy, the view, the view. In France, tally ho, or a very similar sounding word, was employed in the early days when the huntsman was sure that the right stag had gone away, whether he only knew it by his slot, and, or whether he had viewed him. It was also a call to bring up the hounds when the stag had gone away, and at the end of the curie, when the huntsman held part of the entrails of the deer on a large wooden fork, and the hounds bait it, which was called the foru. The huntsman called out tally ho. We only find tally ho in comparatively recent English hunting literature and songs, never, so far as I am aware, before the late 17th century, and it does not occur at all constantly until the 18th century. Neither Turbervile nor Blom nor Cox, in their books on the various chases, mention such a word, though we find instruction to the huntsman to say, hark to him, hark forward, hark back, and, to him, to him. Besides the inevitable, so how so how. Neither in Twice I, Master of Game, Book of St. Albans, Chaucer, or Shakespeare can we find an invigorating tally-ho. It would almost appear as if it were a 17th century importation from across the channel, which is quite possible, for Henry IV. Of France sent in that century three of his best huntsmen, de Pre, de Beaumont, and de Saint-Trevy, to the court of King James I. 
to teach the royal huntsmen how to hunt the stag in the French way, English court hunting having degenerated into coursing of stags within the park palings. Tayot in France was used solely in the chase of red, fallow, or roe deer. Hunting music, in the master of game, as in all the earliest hunting literature, much importance is placed on the huntsman sounding his horn in the proper manner in order, as twice I says, that each man who is around you, who understands hunting, can know in which point you are in your sport by your blowing. The author of Master of Game, page 170, says he will give us a chapter which is all of blowing, but he omitted to fulfill this promise, so that we have only such information as we can gather in his chapters on stag and hare hunting. The differences in the signals were occasioned by the length of the sound or note, and the intervals between each. Twice I expresses these notes in syllables, such as trout, trout, truerout. The first of these would be single notes, with an interval between them, blown probably with a separate breath or wind for each, the latter would be three notes blown without interval and with a single breath or wind. The principal sounds on the hunting horn were named as follows. A moot or moat, a single note, which might be sounded long or short. A rec heat. To rec heat, twice I says, blow in this manner, truer out, truer out, truer out, therefore a four-syllabled sound succeeded by an interval, blown three times. In the Master of Game, we find the rec heat preceded or followed by a moot, the most constantly recurring melody. When the limer has moved the stag, and the huntsman sees him go away, he was to blow a moot and rec heat. If the stag is moved but not viewed, and the huntsman knows only by the slot that it is his stag that has gone away, he is to rec heat without the moot, for that was only to be blown when the stag was seen. When the hounds are at fault and any one finds the slot of the deer, he should rec heat in the rights and blow a long moot for the limer, or if he thinks he sees the hunted stag, he should blow a moot and rec heat. And after that, blow two moots for the hounds. The furlong. A signal that the stag had got away far ahead of the hounds or that these had distanced some or all of the huntsmen, see appendix, furlong. The perfect or parfit. Twice I says it began by a moot and then truer out, trout, trout, truer out, truer out, truer out, trout, trout, truer out, and then to commence by another moot again, and so you ought to blow three times. And to commence by a moot and to finish by a moot. This was only blown when the hounds were hunting the right line, see appendix, parfait. The prize. Twice I says, blow four moots for the taking of the deer. According to the master of game, the prize or coupling up was to be blown by the chief personage of the hunt only, after the quarry. It was only blown when the deer had been slain by strength, or hunted, and not when shot or coursed. He was to blow four moots, wait a short interval, half an Ave Maria, and blow another four notes a little longer than the first four. The Mani. Twice I says the Mani should only be blown for the heart, the boar, the wolf, and the male wolf, but he does not give us any analysis of this melody. In the Master of Game, we are told that the Mani was blown at the hall door on the return of the huntsman. The master first blew four moots alone, then at the end of the four moots the others joined him in blowing, and they all continued keeping time together, see appendix, mani. The mort or death was another sound of the horn, but we have no description of the notes. Perhaps it is synonymous with the prize. The stroke must have been another grouping of short and long notes, but of this we have no record. Hardouin de Fontaine's Guerin wrote a poem on the chase chiefly concerning the different manners of blowing such as obtained in his native country the provinces of Anjou and Maine. The poem was illustrated with fourteen miniatures showing the notes to be blown on as many different occasions during stag hunting. The notes are written in little squares, denoting a long note, a short note, a note of two long syllables. A note of two short syllables, a note of one short and two long syllables, and a note of one short, two long, and two short syllables. Of these six notes combinations were made for all the signals to be blown. From Hardouin de Fontaine's Guerin's work, written in 1394. Illo X, here in this place, from the L, Illo Loco. Sometimes it is spelt Ilex, Iluek, Ilosks, and K. 
It is constantly met with in Anglo-Norman, and the Provence dialects, Botman, pages 90, 242, T. M., pages 31, 93, 142, Roy Modus, 69, and in the will of the Duke of York, Nichols. It has been suggested that it is the origin of the familiar yoikes. In the Book of St. Albans, in the verses on hare hunting it also occurs. Jopai, synonymous with jupier, which, according to Cotgrave, is an old word signifying, to hoot, shoat, cree out a load. The French word juper, jupier, also spelt japier, had the same meaning, and we find it employed in the chase do surf, for a hello in hunting in a similar way to jopai in our text. Edipus jupi o u corn i. Lonk emoti. Chalkins en a joaca eloti. In the sense it is used in our Master of Game, page 185, it means to hello to the hounds, to encourage them with the voice. Canets, small hounds. Kennet is a diminutive form of the Norman French Kennet, and the O, F, Chen, Cyanites, Chenet, a dog, Ivenier, a two Cyanites, Nemia grands mes petites, E plus blands K ne flores d'espine, Percival, 22895. Derived from the Latin canis, see appendix, harriers. Ligging, a bed, a resting place, a lair. From O, E, N, G, Licken, Lichian, Goth, Ligan, Lie, Lie Down. The ligging of the heart was what we now call his lair, spelt also lair. In our MS. It is used for the dwelling of a wild cat, page 71. This old expression is not entirely obsolete, but can be heard still among the country people of the northern counties of England. Limer, Limer. The name given to a scenting hound which was held in a liam or leash whilst tracking the game. Limers never were any distinct breed of hounds, but, of course, some breeds produced better limers than others, than Warmont, Volume 2. Page 350. A dog used as a limer had to be keen on the scent, staunch on the line, not too fast, and was taught to run mute, for if the exact whereabouts of any game had to be discovered, it would have been impossible. If the hound gave tongue or challenged while on the scent. A likely hound was chosen from the kennel at an early age, G. de F. says at a year old, page 157, and from that time accompanied his master, sleeping in his room, and being taught to obey him. He was continually taken out by his master with collar and liam and encouraged to follow the scent of hinds and of stags and other beasts, and punished should he venture to acknowledge the scent of any animal he was not being entered to. Or should he open on finding or following the line? In England as well as on the continent the huntsman went out in the early morning to track the game to be hunted to its lair, or den, before the pack and huntsman came into the field. Deer, wild boar, bear and wolves were thus harbored by means of a limer. Twice I makes the apprentice huntsman ask, now I wish to know how many of the beasts are moved by the limer, and how many of the beasts are found by branches. Sir, all those which are chased are moved by a limer, and all those which are hunted up, and quillas, are found by the Bratches, twice I, page 12, see appendix, Aquilas. Limers were not only employed when a warrantable stag was to be hunted by hounds, but a huntsman going out with his bow or crossbow would have his brachet on a liam and let him hunt up the quarry he wished to shoot, see appendix, burslet. Also, the day before one of the large battues for big game, the limers would be taken out to ascertain what game there was in the district to be driven. A liam, liom, or liam, was a rope made of silk or leather by which hounds were led, from O, F. Liamen, a strap or line, Latin ligamen. This strap was fastened to the collar by a swivel, and both collar and liams were often very gorgeous. We read of, a liam of white silk with collar of white velvet embroidered with pearls, the swivel of silver. Dog colors of crimson velvet with six liams of white leather. A leam of green and white silka. Three liams and colors with turret of silver and quilt, madden, expenses of Princess Mary. A hound was said to carry his liam well when he just kept it at proper tension, not straining it, for that would show that he was of too eager temperament, and likely to overshoot the line. If he trailed his liam on the ground, it showed that he was slack or unwilling, Javil. 
As soon as the stag was moved the limer's work was over, but only for the time being. His master led him away, the other hounds were uncoupled, and the harbour, mounting his horse and keeping his limer with him, rode as close to the chase as he could, skirting below the wind and being careful not to cross the line. But managing to be at hand in case the stag should run in company or give the hounds the change. In this case the huntsman had to check the hounds, and wait for the harbour and limer to come up and unravel the change, and put the pack on the right scent once more. The method of starting the stag with a limer was not done away with in France until the 18th century, although in Normandy a change had been made previously, and probably in England also. For our author says that some sportsmen even in his time, when impatient, would uncouple a few of the hounds in the covert, before the stag had been properly started by the limer, which practice he, however, was not in favor of except under the conditions he mentions. This uncoupling of a few older hounds in covert to start the deer, coupling them again as soon as the deer was on foot, was later called tufting, and is still customary in Devon and Somerset. The limer was not rewarded with the other hounds. He received his reward from the hands of his master before or after the other hounds, and after he had bayed the head of the stag. When not quoting or translating the old text the more modern spelling of limer has been used. Madness Olding and mid eng woodness, wadness, and wadness, mad, woad. The seven different sorts of madnesses spoken of by the master of game are also mentioned in nearly all subsequent works on old hunting dealing with sicknesses of hounds. They are the hot burning madness, running madness, dumb madness, lank madness, rheumatic madness or slavering madness, falling madness, sleeping madness. These are mentioned in Roy Modus and the cure for rabies, of taking the afflicted dog to the sea and letting nine waves wash over him, as well as the cock cure mentioned in our English MS. Were both taken by Gaston from Roy Modus, or both derived them from some common source, Roy Modus, Folios XLV. R. The water cure is mentioned also by Albertus Magnus, Alb Mag, 215, a 27. It seems likely to have been to try the efficacy of this cure that King Edward I sent some of his hounds to Dover to bathe in the sea, the following account for which is entered in his wardrobe accounts. To John Luberner. Going to Dover to bathe six brachas by the king's order and for staying there for twenty-one days for his expense three. 6 d. 6 Edward I quoted from M. S. Phillips, 8676. The means of recognizing rabies by a cock is also mentioned in the recipe of the 11th century given by Avicenna, 957-1037, and it appears again in Vincentius Bellovicensis and is also to be found in Alexander Neckham. Although the manner of using the cock for this purpose varies, we see by the fact of its being mentioned in different works preceding our MS that the cock enjoyed some legendary renown for at least a couple of centuries before Gaston, Worth, P. 55. Nowadays only two varieties of rabies are recognized, furious and dumb rabies. The numerous divisions of the old authors were based on different stages of the disease and slight variations in the symptoms. When a dog is attacked with rabies its owner often supposes that the dog has a bone in its throat, so that a report of this condition is regarded by veterinary surgeons with suspicion. This corresponds with the description in our text of dogs, with their mouths somewhat gaping, as if they were enosed in their throat. Mastiff from F. Matif, O. F. Mestiff, M. E. Mastiff, Mestiff, Mixed Breed, a Mongrel Dog, Sent Dictionary, Murray. Some etymologists have suggested that the word Mastiff was derived from Massa Thieves, as these dogs protected their masters' houses and cattle from thieves, Man Wood, page 113. Others again give Mastinus, i.e. Maison tenant, house dog, as the origin, but the first derivation given of Mestiff, mongrel, is the one now generally recognized. Although it will be quite evident to anyone comparing the Mastiff depicted in our plate, p. 122, with any picture of the British Mastiff that the two are very different types, we must not therefore conclude that the artist was at fault, but that the French Madden, which is what our M.S describes and depicts, was by no means identical with our present English breed of mastiffs, 
nor even with the old British Mastiff or Bandog. The French Maddens were generally big, hardy dogs, somewhat light in the body, with long heads, pointed muzzles, flattened forehead, and semi-pendant ears, some were rough and others smooth-coated. Maddens were often used for tackling the wild boar when run by other hounds, so as to save the more valuable ones when the boar turned to bay. In this chase, as well as when they were used to protect their master's flocks against wolves, huge iron spiked collars were fastened round the dog's neck. These spiked collars were very formidable affairs. One of very ancient make which I have measures inside nearly 8 inches in diameter, and the 48 spikes are an inch long, the whole weighing without the padlock that fastened it together about 2 pounds. In England the name Mastiff was not in general use till a much later date, even as late as the end of the 18th century, Osbaldiston in his dictionary ignoring the term Mastiff, and using, like a true Saxon, the old term Bandog, Win, page 72. In the 17th and 18th centuries the terms were generally synonymous, and it seems quite possible that the Mastiff of the ancient forest laws was not our Bandog, but denoted, as in France. Any large house dog capable of defending his master and his master's goods, watching his cattle, and, as frequently necessary, powerful enough to attack the depredatory wolf or the wild boar. These would in all likelihood be a very mixed breed, and thoroughly justify the name Mastiff or Mongrel. Cotgrave in his French-English dictionary gives the following. Mastin, a mastiu, or bandog, a great country cur. Also a rude, filthy, currish or cruel fellow. We find the word matin in France used as a term of opprobrium, or a name of contempt for any ugly or distorted body or a coarse person, says un matin, un vilain matin. Many interesting facts about the mastiff have been collected by Jesse in his History of the British Dog. But he also makes the mistake of considering that the Master of Game and Turbervile give us the description of the dogs then existing in England, whereas these descriptions really relate only to French breeds. Although the characteristics may in many cases have tallied sufficiently. But in others a dire confusion has resulted from blindly copying from one another. Mean, from Latin minar, something which is led, a following. This word frequently occurs in the medieval romances, and usually denoted pursuit, either in battle or in the hunting field, Borman, page 37. There are various meanings attached to Mani. The line of flight the stag or other game has taken, and chasier la Mani seems to have meant hunting with horn and hound by scent on the line of flight. In contradiction to the chase with the bow or crossbow, which was called berzer, lo Roman de Lorraines, 106, c. 30, in G, de F, page 157, it is used in the same sense. The meaning in which Gaston de Foy uses the word mani is explained by him, e pus s e meter apre, e chevachir mani, se a dire par o les chiens et le surfant, g, de f, pp. 43, 44, 171, 179. See also chase do surf and hard. De font. Gewer. Edit. Pichon. The challenge of the hound when on the line. Page 171, we read that a hunter should know whether the hounds have retrieved their stag by the doubling of their mani, i.e. the hounds would make more noise as soon as they found the scent or line of flight of the stag they were chasing. Mani evidently meant the sound made by the hound when actually following the scent, not when baying the game. Later the sense seems to have been widened, and a musical hound was said to have La Manie Belle, Salnove, page 246. A note sounded on a horn, see appendix, hunting music. It was the signal that the deer was in full flight. It appears to be used in twice eye to signify the horn signal blown when the hounds are on the scent of heart, boar or wolf, to press the hounds onwards, twice eye, page 23. This author says one cannot blow the mani for the hare, because it is at one time female and another male, and to this Dryden in his notes remarks that twice I is perfectly right in saying a man ought not to blow the mani for a hare. For as every one knows, it is but a rare occurrence for a hare to go straight on end like a fox, for they commonly double and run rings, in which case if the hounds were pressed, they would overrun the scent and probably lose the hare. 
but he does not explain why twice I says if it were always male the mani could be blown at it as at other beasts, such as the heart, the boar, and the wolf. Is it that a male hare will occasionally run along, straight course of several miles, but that the female runs smaller rings and more constantly retraces her steps, and therefore the mani could never be blown at her? Mani was also used in the sense of a signal on a horn. The master of game says the many should be sounded on the return of the huntsman at the hall or cellar door, page 179. There was a curious old custom which occasioned the blowing of the horn in Westminster Abbey. Two menies were blown at the high altar of the abbey on the delivery there of eight fallow deer which Henry III had by charter granted as a yearly gift to the abbot of Westminster and his successors. Matinge here evidently means meeting or feeding. As the master of game says, or pasturing, as if the two words were synonymous, as metinga also was mid bang. For measure, it might have been a deer of high measure and pasturing. But anyhow, the two were practically identical, for as twice I says, hearts which are of good pasture. For the head grows according to the pasture. Good or otherwise. See below, mute. Mute had several meanings in Old French venere. The master of game translated G. de F. S. Grant Cerf as a heart of high feeding or pasture. But he omitted to render the following passage, E. S. I. L. S. de Bon Mute. Alon's le laisse cour. The bon mute is not translated by high meeting. It was an expression in use to indicate whether the stag was in good company or not. If a warrantable stag was accompanied by one or two large stags, he was termed unserf de bon mute or mute, but if hinds and young stags, rascal, were with him, he was designated as a serf de mauvaise mute. In Roy Modus, we read, La première est de savoir sil est de bon mute. Perhaps mute when used in this sense was derived from the old Norman word moida, mita, from mot, meet, come together. There was also an old ang. Word meta or gemeta, companion. Mute was also used in another sense which is translated by the master of game as haunts, probably the place the deer usually moves in. G. Says, il prendra conge de sa mute, and the master of game has, he leaves his haunts. If a deer was harbored in a good country for hunting he was also called en bel mute, djavil, vak. Mute. It was in this sense that the Seneschal de Normandie answers the question of his royal mistress about the stag he himself had harbored that morning, he tells her the stag was en bel mute et pays fort. Mute, mute, a number of hounds, now called a pack or kennel of hounds or a cry of hounds. Me w, mu, to shed, cast, or change. The heart mews his horns, the deer casts his head, or sheds his antlers. From the French muir, and the Latin mutare, to change, of hawks to molt. Move, meu, mew, me we, meve, old forms of move. To start a heart signified to unharbor him, to start him from his lair. G. de F. says, Alons le laisse cour. But the word meu or meve was also used in Old French in the same way as in English. Twice I says, or vaudroy ioe savoir quantes de bet sunt mus de limer, e quans de best sunt trus de brache. Sire, tus sos qe sunt in chases. Sunt mus de limer. E tu sos inquilas sunt troves de brache. Now I would wish to know how many beasts are moved by a limer and how many beasts are found by the brachas. Sir, all those which are chased are moved by a limer. And all those which are hunted up are found by brachas. Line 18, Tristan, I, 4337, Pardonopius de Blois, 607. Muse, Muse. An opening in a fence through which a hare or other animal is accustomed to pass. An old proverb says, "'Tis as hard to find a hare without a muse, as a woman without skews. A hare will pass by the same muses until her death or escape, Blom, page 92. Numbles, M. E. Numbles, Numbles, O. F. Numbles. The parts of a deer between the thighs, that is to say, the liver and kidneys and entrails. Part, and sometimes the whole of the numbless were considered the right of the huntsman. 
sometimes the huntsman only got the kidneys, and the rest was put aside with the titbits reserved for the king or chief personage, Turb, pages 128 to 129. Numless by loss of the initial letter became Umbles, Harrison, Volume 1, p. 309, and was sometimes written Humbles, whence came Humble Pie, now only associated with the word humble. Humble pie was a pie made of the umbles or numless of the deer, and formerly at hunting feasts was set before the huntsman and his followers. Otter, the Duke of York does not tell us anything of the chase of the otter, but merely refers one at the end of the chapter on, the nature of the otter, to Milbourne, the king's otter hunter, for more information and says. As of all other vermin I speak not, p. 73 the otter was evidently beneath his notice, as being neither regarded as a beast of venery nor of the chase, Tweedy and Gifford, Brit. Muse M.S. Vesp. B. 12. But the very fact that the king had an otter hunter shows that it was a beast not altogether despised, although probably hunted more for the value of its skin and for the protection of the fish than for the sport. The Melbourne referred to by the Duke of York can scarcely be any other than the William Melbourne we find mentioned in Henry IV's reign as Valet of our Otterhounds, Privy Seal, 674-6456, February 18, 1410. Parfit, the Perfect. Twice I says, un autre chas i l y ad q e um appeal le parfait. Donkeys coviant i l q e vous cornies en autre manerie. E isi cheskin um kest en tour vu, k si de venery puet canuster en quel point vu estis en voster de dut par voster corner, line 111. From comparing the various places where the word parfait is employed in connection with hunting, it may be concluded that to hunt the parfait was when the hounds were on the line of the right stag. To sound the parfait was to blow the notes that indicated the hounds were hunting the right line. Dryden in his notes to Twice I suggests that the chase of the parfait was, in opposition to the chase of the furloin, that is, when the pack run well together, jostling in close array, Twice I, page 43. But perfect in the O, F. Work seems to us to invariably be used, as already said, to indicate that the hounds have not taken the change, but are staunch to the right scent. Jacques de Brise says the stag he is hunting joins two great stags, but although some of the hounds ran silent for a while, they still continued staunch to their line, and here he uses the word parfait, senior de nor, page 13. Modus also uses it in this sense, les chiens que viennent chacun après le parfait, folios 19. V. And what is most conclusive is the sense given to it in our text, should blow to him again the parfait so that he were in his rights and Ellis not, i.e. the parfait should only be blown if the hound was on the right line, page 174. Parfaitiers, the name given in the master of game, to the last relay of hounds uncoupled during the chase of the stag. First came the vaunt chase, and then the middle, and then the parfaitiers. They may have been so called from being the last hounds to be uncoupled, being those that completed or perfected the pack, i.e. Perfectors, or this relay may have derived its name from being composed of some of the staunchest hounds from the kennel, those not likely to follow any but the right line or the parfait. It was customary in the old days to keep some of the slower and staunchest hounds in the last relay, and to cast them only when a stag nearing its end rused and foiled, and sought by every means to shake off his persecutors, see appendix, relays. G. de F. gives the names of the three relays simply as La Premier Buddley, La Seconde, and La Tierce, page 175. Pummeled, spotted, from O. F. Pomili, spotted like an apple. The young of the Roeder are born with a reddish brown coat with white spots, which the master of game calls pummeled. This term was also frequently used in Ong, N. O. F. And in the dog Latin of our ancient records to describe a flea bitten or dappled horse. His hakinii that was all pummeli gri, strat. Pummeli liardis, gri pummel, uno equo liardo pummeli, OBS ward. ACC, 28, ed. I. G. de F. Does not use this word in describing the young of the roe deer, but says they are born eschiquettes, page 40. Ratches, ratches, or racks, a dog that hunts by scent. 
A. S. Rec, a hound, and O. F. and on, N. Brache, Brachet, Bracon, Braquet, Gur. Bracken. On, Lat, Brachetis, Brachetis. Ratches were scenting hounds hunting in a pack, later called running hounds, and then simply hounds. Although ratches or brachets are frequently mentioned in the O, F, and on, N. Metrical romances, and in various early documents, we have never found any description of them, but can only gather what they were from the uses they were put to. We find that the Braco was used by the early German tribes to track criminals, therefore they were scenting hounds. There is plenty of evidence that they were used for stag, wild boar, and buck hunting during the Middle Ages. They were coupled together and led by a burner or brassineer or braconeer. Braconeer now means poacher, but this is only the later meaning, originally braconeer was the leader of the Bracos, or huntsman, Doral, page 337, Bangert, page 173, Dole. 9188. We gather that these brachets of the early Middle Ages were small hounds, sometimes entirely white, but generally white with black markings. Sometimes they were mottled, bracet mortar. One description of a brace's corrent says this hound was as white as a nut, with black ears, a black mark on the right flank, and flecked with black, Blancadin, 1271, Perk. 17,555, 22,585, Tristan M., 1475, 2261, Tylet, 332. In the early days in England we find that bratches were used to hunt up such smaller game as was not unharbored or dislodged by the limer. Twice I says, sire, to his sows qe sunt in chases, sunt mus de limer. E2 sows inquilas sunt troves de brache, see appendix, aquilas, i.e. All beasts that are enchased are moved by a limer, and all those that are hunted up are found by bratches, twice I, pages 2, 12. Ratches are mentioned in the Book of Sti. Albans, among the divers manure of hounds, and the apprentice to Veneri is told he should speak of a mute of hounds, a canal of ratches. He is also informed that the hart, the buck, and the boar should be started by a limer, and that all other bests that hunted shall be sought for and found by ratches so free. John Harding in his Chronicle, speaking of an inroad into Scotland by Edward IV in whose reign he was yet living, said, and take kennets and ratches with you and seek at all the forest with hounds and horns as King Edward with the long shanks died. In the squire of low degree we read that the huntsman came with his bugles and seven score ratches at his rechase. Receiver, the word the most approaching this to be found in any dictionary is under the head of receiver, m, e. Receiver, one who, or that which receives. The receivers were most likely those greyhounds who received the game, i.e. pulled it down after it had been chased. We see in our text that teasers and receivers are mentioned together, page 198. The former were light, swift greyhounds, these were probably slipped first, and the latter, surely M.S. spells restainers, were the heavy greyhounds slipped last and capable of pulling down a big stag. De Noirmont tells us, C.E.S. Derniers Etain Surnoms Receveres O.U. Receveres, 2. Page 426, and G. De F., page 177. Relays, in the early days of Veneri the whole pack was not allowed to hunt at the commencement of the chase. After the stag had been started from his lair by a limer, some hounds were uncoupled and laid on, the rest being divided off into relays, which were posted in charge of one or more burners along the probable line of the stag, and were uncoupled when the hunted stag and the hounds already chasing him had passed. There were usually three relays, and two to four couples the usual number in each relay, though the number of couples depended, of course, on the size of the hunting establishment and the number of hounds in the kennel. G. De F. calls these relays simply, premier, second, and tierce. The master of game calls the first lot of hounds uncoupled the finders, p. 165, though this seems rather a misnomer, as the harbor with his limer, c. limer, found and started the deer. The Vaughn chase for the first relay, and the middle speak for themselves, b. 
but we have little clue to the origin of parfaitiers for the third relay. Were they so called because they perfected or completed the chase, or because they were some of the staunchest hounds who could be depended upon to follow the parfit, i.e. the right line of the stag or animal hunted? See Appendix, Parfit. Old authorities seem to have differed in opinion as to whether the staunchest and slowest hound should have been put in the first cry or in the last, Roy Modus, Folio 16, G. de F., page 178, Lav, Chas a Cour, pages 297-8. In the, Boca of Esti. Albans, we read of the Vauntlay, Relay, and Allay. The first was the name given to hounds if they were uncoupled and thrown off between the pack and the beast pursued, the relay were the hounds uncoupled after the hounds already hunting had passed by. The allay is held. Till all the hounds that be behind become thirto. Then let thyn hounds all together go. That is called an allay. Instructions concerning when relays should be given always warn the burner not to let slip the couples till some of the surest hounds have passed on the scent. Until he be sure that the stag they are hunting is the right one and not a substitute, I. E. One frightened and put up by the hunted stag. The master of game is careful also to say, Take care that thou vaunt lay not. Page 169. The discontinuing of relays seem to have been begun first in Normandy and probably about the same time in England. In France, the three relays of greyhounds which were used were called levriers d'estric, i.e., those which were first let slip. Levriers de flank, those that attacked from the side and levriers de tete, those that bar the passage in front of the game or head it, terms that correspond with our vauntlay, allay, and relay. In the, Master of Games, chapter on the wolf these relays of greyhounds are indicated, page 59. Riot, the, Master of Games, statement on p. 74 that no other wild beast in England is called riot save the coney only has called forth many suggestions as to the origin of this name being applied to the rabbit, and the connection between riot, a noise or brawl, and the rabbit. The word riot is represented in M E N O F by riot, in Pluro V Riota, Ital Riata, and in all these languages it had the same signification, i.e. a brawl, a dispute, an uproar, a quarrel, skeet. Diaz conjectures the F. Riot to stand for rivot, and refers to O H G ribbon, G ribbon, to great, to rub, originally perhaps to writhe, to rend. From German, sich an einem Reiben, to mock, to attack, to provoke one, lit. To rub oneself against one. Rabbit, which is in O. Dutch Rob, has probably the same origin from Reiben. The etymology and connection, if any, between the two words rabbit and riot is difficult to determine. It is very probable that the rabbit was called riot from producing a brawling when the hounds came across one. The term, running riot, may well be derived from a hunting phrase. ROE, the error regarding the October rut into which G, the F. And the Duke of York fell was one to which the naturalists of much later time subscribed, for it was left to Dr. Ziegler and to Dr. Bischoff, the professor of physiology at Heidelberg, to demonstrate in 1843 the true history of the gestation of the roe, which for more than a century had been a hotly disputed problem. On that occasion it was shown with scientific positiveness that the true rut of the roe takes place about the end of July or first week in August, and that the ovum does not reach the uterus for several months. So that the first development of the embryo does not commence before the middle of December. Running hounds and ratches, F. Chien's Currants, under this heading we include all such dogs as hunted by scent in packs, whatever the game they pursued might be. They appear in the early records of our kings as Cain's Demoda, Cain's Currants, and as Susos, scenting hounds, close rolls 7 John, Mag, Rot. 4, John Rot. 10, 4 Henry III. And are mentioned specifically as Cerverisius, Diamorisius, as Hyrectorum, Harriers, or Cain's Arets, and Foxhounds as Gupularetus or Wolparisius, close rolls, 15 John. The Anglo-Saxon word hundas, hound, was a general name for any dog. The dog for the chase in Anglo-Saxon times being distinguished by the prefix ren, making ren hund. Gradually the word dog superseded the word hound, 
and the latter was only retained to designate a scenting dog. Dr. Caius, writing to Dr. Gessner, remarks in his book, Thus much also understand, that as in your language hund is the common word, so in our natural tongue dog is the universal, but hund is particular and especial. For it signifieth such a dog only as serveth to hunt, Caius, p. 40, see Appendix, Ratches. Running Hounds was a very literal translation of the French Chien's Courants, and as the descriptive chapter given in our text is as literal a rendering from G to F. There is no information that helps us to piece together the ancestry of the modern English hound. We do not know what breed were in the royal kennels in the reign of Henry IV. But probably some descendants of those brought to this country by the Normans, about the origin of which breed nothing seems known. Keep of Hounds the usual cost of the keep of a hound at the time of our MS. Was a halfpenny a day, of a greyhound three farthings, and of a limer or bloodhound one penny a day. However for the royal heart hounds an allowance of three farthings a day was made for each hound, Q, R, A, C, C. 1407, and we also find occasionally that only a halfpenny a day was made for the keep of a greyhound. In Edward I.S. Reign a halfpenny a day was the allowance made for fox and otterhounds, 14, 15, 31, 32, 34, Edward I, Ward. A.C.C. And sometimes three farthings and sometimes a halfpenny a day for a greyhound. The master of buckhounds was allowed a halfpenny a day each for his hounds and greyhounds. In the reign of Richard III. The master of heart hounds was allowed threes. 3d. A day for the meat of forty dogs and twelve greyhounds and threepence a day for three limers, rolls of parl, volume 5, page 16. The Boke of Curtisi, 14th century, Percy Society, 4. p. 26, gives us information which quite agrees with the payments entered in the wardrobe and other accounts of the king's hunting establishment. And under the head of the pistor we find the baker is told to make loaves for the hounds. Manchet and Chet to make brown bread hard. For Chandler and Greyhounds and Hunt's reward. Chet, a word not in use since the 17th century, meant wheaten bread of the second quality, made of flour more coarsely sifted than that used for Manchet, which was the finest quality. Brown bread was oaten bread, and probably was very much the same as a modern dog biscuit. One of the ancient feudal rites was that of obtaining bran from the vassals for the hound's bread, known as the rite of Brennage, from bren, bran. Although bread was the staple food given to hounds, yet they were also provided with meat. At the end of a day's hunting they received a portion of the game killed, see curie, and if this was not sufficient or it was not the hunting season game was expressly killed for them. In a decree from King John to William Pertell and the bailiffs of Falk de Broad of the Isle of Ely, the latter are commanded to find bread and paste for the hounds as they may require. And to let them hunt sometimes in the bishop's chase for the flesh upon which they are fed, close roll, 17 John. In an extract from the wardrobe accounts of 6 Edward I, we find a payment was made of forties. By the king to one Bernard King for his quarry for two years past on which the king's dogs had been fed, M. S. Phillips, 8676. We find also that, pantries, chippings and broken bread, were given to the hounds, chippings being frequently mentioned in the royal accounts as well as meat for the hounds, Liber Niger Domus ed. 4. Collection of Ordinances of the Royal Households, Jesse, 2. 125, Privy Purse Expenses Henry VIII. 1529-1532. The cost of the keep of some of the king's hounds were paid for out of the exchequer, others were paid from the revenues and outgoings of various counties. And an immense number were kept by subjects who held land from the crown by sergeantry or in capite of keeping a stated number of running hounds, greyhounds, and brachets, and for the king's use, blunts ancient tenures, plaque. Cron, 12, 13 ed. I, issue roll 25 Henry VI, Doomsday, Tom. I, folios 57 v. We see by the early records of our kings that a pack of hounds did not always remain stationary and hunt within easy reach of their kennels. 
but were sent from one part of the kingdom to another to hunt where game was most plentiful or where there was most vermin to be destroyed. As early as Edward I.S. reign we find conveyances were sometimes provided for hounds when they went on long journeys. Thomas de Candor or Candivir and Robert Le Sanzer, also called Salsar, Huntsman of the Stag and Buckhounds, Close Rolls 49 Henry III, 6, 8 ed. I. Were paid for a horse litter for fifty-nine days for the use of their sixty-six hounds and five limers, Ward. ACC, 14, 15 ed. I. And as late as Henry VIII's time the hounds seemed to travel about considerable distances, as in the privy purse expenses of that king the cart covered with canvas for the use of his hounds is a frequently recurring item. Scantolin O. F. Escantolin, Mid. Ang. Scantolin, Mod. E. N. G. Scantling, Mason's Rule, A Measure. The huntsman is continually told to take a scantolin, that is, a measure, of the slot or footprint of the deer, so as to be able to show it at the meat. That with this measure and the examination of the droppings which the huntsman was also to bring with him the master of the game could judge if the man had harbored a warrantable deer, see appendix, slot and trace. Seasons of hunting, in medieval times the consideration for the larder played a far more important part in fixing the seasons for hunting wild beasts than it did in later times, the object being to kill the game when in the primest condition. Beginning with the Red Deer Stag, according to Dryden's Twice I, page 24, source not given, the season began at the Nativity of St. John the Baptist, June 24, and ended Holy Red Day, September 14. Our text of the Master of Game nowhere expressly states when the stag hunting begins or terminates, but as he speaks of how to judge a heart from its fumes in the month of April and May, p. 30, and further says that hearts run best from the entry of May into St. John's Tide, page 35, we might infer that they were hunted from May on. He also says that the season for hind hunting begins when the season of the heart ends and lasteth till Lent. But as this part of the book was a mere translation from G. de F., it is no certain guide to the hunting seasons in England. The stag hunting season in France, the Surveison, as it was called, began at the Saint Croix de Mai, May 3, and lasted to La Saint Croix de Septembre, Holy Red Day, September 14, the old French saying being, Me Mai, Me Test, Me Juin, Me Grace. A la Magdalene Vinaise en Plain, July 22, Menagier de Paris, too. And although the stag was probably chiefly hunted in England between midsummer and the middle of September, when they are in the best condition, and it was considered the best time to kill them, they were probably hunted from May on in the early days in England as they were in France. Had this not been customary, we imagine the Duke of York would have inserted one of his little interpolations in the text he was translating, and stated that although the season began in May beyond the sea, it only began later in England. In Tweedy and Gifford we read that the time of Greece beginneth all our way at the fest of the nativite of St. Johann Baptist. Later on, according to Dryden, the season of the stag began two weeks after midsummer, July 8. Red Deer Hind, Holy Red Day, September 14, to Candlemas, February 2, Twice I, page 24, Man, page 181. According to others the hind and the doe season ends on Twelfth Day or Epiphany, January 6. Fallow Deer Buck According to the forest laws the season began at the Nativity of St. John, June 24, and ended on Holy Red Day, September 14. Dryden adds a second date, i.e. two weeks after midsummer, to the former, but does not quote the source. Fallow doe was hunted from Holy Red Day, September 14, to Candlemas, February 2. Roe deer buck was hunted from Easter to Michaelmas, September 29. Roe doe, Michaelmas to Candlemas. Hare. According to the forest laws, man. 176, the season commenced Michaelmas, September 29, and ended at midsummer, June 24, Dryden in his notes in Twice I states that it commenced at Michaelmas and ended at Candlemas, February 2, while the Boak of St. Albans gives the same date as the first named in Manwood. According to the Master of Game, the hare seems to have enjoyed no close season, as G. de F. 
S. Assertion that the hunting of the hare lasteth all the year is also translated without comment. Page 14 et le put chassier tout elani, en quelque temps que ce soit quoi tous jours essay saison dur, g de f, page 204. In Tweedy and Gifford we also find that the hare is always in season to be chassied. In the 16th century in France the hare hunting season was from the middle of September till the middle of April, du fullis, page 51, de noir, 2. Page 476. In England the same season seems to have been observed, Blome, page 91. Wild boar. According to the forest laws, Manwood and Twiceye, the boar was hunted from Christmas Day to Candlemas, February. 2. But we have evidence that boar hunting usually began earlier. The boar was in his prime condition when acorns, beech mast, and chestnuts were plentiful, and was considered in season from Michaelmas to St. Martin's Day, Roy Modus, 31. And by some even from Holyrood Day, Bornham, page 100, part, de Blois, 525. The huntsmen of King John of England were sent to hunt in the forest of Knapp in order to take two or three boars a day in November. King John's letter giving instructions on this point to one Roland Bloat is dated November 8, 1215, Jesse, 2. 32. Wolf. According to the forest laws, in the book already quoted, the season during which the wolf was hunted began at Christmas and ended at the Annunciation, March 25th. But considering the destruction wrought by this beast it is far more likely that it was hunted throughout the year. Fox. According to the forest laws the season opened on Christmas Day and ended on March 25th, but nevertheless the fox was hunted early in the autumn. For we have it on Tweedy and Gifford's authority that, the sea sound of the fox beginneth at the nativite of Our Lady, and dureth till the Annunciation, September. 8 to March 25th. The, Book of St. Albans, gives the season of the fox and wolf from the nativity to the Annunciation of Our Lady and that of the boar from the nativity to the purification of Our Lady. Manwood and other accepted authorities quote the above as alluding to the nativity of Christ, whereas the nativity of Our Lady, September 8, was intended, thereby creating some confusion. According to the wardrobe accounts of Edward I. The fox hunting season began on September 1st, Ward. ACC, ed. I, 1299-1300. No doubt one of the reasons why the fox was not hunted earlier in the year was on account of the fur, which was of course of less use or value if obtained in summer. Otter. The forest laws give the season as from Shrove Tide, February 22, to Midsummer, June 24, but we find that in King John's reign the otter was hunted in July, close rolls 14 John I. Martin, badger, and rabbit were hunted at all seasons of the year. Snares, no work dealing with the chase of wild animals in medieval times would be complete were it to omit all reference to snares, traps, gins, pitfalls, and other devices to take game other than by hunting. The master of game mentions the subject but briefly, saying, truly I trow no good hunter would slay them so for no good. But, Gaston Phoebus, contains seventeen short chapters in which the author as well as the miniaturist describe the various contrivances then in use, although the same disdain of these unsportsmanlike methods is expressed by G. De F. that marks the Duke of York's pages. In the first edition of the present work will be found descriptions of the principal snares used in the Middle Ages. Spaniel, it is difficult to say at what date these dogs were first introduced into our country, we only know that by the second half of the 16th century Spaniels were a common dog in England. In Dr. Caius's time the breed was, in full being. He mentions land Spaniels, setters, and water Spaniels, besides the small Spaniels which were kept as pet and lap dogs. That the breed was not then a recent importation we may infer from the fact that, when speaking of the water Spaniel and giving the derivation of the name, Dar. Caius says, not that England wanted such kind of dogs, for they are naturally bred and engendered in this country. But because they bear the general and common name of these dogs since the time when they were first brought over out of Spain. The chapter in the T Master of Game on this dog, being translated from G to F, unfortunately throws no light on the history of the Spaniel in England, 
although we imagine that, had there been no such hounds in our island at the time. The Duke would have made some such remark as he has in other parts of his book of there being a manner of hound as men have beyond the sea, but not as we have here in England. In his time the Spaniel had enjoyed popularity in France for some two centuries. And there was such continual communication between France and England in the 14th and 15th centuries that it would have been indeed strange if this most useful dog for the then favorite and universal sport of hawking had not been brought to England long before his time. We may conclude that the gentle hounds for the hawk, of which he speaks in his prologue were not spaniels. Spay, the usual meaning of this word, castrating females, given in all dictionaries is clearly inapplicable on this occasion, p. 174, where it undoubtedly means killing a stag with a sword, probably derived from the Italian spada. When the velvet was once off the antlers the stag at bay was usually dispatched with the bow, for it was then dangerous to approach him close enough to do so with the sword. When achieved by bold hunters, as it occasionally was, it was accounted a feat of skill and courage. Stables O. F. Bestably, a garrison, a station. Huntsmen and kennelmen with hounds in leash, whose duty it was to take up a post or stand assigned to them during the chase, were called stables. We have stabilitions venationis that are mentioned in Doomsday, I, Folios 56b and Folios 252. In Ellis's introduction to Doomsday he says, stabilitio meant stalling the deer. To drive the deer and other game from all quarters to the center of a gradually contracted circle where they were compelled to stand, was Stabilitio. Malmesbury, Scriptors, Post Bedam, Edit. 1596, p. 44, speaking of the mildness of Edward the Confessor's temper, says, Dum quadam vice venatum iset, et agrestis quidem stabulata illa, cabus in casas servia genter, confutisit, al sua nobili prositus ira, per deum, in quit. Et mat rem aegis tantundum tibi nocebo, si potero, ellis, i. 112. We see, however, at a later date from twice i and the master of game, that the watchers or stables they allude to were stationary, and did not drive the game as described in above. These stations of huntsmen and hounds were placed at intervals round the quarter of the forest to be driven or hunted in with hounds to move the game, so that the hounds could be slipped at any game escaping. Sometimes they were to make a noise, and thus blench or head the game back. In French such a chase was called a chasse à titer, lave, 28, the word titer meaning net or tape, but in this case used figuratively. Our master of game evidently placed these stations to keep the game within the boundaries so as to force it to pass the stand of the king. Twice I describes these stations of huntsmen, using the word estably. The bounds are those which are set up of archers, and of greyhounds, lefers et de estably, and watchers, and on that account I have blown one moot and reheated on the hounds. You hunter, do you wish to follow the chase? Yes, if that beast should be one that is hunted up, enquily, or chased I will follow it. If so it should happen that the hounds should be gone out of bounds then I wish to blow a moot and stroke after my hounds to have them back, twice I, page 6. It was the duty of certain tenants to attend the king's hunts and act as part of the stable. In Hereford one person went from each house to the stand or station in the wood at the time of the survey, general introduction doomsday, Ellis, I, 195. From Shrewsbury the principal burgesses who had horses attended the king when he went hunting, and the sheriff sent thirty-six men on foot to the deer stand while the king remained there. Stable stand was the place where these stables were posted or set, and the word was also used to denote the place where archers were posted to shoot at driven game. Such stands were raised platforms in some drive or on some boundary of the forest, sometimes erected between the branches of a tree, so that the sportsmen could be well hidden. A good woodcut of what was probably intended to represent a stand, is in the first edition of Turberville's Arte of Venery, representing Queen Elizabeth receiving her huntsman's report. There is no mention made of raised stands in our text, but with or without such erections the position taken up by the shooters to await the game was called his standing or tryst, and a bower of branches was made. To shelter the occupant from sun and rain, as well as to hide him from the game. 
Such arbors were called berceau or berceau in Old French, from the word berzer, to shoot with a bow and arrow, they were also called ramires and folies, from rames or branches, and folia, leaves, with which they were made or disguised, noir, 3. Page 354. Manwood tells us that stable stand was one of four manners in which if a man were found, in the forest, he could be arrested as a poacher or trespasser, and says, stable stand is where one is found at his standing ready to shoot at any deer. Or standing close by a tree with greyhounds in his leash ready to let slip, man. Page 193. Stanks or lays, tanks or pools, large mirrors. Gaston says, Estanks idiotras mars o u mars, g de f, page 21. Stank house was a moated house. A ditch or moat filled with water was called a tank. Tach or tech, mid bang. For a habit, especially a bad habit, vice, freak, caprice, behavior, from the o f tach, a spot, a stain, or blemish, also a disgrace, a blot on a man's good name. In the older use it was applied both to good as well as bad qualities, as in our text. T.A.W. to makes hides into leather, Tor, the maker of white leather. In the 14th and early 15th centuries, in the days of the strict guilds, a sharp line was drawn between Tors and Tanners, and a Tor was not allowed to tan nor a Tanner to Ta, Wiley, Volume 3. Page 195 no Tors were allowed to live in the forest according to the ancient forest laws. If any white Tor live in a forest, he shall be removed and pay a fine, for they are the common dressers of skins of stolen deer, Iden, Lank. Fall. 7, quoted by Manwood, page 161. Teaser, or teaser. A kind of mongrel greyhound whose business is to drive away the deer before the greyhounds are slipped, is the definition given by Blome page 96. These dogs were used to hunt up the game also when the deer was to be shot with the bow. The sportsmen would be standing at their trysts or stable stand in some alley or glade of the wood, and the hounds be put into the covert or park, to tease them forth. Trace, slot, or footprint of deer. In O, F and on, N. Literature the word trace seems to have been used indifferently for the track of the stag, wild boar, or any game, Borman, Notes 147, 236, 237. G. de F. Expressly says that the footprint of the deer should not be called trace but voice or pièce, view or foot, yet the master of game, in his rendering says, of the heart ye shall say, trace. So evidently that was the proper sporting term in England at the time. When slot entirely superseded the word trace amongst sportsmen it is difficult to determine. Turberville uses slot, and in the beginning of the 17th century it seems the general term for the footprint of deer, man, page 180. Stuart Glossary, Volume 2, Blome, page 76. Slot, it may be contended, is as old a word as trace, but in mid-eng it was employed as a general term for a foot track or marking of any animal. The trace or slot was one of the signs of a stag, that is the mark by which an experienced huntsman could recognize the age, size, and sex of the deer. The old stag leaves a blunter print with a wider heel than a hind, but it is difficult to distinguish the slot of a hind from that of a young stag. Although the latter has invariably a bigger heel and makes deeper marks with his dewclaws, yet his toes are narrow and pointed, their edges are sharp, and the distance between his steps is somewhat unequal. All of which may lead his slotting to be mistaken for the tracks of a hind. He has found what he wanted, says Dr. Collins, when speaking of the harbour, the rounded track, the blunted toe point, the widespread mark, the fresh slot, in short, of a stag, chase of the red deer. The huntsmen of old used to consider that any slot into which four fingers could be placed with ease belonged to a warrantable stag some declared a stag of ten. That would mean that the slot would be about three inches wide, if not more. I believe two and a half inches is considered a fair measurement for mark of the heel by Devonshire stag hunters, who alone in England concern themselves with the differences in the slot, as they only chase the wild deer. No such woodcraft is necessary for the chase of the carded deer, 
and as long as the master and huntsman can distinguish the footprint of a deer from that of any other animal, that is all that is required of them in this matter. The stepping or gait of a stag is also a sign that was taken into consideration. The old stag walks more equally, and generally places the point of his hind feet in the heel of his fore feet. The gait of a hind is more uncertain. It is said she misprints, that is sometimes the hind foot will be placed beside the fore foot, sometimes inside or in front of it. She is not even so regular in her gait as a young stag, unless she is with fawn, when she will place her hind feet constantly outside her fore feet. A hind walks with wide-spreading claws, so does a young stag with his fore feet, but those of his hind feet will be closed. The larger the print of the fore feet are in comparison to the hind feet the older the stag. The underneath edge of the claws round the hollow of the sole was called the espond, spond, edge or border. In older stags they were blunter and more worn, and in hinds and younger deer sharper, unless indeed the stag inhabited a damp and mossy country, where the espond would not be so much worn down as if he lived on a rocky or stony ground. G. De F. 155, 129 to 145, Lav, page 246, Stewart, page 58, Fortescue, page 133. And thus did the woodmen of old study the book of nature, which told them all they wished to know, and found for them better illustrations than any art could give. Trist, in the language of sport, was the place or stand where the hunter took up his position to await the game he wished to shoot. The game might be driven to him by hounds, or he might so place himself as to shoot as the game went to and from their lair to their pasturing, see appendix, stables and stable stand. In French it was called shooting a elephant, from ad fustum, near the wood, because the shooter lent his back to, or hid behind a tree, so that the game should not see him. In our MS. We are told that allants are good for hunting the wild boar whether it be with greyhounds, at the tryst, or with running hounds at bay within the covert. The tryst here would be the place where a man would be stationed to slip the dogs at the wild boar as soon as he broke covert, or after the huntsman had wounded the boar with a shot from his long or crossbow, page 118. Velters, Veltiers, Veltri. A dog used for the chase, a hound. Probably derived from the Gaelic words ver, large or long, and traith, a step or course, Vertragus being the name by which according to Arian, the Gauls designated a swift hound, Blanc, 52. Wanless, winding in the chase, Hallowell. In the sentence in which this word is used in the chapter on the Mastiff, page 122, we are told that some of these dogs, fallen to be Bursletus and also to bring well and fast a wanless about. Which probably means that some of these dogs become shooting dogs, and could hunt up the game to the shooter well and fast by ranging or circling. Wanlesor is an obsolete name for one who drives game, Strat. In Brit. Muse M.S. Lands down 285 there is an interesting reference to setting the forest, with archers or with greyhounds or with wanlesors. Wild boar, these animals were denizens of the British forests from the most remote ages, and probably were still numerous there at the time our MS was penned. For although the Duke of York has only translated one of the eleven chapters relating to the natural history, chase, or capture by traps of the wild boar, and does not give us any original remarks upon the hunting of them. As he has of the stag and the hare, still it was most likely because he considered these two the royal sport par excellence, and not because there were none to hunt in England in his day. If the latter had been the case, he would in all probability have omitted even the chapter he does give us, as he has done with those written by Gaston de Foy on the deer, the reindeer, and the ibex and chamois, page 160. In some doggerel verses which are prefixed to Louveniri de Tweedy and Gifford, in Vesp. B. 12, the wild boar is classed as a beast of veneri. In the A. Uh, Boke of St. Albans, the wild boar is also mentioned as a beast of veneri. When Fitzstephen wrote his description of London in 1174, he says wild boars as well as other animals frequented the forests surrounding London. And it would certainly be a long time after this before these animals could have been extirpated from the wild forests in more remote parts of the country. Sounder is the technical term for a herd of wild swine. 
how many herdes be there of bests of veneri? Sire of hertis, or bisses, of bucks and of deuce. A soundra of wild swine. A bevy of roos, tweedy and jiffered. In the French twice I we have also soundra des porcs. Pharaoh, sub, was a term for a young pig, in mid eng far, far, old eng fear, strat. Pharaoh, verb, was the term used when sows gave birth to young. G, de, f. Says that wild boars can wind acorns as far as a bear can, page 58, and turning to his chapter on bears, we find that he says that bears will wind a feeding of acorns six leagues off. Routing or rooting. A wild boar is said to root when he is feeding on ferns or roots, Turb, pages 153, 154. Argus, as our MS calls the Duclaws of the Boar, were in the later language of Veneri called the Guards, Blome, page 102. Tweedy and Gifford named the Duclaws of the Stag OS and of the Boar Ergos. How many bestis bear OS, and how many Ergos? The Hurt Berith OS above, the Boar and the Buk Berith Ergos. Greece, as the fat of the boar or sow was called, was supposed to bear medicinal qualities. And Fayer put the grease one it is take away, in the bladder of the boar my kylda I yow pray, for it is a medicine, for moni manor pine, bulk of st. Albans. Wild cat, Felis catus, which at one time was extremely common in England, was included among the beasts of the chase. It is frequently mentioned in royal grants giving liberty to enclose forest land and license to hunt therein. It was probably more for its skin than for diversion that the wild cat was hunted, as its fur was much used for trimming dresses at one time. The wild cat is believed to be now extinct, not only in England and Wales, but in a great part of the south of Scotland. A writer in the new edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, Art. Cat, expresses the opinion that the wild cat still exists in Wales and in the north of England, but gives no proof of its recent occurrence there. Harvey Brown in his Vertebrate Fauna of Argyle, 1892, defines the limit of the range of the wild cat by a line drawn from Oban to Inverness, northward and westward of this line, he states, the animal still existed. But there is no doubt that of late years the cessation of vermin trapping in many parts of Scotland, which has caused a marked increase in the golden eagle, has had the same effect upon the wild cat. The natural history chapter of the wild cat is taken by the Duke of York from G. to F. Did we not know this, some confusion might have arisen through the fact being mentioned that there are several kinds of wild cat, whereas only one was known to the British Isles G. to F. Says there were wild cats as large as leopards which went by the name of loop serviers or cat wolves, both of which names he declares to be misnomers. He evidently refers to the Felis lynx or lynx vulgaris, which he properly classes as a manner of wild cat, although some of the ancient writers have classed them as wolves, Pliny, Lib. 8. Cap. 34. Wolf, for a long time it was a popular delusion that wolves had been entirely exterminated in England and Wales in the reign of the Saxon King Edgar, 956-957, but Mr. J. E. Harding has by his researches proved beyond doubt that they existed some centuries later, and did not entirely disappear until the reign of Henry VII. 1485 to 1509. Worming a dog, this was supposed to be a preventive to the power of a mad dog's bite. It was a superstition promulgated in very early times, and seems to have been believed in until comparatively recent times. We find it repeated in one book of Veneri after another, French, English, and German, in England by our author, Turberville, Markham, and others. Pliny suggests this operation, and he quotes Columna as to the efficacy of cutting off a dog's tail when he is very young, Pliny, chapter 41. G. de F. And the Duke of York are careful to say that they only give the remedy for what it is worth, the latter saying, Thereof make I no affirmation. And further on, notwithstanding that men call it a worm it is but a great vein that hounds have underneath their tongue, p. 87. List of some books consulted and abbreviations used in text. I. Q. X. Z. 
Albertus Magnus. De Animalibus. Ed. 1788. The Secrets of. London, 1617. Ancient Laws and Institutes of Wales. 1841. Cambria. E. Williams. 1823. ANC, 10, Four Ancient Tenures of Land. By Thomas Blunt. London, 1874. Andrea, E. C., Digestic der Jagd. Frankfurt, 1894. Archaeologia. Pub by Associa of Antique, beginning 1770. Arcusia, Ch.D. La Conference de Fauconiers, Cab. De Venery, 7. 1880. Arkwright, for the Pointer and his Predecessor. By William A., London, 1902. For to see bibliography, in first edit. Arrow release, the. By Ed. S. Morse. 1885. Amen, for Le Roman de Cotter's Phil's Amen. Edit. P. Tarp. 1861. Bad. Lib Hunt, for Badminton Library. Volume on Hunting by the Duke of Beaufort and Mowbray Morris. Ed. 7. London, 1901. Errors in, see bibliography, in first edit. Volume. On the Poetry of Sport. London, 1896. Errors in, see bibliography, in first edit. Bangert, for Die Tier de Altfrans. Epos. Von Fried. Bangert. Marburg, 1885. Burrier Flavy, C. Sensier du Pays de Foy. Toulouse, 1898. Barthold, F. W. George von Frunsberg. 1833. Bastard, Echde. Libraire du Duc de Berry. Paris, 1834. Baudrillard, for Trait de Oz Forets, Chassin Peches. Par M. B. Paris, 1834. Beckford, for Thoughts Upon Hare and Fox Hunting. By Peter B. London, 1796. Belts, G. F. Memorials of the Garter. 1841. Berg, L. F. Freiherr. Gesch. Der Dutchen Walder. Dresden, 1871. Berthelidi, T. General Collections of Statutes, 1225-1546. London, 1543-51. Bib Exip, for Bibliotheca Exipatraria. By James E. D. M. Harding. London, 1891. Blancandon, Edition H. V. Michel Ant. 1867. Blaine, for Synegetica, or Observations on Hare Hunting. By W. B. London, 1788. Blaise, Elysier. Catalogue Dune Collection. Paris, 1852. Le Livre du Roy Modus. Paris, 1839. Blome, for the Gentleman's Recreation. By Richard Blome. London, 1686. Blunt, T. A Law Dictionary and Glossary. 1717. Baudel. MS 546, for the MS of the Master of Game in the Bodleian Library at Oxford. C. Existing Mises of the Master of Game. C. Bibliography, in first edit. Bormann, for Die Jagd in den Altfranz Artis und die Aventur Romanen. Von Ernst. Marburg, 1887. Bolden Book, for Chronicles and Memorials of Great Britain in Ireland, Volume 3. By Sir T. H. Duffus Hardy. London, 1875. B. Of St. Albans, for the Boke of St. Albans. Edit. By William Blades. London, 1881. C. Bibliography, in first edit. B. Of C. for Boke of Curtisi. 14th Center Poem. Pub by I. 
Oh, Hallowell. Percy S.O.C. Volume 4. Bonnie, for Historic Notices on Fotheringhay. By Rev. H. K. Bonnie, Oundle, 1821. Borel, P., Dictionnaire de Termes du Vieux Francois. 2 Volumes 1882. Boughton, Victor. Lauter du Roy Modus. Paris, 1888. Brachette, On. An Etymological Dictionary of the French Language, Clarendon Press. 1866. Brem, for B. S. Tirleben. 3. Edition von Dr. Petroloche. Leipzig and Wien, 1891. Breeze, Jacques de. Lichas du Grand Seneschal de Normandie. Paris, between 1489 and 1494. Breer, L. de l'Oliver de Priers par Gaston Phoebus, 1835. Paris, 1893. Brobel, P. die Farte de Hirsches. Halley, 1854. Brown, for Sodoxia Epidemica. By Sir T. H. S. B., 1650. Brute, for Le Roman de Brute. By Was. Ed. By Lou Rue de Lincey. Rouen, 1836-38. Bued. Trait de la Venerie. Par B. Ed. H. Chevreul, Paris. 1861. Burroughs, Montague, Professor the Family of Brocas. 1886. Caius, for English Dogs. By Johannes Caius. Reprint of edition of 1576. 1880. Camden, W., Britannia. 1586. Canterbury Tales, Chaucer's. Ed. Furnival. 1868. Castellamont, A. D. La Venaria Real. Torino, 1674. Catalogue of the Duke of Marlborough's Library at White Knight. London, 1819. London, 1881-83. Oxford, 1772. Cecil, for records of the chase. By, Cecil, edit. London, 1877. See bibliography, in first edit. Shafford, Jacques de. Instructions. Paris, 1609. Second edition. Champgrand, for trait de venerie et chasse. Par Gory de Champgrand, Paris, 1769. Champollion Fijac, Imy. Louis E. de Charles, Dux d'Orleans. Paris, 1844. Charles d'Orleans, for Charles de Valois. Les Poesies du Duc Charles d'Orleans. Edit. Champollion Fijac. Paris, 1842. Charles of Orleans Poems. Roxburgh Club. Ed. G. W. Taylor. London, 1827. Edit. By Charles D. Herricault. Paris, 1874. Chaz Sant, Alphonse. Lauter du Livre du Roy Modus. 1869, see Bibliography, in first edit. Chaucer, Minor Poems. Ed. Furnival. 1871. Chazelles, H. de. V.A. Venery. Paris, 1894. Chronique de la Trazen de Richard II. ENG History Associ 1846. CLA. For Lee Romans de Claris Ed. Laris. Ed. by Dr. Alton. 1884. Clam. Le Chasse du Lou. Par Jean de Clamorgan. Paris, 1566. Close Rolls, for calendars of the Close Rolls preserved in the Pub Rec office. Cadorniu, J. Etude Historique sur Gaston Phoebus. Floro, 1895. Kogo. Des Erslings Gui. Leipzig, 1886. Collins, C. P. The Chase of the Wild Red Deer. London, 1862. Complete Angler. 
See Walton. Com Sports, for the Complete Sportsman. By T. Fairfax. London. Corneli, R. Die Jagged. Amsterdam, 1884. Cornish, C. H. J. Shooting. Ed. By Horace G. Hutchinson. Two Volumes, Noons. London, 1903. Cotgrave. Dictionary. 1679. Cotgrave and Sherwood's Dictionary. 1632. 1673. Cox, Nitch. The Gentleman's Recreation. London, 1674. Cran. C.H., for Anecdotes and History of Cranbourne Chase. By William Chafin. London, 1818. Kilman, L. Delineatio Venatus. Hanover, 1564. Couples, George. Scotch Deerhounds and Their Masters. London, 1894. Kermer, L. Verrier de J. Fonkett. Paris, 1866. Curtisi, Bokov. Ed. by Halliwell. Percy S.O.C. Pub Vol. 4. Synegetica. London, 1788. Dalton, Michael. The Country Justice. 1666. Daniel, W. B. Rural Sports. London, 1801. D. E. T. B., for Doral E. T. Betton. Ed. by Paul Meyer. Paris, 1880. Dalziel, for British Dogs. By Hugh Dalziel. Three Volumes London, 1887-96. Doral E. T. Betton. Ed. Paul Meyer. Paris, 1880. Duc d'Armel, for Recule de la Philobiblian Society. Volume 2. London, 1855-56. Delacourt, for Le Chasse à la Haye. Par Pain Delacourt. Peron, 1872. Delisle, L. Inventaire de Mises de la Bibliothe. National. Paris, 1876, and De Noir, for Histoire de la Chasse. Par le Baron du Noir de Noirmont. Paris, 1876. Three volumes. Dillon, Viscount. Fairholt's Costumes in England. London, 1885. Ditchfield, R. H., Old English Sport. London, 1891. Dobell, H. W., Neurof Neat Jaeger Practica. Leipzig, 1783. Dolopathos, for Lee Romans de D. Ed. by Brunette E. T. Monteglon. 1856. Dombrowski, E. Vaughan. Die Lehr von dem Zechen. 1836. Dombrowski, R. Vaughan. Allgemeine Encyclopädie der Gesandter Forst und Jagdwissenschaft. Wien, 1886. Doomsday Book. By Henry Ellis, 2 Volumes, London, 1833. Drake, Francis. Eberacum. London, 1736. Dryden, Alice. Memorials of Northamptonshire. 1903. Dryden, Sir Henry. Twice Eyes Art of Hunting. Middle Hill Press. 1840, see Bibliography, in First Edit. Deventry. 1843. Gaston III. Le Livre de la Chasse. Daventry, 1844. Dudic. Kaiser Maximilians II. Jagdardnung. Wien, 1867. Du Foul, for La Venerie. Par Jacques du Foulis. Muir, 1864. Dugdale Bar, for the Baronage of England. 1675. Eglamour, for the Romance of E. of Artois. Camden S.O.C. 1844. Ellis. See Doomsday Book. Elliot, Sir Thomas. 
the book named The Governor. Ed. H. H. S. Croft. 1880. Emmanuel John, Infant of Spain. El Libro de la Casa. Edit. By G. Based. Halley, 1880. Encyclopedia of Sport, for Encyclopedia of Sport. London, 1897. Enslin, T. H. C. H. Father der Forst and Jagdwissenschaft. Leipzig, 1823. Essenwein, Augst. Quellen zur Gestik der Führwaffen. 1872. Estlander, T. Four Pieces in Adides du Roman de Tristan. Ed. by C. G. E. Helsingfors. 1867. Evans, D. S. An English and Welsh Dictionary 1852-58. Ex Brit. N. For Extinct British Animals. By J. E. Harding. London, 1880. Excerpta Historica. London, 1831. Fleming, H. F. Vaughan. Der Volkamin Tutcher Jäger. Leipzig, 1719. Fortescue, Honorable J. W., Records of the Stag Hunting on Exmoor. London, 1887. Fudras, Marquis de. Reckets de Chasseurs. Bruxelles, 1858. Fortier, Les Grands Louvetiers de France. Paris. Frederick II. Reliqui Laborum Frederici II. August. Vindal. 1596. Frunsberg, G. V. Schlacht bei Pavia. 1525. Gaze de la Bigny. Bulletin du Bibliophile, 13th Series, by the Duc d'Aumel, also in Philobiblian Society, Volume 2. London. See Bibliography, in first edit. Guerin de Lowe. Die Gester Lorraines. A. Feist. 1884. Garnier, P. Chasse du Sanglier. 1876. Gaucherod, H. Histoire de C. de Foy. 1834. Gawain, A Collection of Ancient Romance Poems. Edit. By Sir Fred. Madden. 1839. G. de F. stands for Joseph Lavallee's edition of Gaston de Foy's La Chasse de Gaston Phoebus. Paris, 1854. G. de P. For Roman de Guillaume de Palerne. Ed. H. Michel Ant. Paris, 1876. G. de Street, for Gottfried von Strasbourg. Ed. by P. Lehman. Hamburg, 1703. Gentleman's Magazine. 1752. Gent. Recreation, for Gentleman's Recreation. By Nicholas Cox. London, 1686. God. De Bouille, for Godefroy de Bouillon. C. Hippo. Paris, 1877. Goethausen, H. F. Vaughan. Notabilia Venatoris. Weimar, 1751. Gory de Champgrand. Trait de Venery. Paris, 1769. Gress, J. G. T. Jagger Brevere. Wien, 1869. Literator Jeskicht. Dresden, 1845. Greyhounds. By a Sportsman. London, 1819. Hallowell, for J. O. H. S. A. Selection from the Minor Poems of Lydgate. Pub by the Percy Society. Volume 2. 1842. Carols. Pub by the Percy Society. Volume 4. 1842. Dictionary of Provincial and Archaic Words. 1850. Hammerpergstall, Joss Vaughan. Faulkner Klee. Wien und die Pest, 1840. Hard, de Font, G. Le Trésor de la Venerie. Par Hardouin de Fontaines Guerin. 
Ed. by Baron J. Pichon. Paris, 1855. Ed. by Michel Ant. Metz, 1856. Harding, for the Chronicles of John Harding. Ed. 1543. London. Harewood, H. A Dictionary of Sport. London, 1835. Harrison, for Harrison's Description of England, Hollinshed. Edit. By F. J. Furnival. London, 1877. Hardig, G. L. Lerbush Finn Jaeger. Tubingen, 1810. Harding, James Ed. C. Bibb Sip. An ex Brit. An. Zoologist. 1878-80. H. de B. For Juan de Bordeaux. Ed. By F. Gessert and C. Grandmaison. Paris, 1866. Hartop, E. C. C. Sport in England. London, 1894. Hearn, T. Liber Niger Skakarii. 1728. Hirsbach, Conrad. Re Rusticae Libri Quatuor. Item Divination. 1570. Historical Review. January 1903. Hollinshed, R. Harrison. Ed. F. G. Furnival. London, 1877. Hoare, J. P. History of the Buckhounds. 1893. Horn, for das Anglo-Normannisch Leid vom Ritter Horn. Ed. by E. Stengel. Marburg, 1883. Howdy. C. F. D. Les Femmes Chasserises. Paris, 1859. Jesse, for researches into the history of the British dog. By G. R. Jesse. Two Volumes London, 1866. Journal de Chasseurs. Volumes 27, 28, 29, and 30. Paris. Juvenal, Michel. Nouveau Recule de Conti, and C. Le Chasse do Cerf. 1839. Julien, E. Le Chasse, Son Histoire ETSA Legislation. Paris, 1868. Le Chasse du Lou. Paris, 1881. Carion, T. G. Vaughan. Kaiser Maximilian's Gehemas Jagdbuch. Wien, 1858. Keller, Fourth Year de Classe. Alterthums. Vaughan Otto Keller. Innsbruck, 1887. Kennet, White. Parochial Antiquities. 1695. Kobel, F. Vaughan. Der Wildanger. Stuttgart, 1859. Krieger, Otto Vaughn. Die Hohe und die Niedere Jagd. Trier, 1879. Kreisig, G. C., Bibliotheca Scripturum Veneticorum. Altenburg, 1750. Kroger, C. The Minzinger of Germany. Cam. Massachusetts, 1873. Laborde, Leon E. S. J. De. Glossaire Francais du Moyen Age. 1872. Les Ducs de Bourgogne. 1847. Le Chasse do Cerf. Edited by Baron Jerome Pichon. Paris, 1840. See also Juvenal. See Bibliography, in first edit. Le Chasse Royal, for Le Chasse Royale, Composé par le Roy Charles IX. Ed. by H. Chevreul. Paris, 1857. La Croix, P. La Moyenne Age. Paris, 1848-51. La Cern de saint Palais, Memoirs sur l'Ancien Chevalerie. Paris, 1781. La Ferrière, Hector Conti. Les Chasses de François I. Paris, 1869. Lalmand. Bibliothèque historique, de la Chasse. Rouen, 1763. 
Lancaster, Henry, Earl of. Expenses of John of Brabant. Camden SOC, 1847. Landau, G. Beitrich zur Gestichter Jagd. Castle, 1849. Latini, Brunetto. Le Livres do Trésor. Edit. By Chabale. Paris, 1835. Lochert, Professor Father Das Whitework de Romer. Rottweil, 1848. La Vallée, for la chasse à cour en France par Joseph La Vallée. Paris, 1859. Technologie Synergétique, Journal de Chasseurs. 1863. La chasse à tir en France. 1854. Le Colte de Catelieu, Baron. La Vénérie Française. Paris, 1858. Laguina, Enrique de. Estudios Bibliográficos La Casa. 1888. Lens, J. O. Zoology der Alten Griechen und Romer. Gotha, 1856. Le Verrier de la Contiri. L'école de la Chasse Eux Chiens Courants. Rouen, 1783. Liber Niger. C. Hearn. Lib de la Montana, for Biblioteca Venatoria de Gutierrez de la Vega, Libro de la Monteria del Rey Alfonso XI. Del D. José Gutierrez de la Vega, Madrid, 1877. See Bibliography, in first edit. Lieberman, Felix. Constitutionis de Forsta. Halley, A. S. 1894. Lindsay, Robert. Chronicles of Scotland. Edinb, 1814. Lowe, Four Die Gesta de Lorraines. Ed, Feist. 1844. Madden, For the Diary of Master William Silence. By D. H. M. London, 1897. Madden, Sir Fred. Privy Purse Expenses of Princess Mary. 1831. Maison Rustique, for Maison Rustique de Maesters Charles Estienne and Jean Leibolt. Used ed. Paris, 1572 and 1578. Mallory, for La Morte d'Arthur. Ed. by Sir T. Mallory. London, 1856. Malucker, de Fauda. Comte de Foy. Foy. Pau, 1901. Man, for Manwood's Forest Laws. Fourth edition by W. Nelson. London, 1717. See Pleas of the Forest. Markham, Gervis. Country Contentments, or the Husbandman's Recreation. London, 1611. Cheap and Good Husbandry. London, 1614. The Young Sportsman's Delight and Instructor. London, 1652. Maricourt, René de. Lichasse du Livre, and C. Paris, 1858. Mondeville. The Book of John Mondeville. Ed. Dr. G. F. Warner, Roxburgh Club. London, 1889. Muir, No. Jaggerkunst. 1618. Meyer, P. Glacier de la Kern de S. Paley. 1875. Millet, J. G. British Deer. London, 1897. Monmouth, Gottfried Vaughan. Ed. Hoffman and Vollmuller. Halley, 1899. Montauban, Renaz de. Ed. by Michel Ant. 1843. Montana, for Lantiquite Expliqui. By Bernard de Montfalcon. Paris, 1719. Mortillet, G. de. Origins de la Chasse. Paris, 1890. Neckham, Alexander. De Naturis Rerum. Edit. Wright, 1858. Negotiation du Marichal de Bassompierre. 1626. Nichols, J. Royal Wills. 
London, 1780. The Battle of Agincourt. London, 1832. History of the Navy. London, 1847. Proceedings and Ordinances of the Privy Council. Privy Purse Expen. Of Elizabeth of York and Wardrobe EXP of Edward IV. London, 1830. Notabilia Venatoris. Nordhausen, 1710. Ordinances. A collection of ordinances and regulations of the royal household. SOC of Antique, 1790. Parson, J. W. Vaughan. Der Edel Hirschgerecht Jäger. 1683. Patent rolls, printed, of the English kings from Edward III. To Henry VII. P. B. For Pardonopius de Blois. Ed. G. Craplet. Two Volumes Paris, 1834. Pennant, Thomas. British Zoology. London, 1768-76. Perk, for Perceval le Gaulois. Edited by C. Potvin. S.O.C. de Biblio. Volume 21, 1866. Petit, Paul. Le Livre du Roy Modus. 1900. Philobiblian Society. Volume 2. London, 1854-55. Picard, for la Venerie de Dux de Bourgogne. Par Etienne Picard. Paris, 1881. Planche, I. Art Military Antiquities. 1834. Pleas of the Forest. By G. J. Turner. London, B. Quaritch, 1901. Poetry of Sport, Volume of Badminton Lib Ed by Headley Peak. London. Privy Purse Expenses of Elizabeth of York. London, 1830. Prutz, Dr. H. Reach Nungen über Heinrich von Derby's Prussenfahrt. Leipzig, 1893. Ramsey, Sir James. Lancaster and York. 1892. Raymond, G. Rolls de l'Armée de Gaston Phoebus, 1376-1378. Bordeaux. 1872. Rianardson, C. T. S. B. Sports of Bygone Days. London, 1787. Reisner, Adam. Historisch Beskribung. 1620. Ribsdale, For the Queen's Hounds. By Lord R. London, 1887. Rohan Chabot. Lichas A Travers Less Ages. Paris, 1898. Roll. Lied, for das Altfranzotisch Rollenslide. Ed, by Ed, Max Stengel. Heilbronn, 1878 and 1900. Rolls of Parl, for Rochelai Parliamentorum, EDW 3. To Henry IV. Romania, Octob. Paris, 1844. Roman de Richard Lobaios. Ed. Drive W. Forster. Veen, 1874. R. D. B. For Roman de Brut. Par Arth Was. Ed. Le Rue de Lincey. Rouen, 1838. Roman de Perceval le Gaulois. Ed. C. H. Potvin. Mons, 1871. Roman Lou de Rose. Ed. F. Pluquet. 1827. Arthur de Rowe, for Le Roman de Rowe. By Robert Wass. Ed. By F. Pluquet. 1827. Arthur V. For Roman de la Violette. Ed. Father Michel. Paris, 1834. Roy Modus, for Elysier Blaise's edition of Le Livre du Roy Modus. Paris, 1839. See Bibliography, in First Edit. Rye, W. B. England as Seen by Foreigners. London, 1865. Saul, for English Jagged, Jagged Kund und Jagged Literatur in 14, 15, und 16. Jarhund. 
Vaughan Paul Solander. Leipzig and London, 1895. De Jag Tractat Twiceis. Vaughan Paul Solander. Leipzig, 1894. Das English Jagdwiesen in Seiner Gesch in Twicklung. Vaughan D. P. Solander Botson. Dresden and Leipzig, 1898. Saint Palais, for memoirs Sir Lancien Che Valery. Parham, de la Kern de S. P. Three volumes Paris, 1781. Salnove, Arc de. La Vinerie Royale. Paris, 1655. Niort, 1888. Scandianese, F. G. Delia Cacha. Vingia, 1556. Senior de Nor, for Seneschal de Normandie, or Le Livre de la Chasse et du Bon Chien Solard. Par le Baron de Pichon. Paris, 1858. Shaw, Vero. The Book of the Dog. London, 1889-91. Shirley, for English Deer Parks. By Evelyn P. H. S., London, 1867. Shirley M. S., for Brit. Muse at it. M. S. 16165 of the Master of Game, which is the version next in importance to the one reproduced in the present work. See Bibliography, Mises of the Master of Game, in first edit. Smith, Sir Thomas. De Republica Anglo Rum. London, 1583. Sohart, for Bibliography de Ouvrages sur la Chasse. Par Art Sohart. 1886, with two editions of 1888 and 1891. Statutes of the Realm. 1810-1822, nine volumes. Stisser, F. U. Forst und Jagd Hister. De Tuchen. Jena, 1738. Strasbourg, Gottfried von. Ed. P. Lehmann. Hamburg, 1703. Stratman, F. H. Middle English Dick. Rev. by H. Bradley. 1891. Strutt, J. Sports and Pastimes of the English People. Ed. 1875. Errors in it, Appendix in First Edit. New Edition by J. C. Cox. 1903. Dress and Habits of the People of England. Stuart, For Lays of the Deer Forest. By J. Saab. And C. H. Stewart. Two Volumes Eden. And London, 1848. Taplin, W. Sporting Dictionary. Tarb, Prosper. Le Noble et de Jean de Jeu de l'Arbalast. Reims, 1841. Le Roman de Cotter's Phil Zaman. 1861. Tardif, for l'art de Fauconary et de Chiens de Chasse. Par Guillaume T. Paris, 1492. Thierbach, T. Die Gestiklich in Twicklung der Hanfuafen. Dresden, 1886-89. Topsell, Edward. The History of Foverfooted Beasts. London, William Iagard, 1607. T. and I, for Tristan Guendi Isolde. Von Gottfried von Strasbourg. Ed. Her. Kurtz. Stuttgart, 1844. T. M., for Tristan, Ressurl de C. E. Carest de Poems. Ed. by Father Michel. Three volumes. London, 1835-39. Topham, J., Observations on the Wardrobe Accounts of the 28th Year of Edward I, 1787. Trait, Nouveau, de Venery. Paris, 1750. Trait de Chasses, Anon, 2 volumes Paris, 1822. Trait de Chasses et de la Venerie. Paris, 1681. Treat. On Grey, for a treatise on greyhounds. By a sportsman. London, 1825. T. Tres Sun, for Histoire de Tristan de Leonois. Ed. by Comte de Tres Sun. Paris, 1781. Tristan. Ed. Father Michel. 
3 volumes London, 1835-39. De la Table Ronde. P.R. Antverard. Paris, 1495. Turber, for the noble art of venery or hunting. London, 1575-76. When not specially mentioned, the second edit. Of 1611. Tweedy and Gifford, also written Tweedy and Gifford, for article under that title in the Reliquii Antiqui. Volume. I, where Thomas Wright published Twice Eyes Art of Hunting, in Brit. Muse M. S. Vespasian B. 12. Bibliography, First Edit. Twice I, for the Art of Hunting. By William Twice I, M. S. Phillips, 8336. Edited by, Sir, H. E. L. Dryden. Daventry, 1843. Bibliography. First Edit. Tylet, Romania. Edited by G. Paris, 1885. Usk, Adam of. Chroniken. Ed. London, 1876. Valles, Mohsen Juan. Tratado de Monteria. 1556. Venery Nor, for Venery Normande. Parham, Le Verrier de la Contiri. Rouen, 1778. Ver de la Cante. For l'école de la chasse eux chiens courants. Parham, de le verrier de le Contiri. Rouen, 1763. Vigninker, Emile. Recule de poesies bernaises. Fourth edit. Pau, 1886. Vincentius Bellovicensis. Bibliotheca Mundi. Edit. Of 1624. Speculi Majorius. 1591. Viner. Notitia Venatica. Wagner, F. Vaughn. Die Jag de Grossen Wilds in Middlealter. Wien, 1844. Walton, for the Complete Angler. By Isaac Walton. Used Edition London, 1815. Wardrobe Accounts for the Reigns of Edward III. To Henry IV. Worth, Hermann. Uber die Altessen Franz Ubersetzung in Mittelalt Jagdorbucher. Göttingen, 1888. Altfranzosisch Jagdorbucher. Halley, 1889. Whitaker, Joseph. The Deer Parks of England. London, 1892. Will. Of Palern. C. G. de P. Wright, for a history of domestic manners in England. By Thomas Wright. London, 1862. Wiley, for history of England under Henry IV. By James H. Wiley. London, 1884-98. Four volumes. Wynn, for history of the Mastiff. By M. B. Wynn. Melton Mowbray, 1886. Joville. Trait de Venery. Paris, 1688. Glossary. Of obsolete English terms and words occurring in the ancient texts of The Master of Game and in Appendix. X. Z. Abai, Abay, being at bay. Akarnath, Akarn, to set on, to eat flesh. Ashof, heat. Aquiller, inquiller, to rouse animals of the chase with hounds, ap. Afferent, the haunch. Affetted, fashioned, trained. A force, par force, by force, ap. Aguilounce, thorny. Aclid, cooled. Achire, acorn, acorns. Alontis, alonce, aland, alans or alonce, a large hound. Alvalo, covered with fleece, fat or woolly substance, ap. Anald, for avaled, hanging down. Anceps, hossipide, a snare which caught the game by the foot and lifted it into the air. Anches, rosemary. Apel, French hunting note, ap. Apering, stoned, the roughness of antlers. Apparel, dressed venison. Arbiton, bitten, devoured. Arblast, 
crossbow. Arch A, reach. Arrear, arriere, behind, back there, app. Arian, spider. Arian, rain. Aracher, to tear out. A term used for skinning certain animals, app. Asuda, saute, in heat. Ascreeth, ascry, to rate, shout at, to scold. Asayan, try or test. Assay, essay, to try, taking assay, to see by a cut the thickness of the fat, app. Assays, note on hunting horn blown at death of stag which has been hunted by staghounds, app. Astert, escape. A stifled, inflammation in the stifle joint. Astreed, rated, shouted at. A thrust, thrust, or push. At full, when the stag's antlers show a certain number of tines, app. A tire, the stag's antlers, app. Ald, availed, hanging down. Auril, avril, april. Ontelir, antler, oncular, antler. Antred, ventured. Avant, awant, a hunting cry, forward. Avantale, relay of hounds. Avail, avail, profit. Avenod. Approachable. Avenary, oats. Avist, aware of, warned, informed, advised, cautious. Avoy, a hunting cry, probably from, away, ap. Base, for loose, a pike. Baffers, barkers. Bake, back. Ballista, ballesta, crossbow, heron's blast. Ballo, bellow, roaring of a stag. Bandrike, baldric, belt to which horn was fastened. Barateur, quarreler. Barburis, barbers. Barian, baron. Bosco, basque, biscay. Baited, bruised, sore. Baiting, baiting. Bods, baubles, trifles. Beam, the main part of the stag's antlers. Beending, bending. Burners, burners, attendant on hounds. Bees tail, bestale, beasts, cattle. Bees tis. Beasts, ap. Bellin, belowin, belerve, bellowin, bellow or roar. Belluez, velvet. Beam, beam, also trumpet. Benes, beans. Bursal, a mark to shoot at, ap. Burslet, bursletis, barcelet, a shooting dog used by archers. Berries, burrows, earth of fox and badger. Buried, buried. Burying, bearing, breaking. Bestis of the chase, beasts of the chase, usually fallow deer, roe deer, fox, marten. Bestis of venery, beasts of venery, usually the hart, hare, boar, and wolf. Bevy, a number of roe deer together, ap. Bevy grease, the fat of the roe deer, ap. Buellis, bewails, bewellis, bowels. Billetings, the excrements of the fox, ap. Bisses, beeses, bishas, red deer hinds. Bishunters, fur hunters. Bit, bitten, taken. Blenches, marks, tricks, deceits. Botchery, butchery. Bokeying, the rut of the roe deer. Bone, bulk, bone, bellow, or bark. Butcher's houndies. Butcher's dogs. Bull, bull. Boons, bones, stag's foot. Boonies, bones. Boardcloth, tablecloth. Boards, boards. Buries, boars. Boost, boast. Botches, booches, sores. Butterflies, butterflies. Bount, bounty, goodness. Bowies, bows, ap. Boas, bows, bows. Brock, brache, a scenting hound, later on it meant bitches. Bracatus, a hound for hunting. Braconeer, the man who held the hounds. Brain, brain, brain. Breed, breadth. Breed, broad. Breek, brook, break. Also applied to dress a deer. Bremd, burnt. 
Brent, Burnt. Brewers, Briars. Brigilla, Mildew. Brimming, Bremming, be in heat, said of boar, the word bream, brime, or brim, valiant spirited. Brocher, a red deer stag of second year, ap. Brocard, a roebuck of the third year and upwards, ap. Brock, badger, ap. Brokes, brooches, brooches, the first head of a red deer stag, and of roebuck. Broquette, brocket, young stag. Broquette sister, hind in the second year, ap. Brond, proud. Butch, bitches, bitch. Bugle, buffalo, also horn for sounding hunting signals, ap. Bucks, books, bucks, bucks. Buckmast, beachmast, ap. Bulok, young stag in second year. Burnishin, burnish, to rub the antlers when the velvet is off. Burr, the lowest part of the stag's antlers. Caboche, to cut off the heart's head near the antlers. Calf, calf. The young stag in his first year. Chamomile, chamomile. Campestris, beast of the field or chase, I. E. Buck, doe, fox, martin, and roe deer. Candlemas, February 2nd. Carains, carrions, carin, carrion, carcass. Cardiac, cardriacal, a disease of the heart. Cares, marshes. Case 2, stripping or skinning the hair, ap. Catapucia, spurge, euphorbia resinifera. Cat, cat, caddies, cat, ap. Cautilus, caudles, cautious, crafty. Seat, a number of badgers. Chaseable, chaseable, a hurt chaseable, which is now called a warrantable stag, one fit to be hunted. Chastions, grooms in attendance on hounds. Shalong, challenge. Chase, forest. Also used to designate a method of hunting, and also a hunting party. Chasse, a French hunting note. Chastised, trained. Chater, chaser, rechater, wreck heat, a horn signal. Also to chastise hounds. Chow fed, a shoft, heated, in heat. Chal, chowlis, chavel, jaw. Change, change. Cheer, share, cherish, welcome. Chevarous, roe deer. Chibalis, chives. Childermas, Innocence Day, December 28th. Kais, dainty. Shivacher, shivacher, to ride. Kaimer, riding cloak. Kimnius, chimney. Cleese, claws, the toes, of a deer's foot. Cleaves, sir or do cleaves at the back of a deer's fetlock. Cleeped, clepid, called. Clear spurs, clear spires, woods. App. Clicking, vixen fox when in heat, app. Clister, enema. Cods, testicles of the heart. Coiting stone, a quoit. Colors, colliers places, collier or charcoal pits. Concilla de Meyer, comfrey, symphidum officinal. Concilla de Minor, prunella, self heal, prunella vulgaris. Koninger, conigri. Rabbit warren, app. Contra, counter, back, heel. Contra, country. Contrugal, contriangle, hunt counter, hunt heel. Caninge, rabbit. Coolwort, cabbage. Copiice, copies, coppice. Corner, corner, horn blower. Coats, quoits. Couch, the resting place of game. Also hound's bed. Couchers, setters. Courts, covert, shelter. Counterfeit, count fight, abnormal. Courser, cursor, cursor, swift horse. Ku then, con then, kuth, new, to be able, ob. Could. Kowi, cow, also tail, from q. Cree, cry, of hounds. Crotches, the upper tines of a deer's horns. Called also trochets. Croys, cross. Croaks, stomach, of red deer. Croaking, crooked, curved. 
crumbs, crumbs. Cronin, groan, the roar of the stag. Cross to, to dislodge roe deer by hounds. Croteth, voiding excrements. Crody, crotals, crotison. Crotisings, excrements. Cure, core, heart. Queer, queer, leather, hide. Curie, cure, rewarding the hounds, also keer and gear. Cuz, case, curs. Curtes, courteous. Dongir, danger. Deddies, deeds. Didut, dudis, deduis. Deduit, pleasure pursuit, sport. Defaut, defant, lack, default. Defet, defetman, opening or undoing the bore and removing the entrails. Defoil, track. Deliure, deliver, active. Depiled, stripped of hair. Desfair. Undoing, brittling, of deer or boar, ap. Despitus, despitus, despiteful, furious. Destrier, destrier, horse. Detorner, lo surf, to harbor the heart, ap. Daying, doing. Dame, 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 dine, fallow deer. Dislau, wild. Disisi, disease. Do, do. Down, or husk, a number of hairs, ap. Dragmes, drams. Draint, drowned. Drit, drit, excrements of animals called stinking beasts, also mud. Dryin, dry. Dry you, driven. Drive, made. Dune, don, done. Dure, to last, endure. Diet, diet. Earth, a fox and badger's lodging place. App. Edite, done, set in order. Ilda, old age. Indies, ends. Erin, hairs. Eris, eris, ears. Eager, eager. Irers, harriers. Ellis, else. Emel, emel, female. Empalmier, the crotches or top tines of a stag's antlers, ap. Enbrowed, brood, soaked. Enchase, to hunt. Encharning, blooding, feeding on flesh. Enchases, moving deer, and with a limer, ap. In corn, to place a dead stag on his back, the antlers on the ground underneath the shoulders. Informed, informed. Inglamed, glutinous. Enost, a bone in the throat. Enpeshed, prevented. Enquest, hunt. Inquiller, rousing a buck with hounds. App. Inquired, inquiried, blooding hounds after death of deer, also rewarding of hounds. Ensample, example. Entente, intent. Entrying, entering, beginning of. Intringus, entering, beginning of. Envoys, envoys, o, f. Envoise, to leave the line, or overshoot the line of the animal hunted. Herbis, herbs. Eries of roebuck, target. Ergots, argus, claws of boar, buck and doe. Those of the boar were sometimes called guards. Eris, eries, ars, anus, hinderparts, ears, occasionally thus spelt. Earth, earth. Escorcher, estorcher, flaying deer, and other beasts of veneery, ap. Espals, shoulders. Aspired, spyard, spare, stag of the third year, ap. Assemble, assembly. Establi, stand occupied by sportsmen. Also beaters. Esterasis calamita, storax, resin. Essie, easy. A tod, tanned. Etten, itfn, eat. Euaningus, evening. Euricon, everishan, each one, every one. Yul, yule, evil, wicked, bad. Evoised, at fault, or off the line. Expedite. To maim dogs by cutting off some of their claws. Ein, a, einen, i. Air, air. Faken, falcon, falcon. Fatter, fadir, father. 
Fadmes, Fadams, Fathoms. Faro, Fairwin, Farowin, Faro, bringing forth young pig. Farsin, Farsine. Farsi. Fa's son, Fashion, Fashion. Fond, Fond. Faz, False. Fosmanch, False Sleeve. Fo, Fault. Fichu, Fichu, Polcat. Fielda, Fields. Fern, Fern. Fellows, Fellows. Feel, Many. Also Sensible, Feeling. Fell, Fierce, Cruel, Treacherous. Fell, Feel, Wise, Sensible, Feeling, Also Cunning. Fellness, Cruelty, Fierceness. Famelis, Females. Fence Month, the month when deer had their young and were left undisturbed, ap. Firmid, Firm. Ferre, Far. Ferretis, Ferrets. Fairest, Farthest. Furs, Fierce. Firstlish, Fiercely. Fissant, Pheasant. Furier, February. Fuse, Fute, Track, Trace, Foot. Some animals were called of the sweet foot, others of the stinking foot. See Appendix. Futurer, Futraires, Du Trees, Man Who Leads Greyhounds. Fiance, also less, excrements of the wild boar, ap. Fistoles, Fistula. Fixen, Vixen, O, G. Fuxen. Flay, Fleen, Fleen, to skin deer and certain other game. Flesh, Flesh. Flux, Dysentery. Foiling, Stag going downstream when hunted. Foley's, Folly, Folly, lesser deer, not heart or buck. Foltish, Foolish. Form, For me, Form. Form of the hair. Foragle, Strangle, Straggle. Forchy, Forched, Forked, set of stag's antlers. Forloin, Forlone, for long, a note sounded on the horn, to denote that the quarry or hounds or both had distanced the hunters. Forsters. Foresters. Furswong, M. E. For swinger, bruised, beaten, tucked up. Fort, the thick part of woods. Foreign, forworn. Fotide, footed. Fwail, the reward given to the hounds after a boar hunt consisting of the bowels cooked over a fire, ap. Fomart, Falmart, Fomart, Polcat. Foutriers, Futurers, Huntsmen who led greyhounds, Slippers. Foxen, Fixen, A, S. Fixen, Vixen, a bitch fox. Foin, Weasel. Frayed, Rubbed. Fray, Frighten, Scare. Fray, to rub off the velvet on stag's antlers. Fraying post, the tree against which it was done. Fraying, excrements of the wild boar, ap. Fruit, frotted, rub. Fuance, excrements of the fox, marten, badger, and wolf, ap. Fuse, track, line. Fumes, fumi, fumigen, fimeshen, fumets, femigen, fumishings, excrements, droppings, particularly of deer. Furky, pieces of venison hung on a fork-shaped stick. Furar, fur, fr. Furur. Futai, futile, forest, wood of old trees, also plantation of beech trees, ap. Finders, finders, hounds to start or find deer. Gatherange, gathering, gathering, meat. Gadire, gather. Gar, to force, to compel. Guards, the dew claws of the wild boar. Garst, cupped. Gin, gin, trap, snare. Girl. The roebuck in the second year, ap. Guys, guys, manner of. Gladness, a glade, a clear space. Glandras, glanders. Glemming, glaming, slime, stickiness. Glotony, gluttony. Nap, snap. Gobets, small pieces. Goot, goat. Gorgant, wild boar in his second year. Godders, gudra. 
Gutierrez, gutters, the small grooves in the antlers of a stag. Grunt sour, stag of fifth year. Growl, gravel. Grease, grease, the fat of certain animals. Grease time, the season of heart and buck when they were fattest. Greater, of the term used in counting the tines of a stag's antlers, ap. Greed, seek, hunt. Gress, upper tusks of wild boar, grinders. Gressips, grasshoppers. Greta, greet, great. Gru, grieve, harass, injure. Gray, badger. Grovis, grooves. Gustums, customs. Guts, guts. Guyan, gain, gien. Girius. Quarry, curie. Gins, gynas, gins, traps, ruses, wiles, tricks. Ginously, by stratagem or ingenuity. Haze, haze, nets, hedges. Hallow, the reward given to the hounds at the death. Hallow, hello, app. Hamelons, the wiles of a fox. Harbor, herboro, harbour, harboro, to track a heart to his lair. Harbor, man who harbors the deer. Hardyeth, herds with. Hardle, hurdle, herdel, harling, hardel, fasten or couple hounds together. Also to fasten the four legs of a roebuck together. Hardy, bold, courageous. Harris, hares. Harnays, hernias, harness, appurtenances, arms, and k. Heron's blast, a crossbow, from O.F. Arkbalest. Harrowed, herald. Harthound, herthound, hound used to chase the stag. Hast, haste. Hastal it is, the dividing of the wild boar into thirty-two pieces. Hat, hath. Hat, thicket. Haukes, hawks. Hawking, hawking. Hauntlers, antlers, ap. Hospi, hossipi, a trap, also a siege engine. Hater, harrier, ap. Hearse, also Broquette's sister, a red deer hind in her second year, ap. Headed, headed. Here, hair. Heggies, hawks. Errors, harriers. Helle, helda, health. Helen, heel. Hemuel, hemus, hemus, roebuck in the third year. Hendis, red deer hind. Her, here. Herbis, herbs. Herboro. Sea harbor. Hurdle, to dress a roebuck. Hernius, harness. Sea harnais, also appendix. Heron, heron. Hurt, heart, also stag. Hurtis, hearts, stags. Hydra, hinder. High ten, called, named. Hire, her. Hogaster, wild boar in his third year, ap. Hawks, hoes, huffs, hawks. Hooks, hooks, first teeth of wolf and dog. Hoot, be, promised. Hoot, hot. Hopeland, hopoland, hopoland, a long surcoat or gown like garment. Hoppin, hoping. Horde, hairy. Hose, horse. How, hoof. Hoff. Hauf, hof, a haunt, a resort, used especially for the holt, or dwelling place of an otter, ap. Houndies, huns, hounds, also hands. Hunger, hunger. Hounter, Hunter. Howlin, howl. Hoxtide, howl. feast fifteen days after Easter, ap. Husk, a number of hares, ap. I boiled, boiled. Eclepid, called. Ilian, lane. Iloex, iliox, here in this place. I lost, lost. Imaked, made. Imanged, mingled. In prime, unharboring a heart. Ingwer, inquire, inquire or seek. Ipressed, pressed. I reigned, reigned. Iron, iron. Iranged, arranged. Iron ged, ranged. Iruz, iris. Ispade, spade, k. 
castrated. Also to kill with a sword. See spay. Is stamped, stamped, crushed. Istered, stirred. Itod, tod, tanned. Ithrest, thrust, push. Eidered, trodden. Eitened, tined. Iwerid, worn. I wedded, wedded, moistened. Irithid, wreathed. Jangelier, jangler. Janera. January. Jaw, jaw. Jangeleth, jangeleth, said of a noisy hound. Jolly, a bitch in heat. Jopi, jupi, to hollow, to cry out, to call. Jug, jug, judge. Jugments, judgments. Jul, July. Juin, June. Jus, juice. Chwerid, worn. Karines. Carrion. Kale, cool. Chem, comb. Kinetis, kennet, a small hunting hound. Kepin, keeping. Care, kir, kir, cure, curie, quarry, reward of hounds. See curie. Queer, cover. Cured, covered. Kit, to cut, sharp. Kidding, cutting. Nobber, stag in second year or broquette, app. Knyff, knife. Countingly, cunningly. Also wisely. Cun, ken, to know, to be able. Kaid, roebuck in first year. Kien, kine, cattle. Kiliak, Welsh for grease time. Kindleth, bring forth, set of the hair. Kindles, young hair. Kindly, naturally, m, e. Kindly, kendalish, kundalish. Kinningly, cunningly. Chitons, kittens, kittens. Labels, small flaps. Lada, lead. Ladle, ladle. Lies, pools, lakes. Lair, the resting place of the various kinds of deer. Lammas, Lammas, August 1st. Lammas of Peter Apostle, June 29th. Lap, Lap. Lasse, Less, Smaller. Lancet, Lancet. Lawns, Lawns, Wild Uncultivated Land. Levy, Unrestrained, Wild. Leather, The Skin of Deer and of the Wild Boar, App. Leches, Leeches, Doctor or Surgeon. Letter, leather. Lefer, leverier, greyhound. Left, last, or live. Legs, legs. Lay, lair. Lair, river lawyer in France. Leers, lair, bed of a stag. Leith, layeth. Lakes, leeks. Learned, learned, taught. Lace. Leash. Lesseth, laseth. Less, of the, term used in counting the tines, ap. Less, fr. Lases, excrements of boar and wolves. Less she, less, less che, leash. Leshes, less, inferiors. Lessing, loosing. Let, hindered. Luer, lever, rather, sooner. Luretis, leverets. Love, leave. Lewis, Louis, leaves. Lever, lever. Rather. Leverier, a hare hound. Liam, liam, rope by which the limer was held. Libbard, leopard. Lif, life. Lifload, livelode, livelihood. Ligging, ligging, lair, resting place. Lippies, lips. Litir, litter. Logs, lodges. Lond, land. Lowen, love. Loops coroners, loo serviers, links. Occasionally it was probably applied to the wolverine. Lower, laugh. Loose, pike. Lyff, life. Limer, a tracking hound on a leash. Limbs, limbs. Limner, limer, limer. Man who leads hounds on a leash. Limnera. Used both for man and hound, app. 
Linsed, linseed. Lion, lion. Lithus, litus, lungs. Liven, liuan, live. Mastives, mastiff, mastiff. Maestres, masters. Malemort, glanders. Malancholius, melancholy. Malice, cunning. Mamu, mamuniser, mamu, mau, mange. Mani seth. Threatening. Manis, mans. Marches, district. Marie, marrow. Marubium album, white whorehound, marubium vulgar. Martrin, martin. Mary Magdalene Day, July 22nd. Massel, mashy, male. Mastin, a hound used for boar hunting, a mongrel. Matir. Matter. Maimed, maimed, bitten. Maintain, maintain. Mastiff, mastiff, mestifies, masto, mastiff, ap. Maestre, maestri, maestress, maestri, mastery, skill. Mesh, big. Mead, meadow. Metal, metal, mix. Mean, lesser, small. Mani, menne, note sounded on a horn. Also the baying of a hound hunting. Meng, menge, mingle. Mare rain, the main beam of a stag's antlers, ap. Mervale, marvel. Mervaliest, most marvelous. Mervalous, marulous, marvelous. Mestifies, mastiffs. Metis, meets. Meeting, metinges, meet, meeting. Metinge, meeting, feeding or pasture of deer. Mule, mew, meave, move, start, shed. Mule, mule, burr, part of the antler, ap. Mute, pack of hounds. Maveth, meweth, to mew, casts or sheds. See mule. Muse, house for hawks. Motor, mother. Motorward, motherward, Leonurus cardiaca. Monith, monith, Menethenes, month. Moot, moat, a note or horn signal, ap. More found, more fond, to catch cold, glanders. Morningis, morning. Morsus gauline, chickweed. Mort, a note sounded on the horn at the death of the heart. Mosul, moselle, muzzle. Moat, moot, a note sounded on the horn. Modying, moving. Mountainance, mountains, extent of, as far as. Mouseness, moisture. Mo, mau, mauen, to have power, to be able. Mos, burr of an antler. Mew, mew, shed antlers, or feathers, molt. See mew. Mule, mule, burr of a stag's antler. Mute, mute, a pack of hounds. Mish, the acibulated form of mucle, mickle, great, much. Mids, midst. Middle, middle. Mind, memory. Misugen, misjudge. Nail, name given to a disease in dog's eyes. Now called pterygium. Narthless, nathless, nevertheless. Natiuite, nativity. Nettle, needle. Neckis, neek, necked, neck, necked, ap. Nameth, taketh. Nemp, name. Nez, kidneys. Nesh, 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 soft, tender, moist. Nether, nether, lower. Nettleus, nettles. Nulich, newly, freshly. Nombles, nombless, part of the stag's intestines, ap. Noon, no more. Norche, nor she, norsh, nourish, to bring up, to educate. Nusithurlis, nosithrels, nostrils. Norcher, bringing up. Nodis, nuts. Nuff, nigh. Noyance, annoyance. Nime, to take, to hold. Okies, oaks. Olive, olive. Onis, once. U, uan, one. Opin, open, open, of hounds to give tongue. Or, air, before. Ordine, 
ordain. Orked, brave, valiant. OS, the dew claws of the stag and hind, app. Oscorbin, OS Corbin, a small bone in the stag's body given to the crows, app. Osterus's calamint, storax or resin. Odor, otera, otter. Our jaws, upper jaws. Our set, overcome. Our wert, athwart. Our shet, overshoot. Were, over. Oath, owen, ought. Oars, harriers. Oi, I. Oil, oil. Pos, pis, chest. Pos. Pace, to walk slowly. Pace, slot, track of stag. Pammed, palmate. Perceive, perisu, Good Friday. Parfiters, parfiters, parfiteurs, parfiteros, the third or last relay of hounds. Partel, a part of portion. Partineth, appertaineth. Party. Part. Passe, pace, to step slowly. Pearls, the excrescences on the stag's antlers, ap. Pes, peace. Peachter, P.O. Cheater. Peach tree. Pell, Father Poe, skin. Purcell, parsley. Perchy, the main beam of the stag's antler, ap. Perfite, perfeet, perfit, perfect. Also note sounded on the horn. Peritory, wall pelletory, parietaria. Pezen, peas. Peseth, passeth. Pain, pain. Pierres, pearls, or excrescences on the stag's antlers. Pilches, police, a coat of skin or fur. Plain contra, clear open country. Plains, plains. Place tire, plaster. Plek, 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 pleca, piece of ground, place. Plain, plaineth, complain, lament. Plain, plaineth, plainen, fr. Plainer, complain, lament. Pointing, pointing, track of hair. Polcats, polcats. Pummeled, mottled, dappled, spotted. Pund, poon, pond. Port, parts, behavior, manners. Popey, puppy. Portia. See perchy. Puer, poer, power. Putur, keep, food, used in connection with hounds. Point, Painted. Prief, proof. Prees, press, crowd. Pruid, proved. Prooli, priwili, privily. Price, prize, pre, take, capture. Pricket, priket. The fallow buck in his second year, ap. Prick, prick, to hunt. Prickerid curris, rough coated curs, ap. Pricking, pricking. Footprint of hair, app. Prime, noon, high prime, midday. Prize, prize, price, a horn signal blown in France for the buck, in England for the heart and buck after the kill. Prive, tame. Procators, proctors. Profitness, perfectness. Pilgrun, penny royal, mentha pulegium. Pooleth, poileth, take the hair off, fr. Poiler. Persnetis, persnets. Puruance, perseverance. Putties, pits. Peach, pitch. Piles, piles, the skin of the boar, wolf, and smaller animals. Pincers, pincers. Quailies, quails. Quarry, the reward given to the hounds. C. Curie, app. Quat, couched, lying down, used for deer. Quaddle, to quat, to squat, to crouch, to lie down, ap. Questi, quest, to hunt, to give tongue. Quire, quir, queer, quer, curie, quarry for hounds, reward, ap. Quick, uelis, quick evil, a disease of hounds. Quersis, reward given to hounds. C. Curie, ap. Rax, hounds. Rage, madness. Rajurinet, rage mute, dumb madness. Rascale, 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 lean deer. 
Any deer under ten was usually called rascal. Ravian, prey, rapin. Real, real, a tine, in France, the bay, on the stag's antler. Reem, reem, realm. Rear to, to dislodge a wild boar, ap. Rebelly, rebellious, unruly. Rechase, wreck heat, sound a note on the horn, to call back the hounds by sound of horn, also to put them on the right scent, ap. Richie, to wreck, to care. Richilis, reckless. Recopes, recoupling. Refraid, refreed, refracted, chilled, cooled. Rays, nets, ap. Relays, relays, of hounds. Relevd, fr. Relever, set of the hair rising from her form to go to her pasture. Rely, rely, rally. Remove, remied, removed. Renin, reigned, reigns. Renning, reneth, running. Renuet, renovel, fr. Renewaler, to renew. Resiud, received. Receiver, receiver, a greyhound in front of deer. Residing, receding. Resounds, resounds, resins, reasons. Restiff, quiet, restive, unwilling to go or to move forward. Restrayed, restrained, held back. Retrieved, retrieved. Rewear, revere, river. Ru, ru. Ru, row. Rul, rule. Rum, fr. Rum, a cold. Rain, rain. Reindeer, reindeer. Ray sun, rise, raising, raise. Real, real, royal, also tine of stag's antlers. Riding time, redeng time, bucking time of the hare. Rig, rag, backbone, ap. Riot, ap. Roaches, rocks, rocks. Roads, rods. Rotling, rattling. Roundjeth, Father Ranjir, choose the cud, ap. Rouse to, rouse, rouse, to dislodge buck or doe, ap. Route, a number of wolves. Roots, synonymous with slot, line of deer. Royal, a tine, sometimes the tres tine, see real. Ruetis, horn or trumpet. Rusing, rusing. Rutsum time, rutsen, ruta, rutting time of deer. Rijes, back. Haunches. Rights, rights, a stag's rights, three lower tines of antlers. A hound was in his, rights, when hunting line. Riot, noise. Riura, rewear, river. Sainolfs, spanels, spaniels. Scantolin, measure. Scomber, scombra, stercoro in ms bod. 546. Voiding excrements. Scumfitted, discomfited. Seat, the form of a hare. Sesh, seek. Setching, seeking, seeking. Say, sag, saw. Sealed, sealden, seldom. Celadoin, celandine. Semblount, semblance, pretense. Semble, assembly, or meet. Semoli, seemly. Sangler, wild boar, sanglier. Sens, incense. Sentin, scent. Searching, searching. Sarjoantes, sergeants. Sisoun, seasoun, sesson, season. Seesors, Caesars. Set, set, place. Part of forest round which stables or stations of men and hounds were placed. So, su, fr. Sur, hunt, pursue. Suet, suet, fat of deer. Sore, swear. Sane, say, see. Shap, shape. Shapen, shaped. Shield, shield, shoulder of a boar. Shielen, shall. Sheared, cut, wound. Shent, shamed, disgraced. Sycurly, securely. Singular. The wild boar when he leaves the sounder, ap. 
Skirtus, skirtus, the skin and tissue surrounding the stomach. Skulk, a number of foxes, ap. Slotha, sloth. Slough, lower part of the heart. Slughound, a sleuth hound, a track hound, ap. Slike, slick, sleek or smooth. Smet, smitten, smitten. Snaw, snow. Soar, a buck in his fourth year. Sopal, wild thyme, thymus serpillum. Soil, soul, suil, wallowing pool, soil or mud. To soil means when a deer or wild boar takes to water or wallows in it. Soyorn, soyorn, soyornying, sojourn, sojourn, to remain. Solari, upper chamber. Sumdeal, somewhat. Samara, summer, summer. Son, soon. San, sun, sun. San. Sound, sound. Sopra, soper, supper. Sop, sopers, herd of deer. Sorel, a buck in his third year. Sotelli, subtlety, cleverly. Sotil, sotil, sotilt, subtle, clever. Soul, soil, alone. Sounder, Soundra, Sundra, a herd of wild boars. Sour, stag of fourth year, the color of a deer's hide. According to Roquefort, a herd of swine, ap. Seuss, oxide of zinc. Sow's reel, souch reel, surreal, surantler, a tine of the stag's head, ap. Soul, soul. Spanel, spanels, spaniel. Sparhawk, sparrowhawk. Spatel, spittle. Spay, to kill a deer with a sword. To castrate. Spyard, spade, spayer, spikard, the stag in his third year, ap. Spanel, spaniel. Spays, spires, young wood. Spires, spoys, stalks, young wood. Thick spires means thick wood. Spittus, despiteful. Sprain-tez, spraiding, excrements of the otter. Springle, springled, springled, springle, siege engine to throw stones or box of timber. Stable, stables, fr. Establi, a post or station of huntsmen and hounds. Staggart, the stag in his fourth year. Stalk, to go softly, creep, stalk the deer full still, used by John Lydgate, about 1430. Stall, to corner, to bring to bay, to stand still. Stank. Stank, stangs, stanks, fr. Estank, pool, tank, pond. Steppies, steps, footprint of deer. Steer, stir. Sturt, sturt, start. Stint, stint, to stop, to blow a stint, i.e. to stop or check the hounds, a false scent, check. Stone bow, fr. Arche Pierre, a kind of crossbow. Stunnies, stones. Storty, estortic, giddy. Stupin, stoop. Strake, to blow. Strangle, straggle. Strandling, strandlin, squirrel. Stratir, straighter. Strot, straight. Strang, strength, stronghold, thick woods. Strangest, strongest. Strepid, to strip. Strainer, strainer. Straint, strain, progeny, or breed. Striped, stripped, term to denote skinning of hair, wild boar, and wolf, ap. Stroke, strake, or stook, to sound a note on a hunting horn. Strong, set of woods and coverts, thick, dense. Sue, to seek, to hunt. Sewers, followers. Suet, the fat of the red deer and fallow deer. Sweet, sweet. Sugar, sugar. Schurendler, a tine. Generally the bay. Sir Royal, the Sir Royal tine. Sure baited, of hound's feet, battered, bruised from overrunning. Susreal, Sir Royal tine. Estuent, at fault. To stop. Swite, sweet, following. 
Swef, a hunting cry, meaning gently or softly. Sword, sword. Swore, swore. Swoot, swoat, sweat. Silvestres, beasts of veneri, i.e. red deer, hare, boar, and wolf, ap. Sins, sins. Sinos, sinews, sinews. Scythes, times. Tatches, habits, also spots, markings. Talon, talon, heel. Todd, a kind of tanning, preparation of white leathers. Tawn, tan, tawny. Tailed, tailed. Teaser, teaser, tezours. A small hound that teases forth the game in coverts. Teg, the fallow doe in her second year. Tent, tended, cared for. Tercel, tiersel, the male of any species of hawk. Tearer, tearers, terrier. Terps, to poise an arrow for shooting. Terriers. Terriers. Test, head or antlers, tet. Tainties, touches. Thenderlegus, hind legs. Thenkinges, thinking. Thens, thence. Thydir, thither. Toshas, teeth. Togadir, togadra, together. Tokenis, tokens. Toshes, tusks. Tongue, tongue, tongue. Ture. Tower. To whales, towels. Tounge, tunge, tongue. Trace, track or footprint of an animal. Travail, travail, fr. Travail, work, labor. Tradeals, excrements of otter. Trenchour, trencher. Trests, trist, trist. Tresteth, trusteth. True, 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 faithful. Trip, a herd of tame swine. Trochus, troches, the tines, on top. Trodes, trod. Troeth. Believes or knows. Trustra, trist. Twice, twice, twice. Twin, between. Twiggies, twigs. Time, season. Tindas, tinies, tines. Tysane, a medicinal tea. Umbicast, to cast round. Underneath, underneath. Undoing, dressing of a deer. Undone, undone. To cut up. Unneth, scarcely. Unsicker, uncertain. Unthend, unsuccessful. Unwash, unwashed. Unwexed, unwaxed. Unjoin, unjoin. A prior to, finding of the heart buck, and bore with the limer. Usen, use. Van chasers, van chasers. The relay of hounds that comes first. Van chase, the first in the chase. Vontelay, vontelay, vlay, part of the pack held in reserve, when uncoupled on the line of the stag before the hounds already hunting had passed. Veal, calf. Used sometimes for the stag in his first year, ap. V-line, a horn signal, ap. Veltraga, veltrarius, a hound, an alaunt, ap. Vent to, set of an otter when it comes to surface of water for air, also to empty, to cast excrements, ap. Ventrers, ventrers. Venion, venom. Verful, a glassful. Verre, truly, true. Vertigris, vertigers, vertigris. Vestying, investigating, looking. Vutrares, voter, boarhound. Vain, vain. Vishateth, voiding excrements. Vmbliss. Umbles. Vndurdiking, undertaking. Vndurstanding, understanding. Vingles, bugles. Vnanines, onions. Void, Void, leave, go away, empty. Voiden, to purge. Voice, voice, voice. Voins, veins. Wagging, excrements of foxes. Ways, way. Track. Wallowing, wallowing. Walterer, welter. Wanlace, put up game. Warrant, warrant, save. 
wardrobe, wardrobe, excrement of badgers. Wear, aware. Also war, beware. Warin, warins, warren. Warly, warily. Wash, wash. Weeder, weather. Weddies, weeds. Wheelix, grow. Welly, wall, wool. Well sped, well sped. Wayne, no, to think. Word, worn. Werkies, works. Werwolf, werewolf, a man eating wolf. Weary. Weary. Wheat, to wit, to know. Wex, wax, to grow. Wexed, waxed. Wexing, wexen, growth. Waiting, waiting. Wetter, weather. Whitley, whiter. Whiff, with, wife. Wode, wood. Wodemannies, woodmans. Woodmanly, woodmanly. Wold, wish or wood. Ones. Dwellings. Wand, wound, won't, accustomed. Wood, woad, mad. Woodness, madness. Woot, no. Worth up, on horse, mount on horseback. Worts, vegetables, roots. Waxen, part of verb wax, to grow. Reach, resh, wretched. Wreathis, wreaths. Root, to root. Ruth, wrath. Writing, writing. Worthines, worthiness. Wilily, willilish, wilily. Women, women. Wind, wind, scent, smell. Windeth, winds, scents. Ibrand, burnt, dry. Yeda, went. Yemen, yeoman. You, give. I feed it. Made, well or evil shaped. I flanked, a species of madness in hounds, lank madness. Efore, therefore. E found, found. I goat, begotten, bred. You, hewn. E laughed, left. E maked, made. E now, e now, enough. Yon geese, young. You'll, howl. Epocras, hippocras. Apothecaries, apothecary. Urest, rested. A thoused, thought of. Index. U. X. Z. Aquilas. Affetted. Agincourt. Agrimony. Aguils or needles. Alontes. Antlers of the heart. Apollo. King of Leonis. Aquitaine. Assembly. Albury of Montdidier. Amarl, Duke of. Badger. Badminton Library. Bailey Groman. Baiting. Baldrick. Beaumont. Bellowing Time. Burslet. Burners, or attendants on hounds. Bishunters, fur hunters. Blaine. Blenches, trick, deceit. Boar, wild, see wild boar. Bose, hump. Bodleian Library. Bows. Brache. Brochas. Brocket. Buck. Burnish. Burr. Burrows. Butcher's Hounds. Caboche. Chamomile. Canker. The Cure for. Cat, wild. Sea wild cat. Cecil's Records of the Chase. Celandine. Chastions. Change. Chase. Chase, beasts of the. Chaucer. Claudonius. Coney. Consolida Major. Consolida Minor. Contriangle. Cotton MS. British Muse. Couchers, setters. Couples. Curie. Dalziel. Damali, Duke. Dear Tithes. Dryden, Sir Henry. Incorn. Envoiced. Ergots of the heart. Excrements, sea fumes. 
F. G. De C. Gaston de Foy. Pharaoh, giving birth to young pigs. Fees of huntsmen. Fence month. Ferrets. Fut, track. Futur. Finders. Foils. Foy, Gaston de, C. Gaston de Foy. For long, a horn signal. Founds, Thomas. First pack of foxhounds established by. Fox, the. Foxhounds, first pack of. Fray. Fraying post. Froissart. Foose, track. Fwite, track. Fumes. Fute, track. Garlic. Gaston de Foy, and. Gathering, see assembly. Gins. Gladness or glade. Grease or fat of game. Grease time. Greyhound, the, dash. Grinders. Guillen. Guillen Lou Serviers. Harbor. Hardell. Hair. Hair pipes. Heronblast. Harness. Harrier. Heart, dash, dash. Harding, J. E. Hospies, the. Hawks. Hayes or Haya. Henry the Fourth, King of England. Hippocras. Holy Cross, Feast of. Holy Rood. Horn, Hunters. Horse. Hound, Dash, Dash. Hunter. Hunting Cries, Dash. Hunting Music, Dash. Hunting Seasons. Idleness, the foundation of all evil. Ilox. Imagination. Iris, the. Jopai, to hollow it to the hounds. Canets, small hounds. Kennel. Kids. Kindles of the hare. King, hunting of the. Langley. Edmund of. Latimer. Less. Leverets or kindles. Ligging, a bed, a lair. Lilies, medicinal qualities of. Limer, a scenting hound, dash. Limer. Lou Serviers. Limer, see Limer. Madness in the hound. Macari slays Aubrey of Montdidier. Mallows. Mange in the hound. Martin. Master of game, dash. Master of hurt hounds. Mastiff. Melbourne, William. Mani, the. Matinge, or feeding. Mute. Mew, to shed. Milbourne. Moot or moat. Mort or death, the. Mortimers, the. Motherwort. Move, to start a hare. Muse or muse. Needles. Nets. Numbless. Otter, dash. Parfit, the. Parfiters. Parker. Partridge. Penny Royal. Pevensey. Phoebus. Gaston, Count de Foy, see Gaston de Foy. Pummeled, spotted. Prize, the. Pterygium. Quail. Quarry. Quest. Rabies, greater than sea madness. Ratches, scenting hounds. Rascal. Relays. Receiver or receiver. Riot. Roebuck, Dash. Roosevelt, Th. Roy Modus. Royals, Antlers. Rue. Ruits. Running hounds, see ratches. Rutting. Riding time. Scantilin, a measure. Scotland. Scomber. Seasons of hunting. Seton. Setters. Seven deadly sins. Shakespeare. Shaw, Vero. Shirley M.S. Snares. Sounder or herd of wild swine. Spain. Spaniel, the, dash. Spay, to kill. Spay, 
to castrate. Sprain tes of otter. Springhole. Spurge. Squire, a companion of the heart. Stable stand. Staggered. Stanks, or pools. Stint. Stinking foot. Storax. Struts, sports and pastimes. Sir Royal of the Heart. Sweet foot. Tatch. Tally ho, etymology, and use of. Talon. Ta, to make hides into leather. Teaser. Terrier. Time, wild. Trace. Footprint of deer. Troche. Trist. Tweedy and Gifford. Twice I, William. Tysane. Valerian. Van Chasers. Vauntlay, to cast off. Velters. Veneery, beasts of. Vixen. Wagging. Wall Pelletry. Wan Lace. Wardrobe. W.R. Wolves. Wild Boar, Dash. Wild Cat and Its Nature, Dash. Wilton, Lord. Wolf, Dash. Woodman's Craft. Worming a Dog. Right. Win. Yeoman at Horse. Yeoman Burners on Foot. York, Duke of. Printed by Ballantyne, Hansen and Company. Edinburgh and London. Abridged Prospectus of the First Edition of. The. Master of Game. The Oldest English Book on Hunting. By Edward, Duke of York. Edited by. W. A. N. F. Bailey Groman. With a foreword by. Theodore Roosevelt. With 44 facsimile photogravure plates, four with original text, and frontispiece reproduced in colors and gold, from the miniatures in the famous MSF, FR 616 in the Bibliothèque Nationale, Paris. Monotint reproductions of the drawings in the Bodleian, Master of Game, M. S. Bodle. 546, and other reproductions, transcripts of hitherto unpublished misas and documents, literary and historical notes, a bibliography of MSS. And printed books on hunting in the principal languages of Europe up to the end of the 16th century, and a glossary of ancient English hunting terms, with index. Only 600 copies, bound with these plates in rough deerskin, will be sold, of which half are reserved for England, the rest for America and the continent. Each copy is numbered and signed, and under no circumstances will any more be published. Price six pounds. The first ten copies are printed on Japanese handmade vellum paper throughout and bound by Zainsdorf in white vellum, price thirty pounds each. Only two copies of the latter and twenty copies of the English edition are left. His Majesty the King and H. R.H. The Prince of Wales have been pleased to subscribe for copies. Published for the editors by Ballantyne and C.O., 14, Tavistock Street, Covent Garden, W.C., London, who will forward a specimen plate in full particulars on application. Extracts from reviews in the English and American press. The Times. The oldest English book on hunting renews its youth in a superb and massive volume, elaborately illustrated with reproductions of the quaintest of medieval drawings. The archaic text of the original English is happily modernized in parallel columns, so that the book is pleasant and easy reading. The elaborate appendix is a treasury of research, and the bibliographical catalog is exhaustive. The fortnightly review. A great classic has been rescued from oblivion. The Spectator. There can be no hesitation in ascribing to the magnificently produced volume the first place in the classics of hunting of an earlier date ever given to the public of our day. Some of the attractions of this splendid volume. The illustrations which are as interesting as the text, absolutely a masterpiece, the endurance of a scholarly and rational enthusiasm in the history and pursuit of sport has its monument in the fine work now presented. The Field. In many respects this is a remarkable book. It is the oldest treatise on hunting in the English language. It was written just five centuries ago, and, strange to say, until the present time it has never been printed. 
As the treatise is from many points of view of considerable importance, one would have supposed that long ere this some enthusiastic scholar with a love for the chase would have been found both able and willing to undertake its publication. On the other hand, we have only to look at the text as now presented to us to see that its preparation implies an enormous amount of labor, involving a collation of the various MSS. A verbatim et literatum transcription of the text, a modern English translation in parallel columns, critical and explanatory notes, and a glossary of ancient hunting terms, in a word, a thorough mastery of the subject. All this Mr. and Mrs. Bailey Groman have accomplished, and indeed much more, for they have given an account of the existing Mrs. of the work, a bibliography of the medieval literature of the chase. It was a happy thought to illustrate the English text with facsimiles of the beautiful miniatures which adorn the French original. In the way of reproduction nothing could be better. The Tout Ensemble is a model of good taste and fine printing. Bailey's Magazine. This beautiful book, in such sumptuous form, bears evidence of wide research and of care in preparation. The sumptuous production it is and the illuminations from old Mises have been reproduced as well as it was possible to reproduce them. Land and Water. This is really an extremely interesting book, and if Mr. Bailey Groman is as painstaking and accurate with his rifle as he is with his pen, it is small wonder that he is in the front rank of contemporary sportsmen. The Standard. Singularly interesting and amusing, sumptuous book. An immense amount of bibliographical information. Mr. Bailey Groman is a hunter of worldwide experience, and his authority will be generally recognized. Morning Post. Magnificent Folio. The editor's notes on the text are full of far-sought information, and, what is more, are delightfully written. Happy is the sportsman and scholar who has a copy of it. The country gentlemen. Mr. and Mrs. Bailey Groman have done their work as editors admirably, nothing could be better than the general, get-up, of this charming volume. New York Herald Magnificent edition of the, Master of Game, edited with a loving care that makes it a literary marvel. No labor, no expense has been too great for the editors of this truly splendid edition of a singularly interesting work. Chicago Tribune Sumptuous folio of the first importance to students, it must ever be considered a classic of its kind. The Nation, New York One can hardly speak too highly of the loving and enthusiastic care which the editors have manifested in preparing the work for publication.